Section 1 of The Garmante Way, Le Côté de Garmante. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael O'Kelly. The Guermont Way, Le Côté de Guermont, by Marcel Proust, translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief. Names of People, the Duchesse de Guermont. The twittering of the birds at daybreak sounded insipid to Françoise. Every word uttered by the maids upstairs made her jump. Disturbed by all their running about, she kept asking herself what they could be doing. In other words, we had moved. Certainly, the servants had made no less noise in the attics of her old home, but she knew them. She had made of their comings and goings familiar events. Now she faced even silence with a strained attention. And as our new neighbourhood appeared to be as quiet as the boulevard onto which we had hitherto looked had been noisy, the song distinct at a distance when it was still quite faint, like an orchestral motif of a passer-by, brought tears to the eyes of a Françoise in exile. And so, if I had been tempted to laugh at her in her misery, at having to leave a house in which she was so well respected on all sides, and had packed her trunk with tears, according to the use of Combray declaring superior to all possible houses that which had been ours. On the other hand, I, who found it as hard to assimilate new as I found it easy to abandon old conditions, I felt myself drawn towards our old servant when I saw that this installation of herself in a building where she had not received from the whole porter, who did not yet know us, the marks of respect necessary to her moral well-being, had brought her positively to the verge of dissolution. She alone could understand what I was feeling. Certainly her young footman was not the person to do so. For him, who was as unlike the Combray type as it was possible to conceive, packing up, moving, living in another district, were all like taking a holiday, in which the novelty of one's surroundings gave one the same sense of refreshment as if one had actually travelled. He thought he was in the country, and a cold in the head afforded him, as though he had been sitting in a draughty railway carriage, the delicious sensation of having seen the world. At each fresh sneeze he rejoiced that he had found so smart a place, having always longed to be with people who travelled a lot. And so, without giving him a thought, I went straight to Françoise, who, in return for my having laughed at her tears over a removal which had left me cold, now showed an icy indifference to my sorrow, but because she shared it. The sensibility claimed by neurotic people is matched by their egotism. They cannot abide the flaunting by others of the sufferings to which they pay an ever-increasing attention in themselves. Françoise who would not allow the least of her own ailments to pass unnoticed, if I were in pain, would turn her head from me, so that I should not have the satisfaction of seeing my sufferings pitied, or so much as observed. It was the same as soon as I tried to speak to her about our new house. Moreover, having been obliged a day or two earlier to return to the house we had just left to retrieve some clothes which had been overlooked in our removal, while I, as a result of it, had still a temperature, and, like a boa constrictor that has just swallowed an ox, felt myself painfully distended by the sight of a long trunk which my eyes had still to digest, Françoise, with true feminine inconstancy, came back saying that she really thought she would stifle on our old boulevard, it was so stuffy, that she had found it quite a day's journey to get there, that never had she seen such stairs, that she would not go back to live there for a king's ransom, not if you were to offer her millions, a pure hypothesis, and that everything, everything that is to say, to do with the kitchen and the usual offices, was much better fitted up in the new house. Which, it is high time now that the reader should be told, 
and told also that we had moved into it because my grandmother, not having been at all well, though we took care to keep this reason from her, was in need of better air, was a flat forming part of the Hôtel de Garmonte. At the age when a name offering us an image of the unknowable which we have poured into its mould, while at the same moment it connotes for us also an existing place, forces us accordingly to identify one with the other to such a point that we set out to seek in a city for the soul which it cannot embody, but which we have no longer the power to expel from the sound of its name, it is not only to towns and rivers that names give an individuality, as do allegorical paintings, it is not only the physical universe which they pattern with differences, people with marvels. There is the social universe also. And so every historic house, in town or country, has its lady or its fairy, as every forest has its spirit, as there is a nymph for every stream. Sometimes, hidden in the heart of its name, the fairy is transformed to suit the life of our imagination by which she lives, Thus it was that the atmosphere in which Madame de Guermont existed in me, after having been for years no more than the shadow cast by a magic lantern slide, or the light falling through a painted window, began to let its colours fade, when quite other dreams impregnated it with the bubbling coolness of her flowing streams. And yet the fairy must perish if we come in contact with the real person, to whom her name corresponds. For that person the name then begins to reflect, and she has in her nothing of the fairy. The fairy may revive if we remove ourselves from the person, but if we remain in her presence, the fairy definitely dies, and with her the name, as happened to the family of Lusignan, which was fated to become extinct on the day when the fairy Melusine should disappear. Then the name, beneath our successive restorations, of which we may end by finding, as their original, the beautiful portrait of a strange lady, whom we are never to meet, is nothing more than the mere photograph for identification, to which we refer in order to decide whether we know, whether or not we ought to bow to a person who passes us in the street. But let a sensation from a bygone year like those recording instruments which preserve the sound and the manner of the various artists who have sung or played into them, enable our memory to make us hear that name with the particular ring with which it then sounded in our ears. Then, while the name itself has apparently not changed, we feel the distance that separates the dreams which at different times its same syllables have meant to us. For a moment... From the clear echo of its warbling in some distant stream, we can extract, as from the little tubes we use in painting, the exact, forgotten, mysterious, fresh tint of the days which we had believed ourselves to be recalling when, like a bad painter, we were giving to the whole of our past, spread out on the same canvas, the tones, conventional and all alike, of our unprompted memory. Whereas, on the contrary, each of the moments that composed it employed, for an original creation, in a matchless harmony, the colour of those days which we no longer know, and which, for that matter, will still suddenly enrapture me, if, by any chance, the name Guermont, resuming for a moment, after all these years, the sound so different from its sound today, which it had for me, on the day of Mademoiselle Perspier's marriage, brings back to me that mauve, so delicate, almost too bright, too new, with which the billowy scarf of the young Duchesse glowed, and, like two periwinkle flowers, growing beyond reach and blossoming now again, her two eyes sunlit with an azure smile. And the name Guermont of those days is also like one of those little balloons which have been filled with oxygen or some such gas. When I come to explode it, to make it emit what it contains, I breathe the air of Combray of that year, of that day, mingled with the fragrance of hawthorn blossoms blown by the wind from the corner of the square, harbinger of rain, 
which now sent the sun packing, now let him spread himself over the red woollen carpet to the sacristy, steeping it in a bright geranium scarlet, with that, so to speak, Wagnerian harmony in its gaiety, which makes the wedding service always impressive. But even apart from rare moments such as these, in which suddenly we feel the original entity quiver and resume its form, carve itself out of the syllables, now soundless, dead, if, in the giddy rush of daily life, in which they serve only the most practical purposes, names have lost all their colour, like a prismatic top that spins too quickly and seems only grey when, on the other hand, in our musings we reflect, we seek, so as to return to the past, to slacken, to suspend the perpetual motion by which we are borne along, gradually we see once more appear, side by side, but entirely distinct from one another, the tints which in the course of our existence have been successively presented to us by a single name. What form was assumed in my mind by this name Garmont when my first nurse, knowing no more probably than I know today in whose honour it had been composed, sang me to sleep with that old ditty, Loire à la, la Marquise de Garmont, or when, some years later, the veteran Maréchal de Guermantes, making my nursery-maid's bosom swell with pride, stopped in the Champs-Élysées to remark, A fine child, that! and gave me a chocolate drop from his comfort box, I cannot, of course, now say. Those years of my earliest childhood are no longer a part of myself. They are external to me. I can learn nothing of them, save as we learn things that happened before we were born, from the accounts given me by other people. But more recently, I find in the period of that name's occupation of me seven or eight different shapes which it has successively assumed. The earliest were the most beautiful. Gradually, my musings, forced by reality to abandon a position that was no longer tenable, established themselves anew in one slightly less advanced, until they were obliged to retire still farther. And, with Madame de Guermont, was transformed simultaneously her dwelling, itself also the offspring of that name, fertilised from year to year by some word or other that came to my ears and modulated the tone of my musings. That dwelling of hers reflected them in its very stones, which had turned to mirrors, like the surface of a cloud or a lake. A dungeon keep without mass, no more indeed than a band of orange light, from the summit of which the Lord and his lady dealt out life and death to their vassals, had given place, right at the end of that Guermont way, along which, on so many summer afternoons, I retraced with my parents the course of the Vivonne, to that land of bubbling streams, where the Duchess taught me to fish for trout and to know the names of the flowers whose red and purple clusters adorned the walls of the neighbouring gardens. Then it had been the ancient heritage, famous in song and story, from which the proud race of Guermont, like a carved and mellow tower that traverses the ages, had risen already over France when the sky was still empty at those points where later were to arise Notre Dame of Paris and Notre Dame of Chartres, when on the summit of the hill of Laon the nave of its cathedral had not yet been poised, like the Ark of the Deluge on the summit of Mount Ararat, crowded with patriarchs and judges, anxiously leaning from its windows to see whether the wrath of God were yet appeased, carrying with it the types of vegetation that was to multiply on the earth, brimming over with animals which have escaped even by the towers, where oxen, grazing calmly upon the roof, looked down over the plains of Champagne. When the traveller who had left Beauvais at the close of day did not yet see, following him and turning with his road, outspread against the gilded screen of the western sky, the black-ribbed wings of the cathedral. It was this Guermont, like the scene of a novel, an imaginary landscape, which I could with difficulty picture to myself, and longed all the more to discover, set in the midst of real lands and roads, which all of a sudden 
would become alive with heraldic details within a few miles of a railway station. I recalled the names of the places round it as if they had been situated at the foot of Parnassus or Helicon, as the physical conditions in the realm of topographical science required for the production of an unaccountable phenomenon. I saw again the escutcheons blazoned beneath the windows of Combray Church, their quarters filled century after century with all the lordships which, by marriage or conquest, this illustrious house had brought flying to it from all the corners of Germany, Italy and France. Vast territories in the north, strong cities in the south, assembled there to group themselves in Garmont and, losing their material quality, to inscribe allegorically their dungeon vert or castle triple-towered argent upon its azure field. I had heard of the famous tapestries of the Garmont. I could see them, medieval and blue, a trifle coarse, detach themselves like a floating cloud from the legendary amaranthine name at the foot of the ancient forest in which Childebert went so often hunting. And this delicate, mysterious background of their lands, this vista of the ages, it seemed to me that, as effectively as by journeying to see them, I might penetrate all their secrets simply by coming in contact for a moment in Paris with Madame de Guermont, the princess paramount of the place and the lady of the lake, as if her face, her speech, must possess the local charm of forest groves and streams, and the same secular peculiarities as the old customs recorded in her archives. But then I had met saint Lou. He had told me that the castle had borne the name of Guermont only since the 17th century, when that family had acquired it. They'd lived until then in the neighbourhood, but their title was not taken from those parts. The village of Guermont had received its name from the castle round which it had been built, and so that it should not destroy the view from the castle, a servitude, still in force, traced the line of its streets and limited the height of its houses. As for the tapestries, they were by Boucher, bought in the 19th century by a Guermont with a taste for the arts, and hung interspersed with a number of sporting pictures of no merit, which he himself had painted, in a hideous drawing-room upholstered in Adrianople and plush. By these revelations, saint Lou had introduced into the castle elements foreign to the name of Guermont, which made it impossible for me to continue to extract solely from the resonance of the syllables the stone and mortar of its walls. And so, in the heart of the name, was effaced the castle mirrored in its lake, and what now became apparent to me, surrounding Madame de Guermont as her dwelling, had been her house in Paris, the Hôtel de Guermont, limpid like its name, for no material and opaque element intervened to interrupt and blind its transparency. As the word church signifies not only the temple, but the assembly of the faithful also, this Hôtel de Garmont comprised all those who shared the life of the Duchess. But these intimates, on whom I never set eyes, were for me only famous and poetic names. And knowing exclusively persons who themselves also were names only, did but enhance and protect the mystery of the Duchess by extending all around her a vast halo, which at the most declined in brilliance as its circumference increased. In the parties which she gave, since I could not imagine the guests as having any bodies, any moustaches, any boots, as making any utterances that were commonplace or even original in a human and rational way, this whirlpool of names, introducing less material substance than would a phantom banquet or a spectral ball, round that statuette in Dresden, China, which was the Madame de Guermont, kept for her palace of glass the transparency of a showcase. Then, after saint Lou had told me various anecdotes about his cousin's chaplain, her gardener, and the rest, 
the Hôtel de Garmonde had become, as the Louvre might have been in days gone by, a kind of castle surrounded in the very heart of Paris by its own domains, acquired by inheritance by virtue of an ancient right that had quaintly survived, over which she still enjoyed feudal privileges. But this last dwelling itself vanished when we had come to live beside Madame de Vie Parisi in one of the flats adjoining that occupied by Madame de Guermont in a wing of the hotel. It was one of those old townhouses, a few of which are perhaps still to be found, in which the court of honour, whether they were alluvial deposits washed there by the rising tide of democracy, or a legacy from a more primitive time when the different trades were clustered round the overlord, is flanked by little shops and workrooms, a shoemaker's, for instance, or a tailor's, such as we see nestling between the buttresses of those cathedrals which the aesthetic zeal of the restorer has not swept clear of such accretions. A porter, who also does cobbling, keeps hens, grows flowers, and at the far end, in the main building, a countess, who, when she drives out in her old carriage and pair, flaunting on her hat a few nasturtiums, which seem to have escaped from the plot beside the porter's lodge, with, by the coachman's side on the box, a footman who gets down to leave cards at every aristocratic mansion in the neighbourhood, scatters vague little smiles, and waves a hand in greeting to the porter's children, and to such of her respectable fellow tenants as may happen to be passing, who, to her contemptuous affability and levelling pride, seem all the same. In the house in which we had now come to live, the great lady at the end of the courtyard was a duchess, smart and still quite young. She was, in fact, Madame de Guermont, and, thanks to Françoise, I soon came to know all about her household. For the Guermont, to whom Françoise regularly alluded as the people below or downstairs, were her constant preoccupation from the first thing in the morning when, as she did Mamma's hair, casting a forbidden, irresistible, furtive glance down into the courtyard, she would say, Look at that now, a pair of holy sisters, that'll be for downstairs, surely. Or, oh, just look at the fine pheasants in the kitchen window. No need to ask where they came from. The Duke will have been out with his gun. Until the last thing at night, when, if her ear, while she was putting out my night things, caught a few notes of a song, she would conclude, the having company down below, gay doings I'll be bound. Whereupon, in her symmetrical face, beneath the arch of her now snow-white hair, a smile from her young days, sprightly but proper, would, for a moment, set each of her features in its place, arranging them in an intricate and special order, as though for a country dance. But the moment in the life of the Guermont, which excited the keenest interest in Françoise, gave her the most complete satisfaction and at the same time the sharpest annoyance, was that at which, the two halves of the great gate having been thrust apart, the Duchess stepped into her carriage. It was generally a little while after our servants had finished the celebration of that sort of solemn Passover, which none might disturb, called their midday dinner, during which they were so far taboo that my father himself was not allowed to ring for them knowing, moreover, that none of them would have paid any more attention to the fifth peal than to the first, and that the discourtesy would therefore have been a pure waste of time and trouble, though not without trouble in store for himself. For Françoise, who in her old age lost no opportunity of standing upon her dignity, would without fail have presented him for the rest of the day with a face covered with tiny red cuneiform hieroglyphs by which she made visible, though by no means legible, to the outer world the long tale of her griefs and the profound reasons for her dissatisfactions. She would enlarge upon them too in a running aside, but not so that we could catch her words. She called this practice, which she imagined must be infuriating, 
mortifying, as she herself put it, vexing to us, saying low masses all the blessed day. The last rites accomplished, Françoise, who was at one and the same time as in the primitive church, the celebrant and one of the faithful, helped herself to a final glass, undid the napkin from her throat, folded it after wiping from her lips a stain of watered wine and coffee, slipped it into its ring, turned a doleful eye to thank her young footman who, to show his zeal in her service, was saying, Come, ma'am, a drop more of the grape. It's delicious today, and went straight across to the window, which she flung open, protesting that it was too hot to breathe in this wretched kitchen. Dexterously casting, as she turned the latch and let in the fresh air, a glance of studied indifference into the courtyard below, she furtively elicited the conclusion that the Duchess was not ready yet to start brooded for a moment with contemptuous, impassioned eyes over the waiting carriage, and this meed of attention once paid to the things of the earth, raised them towards the heavens, whose purity she had already divined from the sweetness of the air and the warmth of the sun, and let them rest on a corner of the roof, at the place where, every spring, they came and built immediately over the chimney of my bedroom, a pair of pigeons like those she used to hear cooing from her kitchen in Combray. Ah, Combray, Combray, she cried, and the almost singing tone in which she declaimed this invocation might, taken with the Arlesian purity of her features, have made the onlooker suspect her of a southern origin, and that the lost land which she was lamenting was no more really than a land of adoption. If so, he would be wrong, for it seems that there is no province that has not its own south country. Do we not indeed constantly meet Savoyard and Breton, in whose speech we find all those pleasing transpositions of longs and shorts that are characteristic of the southerner? Ah, Combray, when shall I look on thee again, poor land? When shall I pass the blessed way among thy hawthorns, under our own poor lily oaks, hearing the grasshopper sing and the vivon making a little noise like someone whispering, instead of that wretched bell from our young master, who can never stay still for half an hour on end without me having to run the length of that wicked corridor. And even then he makes out I don't come quick enough. You need to hear the bell ring before he has pulled it, and if you're a minute late, away he flies into the most towering rage, Alas, poor Combray, maybe I shall see thee only in death when they drop me like a stone into the hollow of the tomb. And so, never more shall I smell thy lovely hawthorns, so white and all. But in the sleep of death, I dare say I shall still hear those three peals of the bell which will have driven me to damnation in this world. Her soliloquy was interrupted by the voice of the waistcoat maker downstairs the same who had so delighted my grandmother once, long ago, when she had gone to pay a call on Madame de Viparisi, and now occupied no less exalted a place in Françoise's affections. Having raised his head when he heard our window open, he had already been trying for some time to attract his neighbour's attention in order to bid her good day. The coquetry of the young girl that Françoise had once been softened and refined for Monsieur Jupien, the querulous face of our old cook, dulled by age, ill temper, and the heat of the kitchen fire, and it was with a charming blend of reserve, familiarity, and modesty that she bestowed a gracious salutation on the waistcoat maker, but without making any audible response, for if she did infringe Mamma's orders by looking into the courtyard, she would never have dared to go to the length of talking from the window, which would have been quite enough, according to her, to bring down on her a whole chapter from the mistress. She pointed to the waiting carriage as who should say, A fine pair, eh? Though what she actually muttered was, What an old rattle-trap! But principally because she knew that he would be bound to answer, putting his hand to his lips, so as to be audible without having to shout. You could have one too, if you liked, as good as they have and better, I dare say, 
Only you don't care for that sort of thing. And Françoise, after a modest, evasive signal of delight, the meaning of which was more or less, Tastes differ, you know, simplicity is the rule in this house, shut the window again, in case Mamma should come in. These, you, who might have had more horses than the Guermont, were ourselves. But Jupien was right in saying you, since, except for a few purely personal gratifications, such as when she coughed all day long without ceasing and everyone in the house was afraid of catching her cold, that of pretending, with an irritating little titter, that she had not got a cold, like those plants that an animal to which they are wholly attached keeps alive with food, which it catches, eats and digests for them, and of which it offers them the ultimate and easily assimilable residue, Françoise lived with us in full community. It was we who, with our virtues, our wealth, our style of living, must take on ourselves the task of concocting those little sops to her vanity, out of which was formed, with the addition of the recognised rites of freely practising the cult of the midday dinner according to the traditional custom, which included a mouthful of air at the window when the meal was finished, a certain amount of loitering in the street when she went out to do her marketing, and a holiday on Sundays when she paid a visit to her niece, the portion of happiness indispensable to her existence. And so it can be understood that Françoise might well have succumbed in those first days of our migration, a victim in a house where my father's claims to distinction were not yet known, to a malady which she herself called wearying, wearying in the active sense in which the word ennui is employed by Cornay, or in the last letters of soldiers who end by taking their own lives because they are wearying for their girls or for their native villages. Françoise's wearying had soon been cured by none other than Jupien, for he at once procured her a pleasure no less keen, indeed more refined, than she would have felt if we had decided to keep a carriage. Very good class, those Juliennes, for Françoise readily assimilated new names to those with which she was already familiar. Very worthy people. You can see it written on their faces. Jupien was in fact able to understand and to inform the world that if we did not keep a carriage, it was because we had no wish for one. This new friend of Francois was very little at home, having obtained a post in one of the government offices. A waistcoat maker first of all, with the chit of a girl whom my grandmother had taken for his daughter, he had lost all interest in the exercise of that calling after his assistant, who, when still little more than a child, had shown great skill in darning a torn skirt that day when my grandmother had gone to call on Madame de B. Parisi, had turned to ladies' fashions and become a seamstress. Apprentice hand, to begin with, in a dressmaker's workroom, set to stitch a seam, to fasten a flounce, to sew on a button or to press a crease, to fix a waistband with hooks and eyes, she had quickly risen to be second and then chief assistant, and, having formed a connection of her own among ladies of fashion, now worked at home, that is to say, in our courtyard, generally with one or two of her young friends from the workroom, whom she had taken on as apprentices. After this, Jupien's presence in the place had ceased to matter. No doubt the little girl, a big girl by this time, had often to cut out waistcoats still, but with her friends to assist her, she needed no one besides. And so Jupien, her uncle, had sought employment outside. He was free at first to return home at midday. Then, when he had definitely succeeded the man whose substitute only he had begun by being, not before dinner time. His appointment to the regular establishment was fortunately not announced until some weeks after our arrival, so that his courtesy could be brought to bear on her long enough to help Françoise to pass through the first, most difficult phase without undue suffering. At the same time, and without underrating his value to Françoise as, so to speak, a sedative during the period of transition, 
I am bound to say that my first impression of Zhupien had been far from favourable. At a little distance, entirely ruining of the effect that his plump cheeks and vivid colouring would otherwise have produced, his eyes, brimming with a compassionate, mournful, dreamy gaze, led one to suppose that he was seriously ill or had just suffered a great bereavement. Not only was he nothing of the sort, but as soon as he opened his mouth, and his speech, by the way, was perfect, he was quite markedly cynical and cold. There resulted from this discord between his eyes and lips a certain falsity which was not attractive, and by which he had himself the air of being made as uncomfortable as a guest who arrives in morning dress at a party where everyone else is in evening dress, or as a commoner who, having to speak to a royal personage, does not know exactly how he ought to address him, and gets round the difficulty by cutting down his remarks to almost nothing. Jupien's, here the comparison ends, were, on the contrary, charming. Indeed, corresponding possibly to this overflowing of his face by his eyes, which one ceased to notice when one came to know him, I soon discerned in him a rare intellect, and one of the most spontaneously literary that it has been my privilege to come across, in the sense that, probably without education, he had possessed or had assimilated, with the help only of a few books skimmed in early life, the most ingenious turns of speech. The most gifted people that I had known died young, and so I was convinced that Jupien's life would soon be cut short. Kindness was among his qualities, and pity, the most delicate and the most generous feelings for others. But his part in the life of Françoise had soon ceased to be indispensable. She had learned to put up with understudies. Indeed, when a tradesman or servant came to our door with a parcel or message, while seeming to pay no attention and merely pointing vaguely to an empty chair, Françoise so skilfully put to the best advantage the few seconds that he spent in the kitchen while he waited for Mama's answer, that it was very seldom that the stranger went away without having ineradicably engraved upon his memory the conviction that if we did not have any particular thing, it was because we had no wish for it. If she made such a point of other people's knowing that we had money, for she knew nothing of what saint Lou used to call partitive articles, and said simply, have money, fetch water, of their realising that we were rich, it was not because riches with nothing besides, riches without virtue, were in her eyes the supreme good in life, but virtue without riches was not her ideal either. Riches were for her, so to speak, a necessary condition of virtue, failing which virtue itself would lack both merit and charm. She distinguished so little between them that she had come in time to invest each with the other's attributes, to expect some material comfort from virtue, to discover something edifying in riches. As soon as she had shut the window again, which she did quickly, otherwise Mama would, it appeared, have heaped on her every conceivable insult, Françoise began, with many groans and sighs, to put straight the kitchen table. There are some Garmont who stay in the Rue de la Chaise, began my father's valet. I had a friend who used to be with them. He was their second coachman. And I know a fellow, not my old pal, but his brother-in-law, who did his time in the army with one of the Baron de Garmont's stud grooms. Does your mother know you're out? asked the valet, who was in the habit, just as he used to hum the popular airs of the season, of peppering his conversation with all the latest witticisms. Françoise, with the tired eyes of an aging woman, eyes which moreover saw everything from Combray in a hazy distance, made out not the witticism that underlay the words, but that there must be something witty in them, since they bore no relation to the rest of his speech, and had been uttered with considerable emphasis by one whom she knew to be a joker. She smiled at him, therefore, with an air of benevolent bewilderment, as who should say, Oh, was the same, that Victor? 
and she was genuinely pleased, knowing that listening to smart sayings of this sort was akin, if remotely, to those reputable social pleasures for which, in every class of society, people make haste to dress themselves in their best and run the risk of catching cold. Furthermore, she believed the valet to be a friend after her own heart, for he never left off denouncing, with fierce indignation, the appalling measures which the Republic was about to enforce against the clergy. Françoise had not yet learned that our cruelest adversaries are not those who contradict and try to convince us, but those who magnify or invent reports which may make us unhappy, taking care not to include any appearance of justification which might lessen our discomfort and perhaps give us some slight regard for a party which they make a point of displaying to us to complete our torment as being at once terrible and triumphant. The Duchess must be connected with all that lot, said Françoise, bringing the conversation back to the Garmont of the Rue de la Chaise, as one plays a piece over again from the Andante. I can't recall who it was told me that one of them had married a cousin of the Duke. It's the same kindred, anyway. Ay, they're a great family, the Guermont, she added in a tone of respect, founding the greatness of the family at once on the number of its branches and the brilliance of its connections, as Pascal founds the truth of religion on reason and the authority of the scriptures. For since there was but the single word great to express both meanings, it seemed to her that they formed a single idea, her vocabulary like cut stone sometimes, showing thus on certain of its facets a flaw which projected a ray of darkness into the recesses of her mind. I wonder now if it wouldn't be them that have their castle at Guermont, not a score of miles from Cambrai. Then they must be kin to their cousin at Algiers too. My mother and I long asked ourselves who this cousin at Algiers could be until we finally discovered that Françoise meant by the name Algiers the town of Angers. What is far off may be more familiar to us than what is quite near. Françoise, who knew the name Algiers from some particularly unpleasant dates that used to be given us at the new year, had never heard of Angers. Her language, like the French language itself, and especially that of place names, was thickly strewn with errors. I meant to talk to their butler about it. What is it again you call him? She interrupted herself, as though putting a formal question as to the correct procedure, which she went on to answer with, Oh, of course, it's Antoine you call him, as though Antoine had been a title. He's the one who could tell me, but he's quite the gentleman. He is a great scholar. You'd say they cut his tongue out, or that he'd forgotten to speak. He makes no response when you talk to him, went on Françoise, who used make response in the same sense as Madame de Sévigné. But, she added quite untruthfully, so long as I know what's boiling in my pot, I don't bother my head about what's in other people's. Whatever he is, he's not a Catholic. Besides, he's not a courageous man. This criticism might have led one to suppose that Françoise had changed her mind about physical bravery, which, according to her, in Combray days, lowered men to the level of wild beasts, but it was not so. Courageous meant simply a hard worker. They do say, too, that he's thievish as a magpie, but it doesn't do to believe all one hears. The servants never stay long there because of the lodge. The porters are jealous and set the Duchess against them. But it's safe to say that he's a real twister, that Antoine, and his Antoinette is no better, concluded Françoise, who, in furnishing the name of Antoine with a feminine ending that would designate the butler's wife, was inspired, no doubt, in her act of word formation by an unconscious memory of the word Chanoin and Chanoinesse. If so, she was not far wrong. There is still a street near Notre Dame called Rue Chanoinesse, a name which must have been given to it since it was never inhabited by any but male canons, 
by those Frenchmen of olden days, of whom Françoise was, properly speaking, the contemporary. She proceeded, moreover, at once to furnish another example of this way of forming feminine endings, for she went on, But one thing sure and certain is that it's the Duchess that has Garmont Castle, and it's she that is the Lady Mayoress down those parts. That's always something. I can well believe that it is something, came with conviction from the footman, who had not detected the irony. You think so, do you, my boy? You think it's something? Why, for folk like them to be mayor and mayoress, it's just thank you for nothing. Ah, if it was mine, that Germont Castle, you wouldn't see me setting foot in Paris, I can tell you. I'm sure a family who've got something to go on with, like Monsieur and Madame here, must have queer ideas to stay on in this wretched town, rather than get away down to Combray the moment they're free to start, and no one hindering them. Why do they put off retiring? They've got everything they want. Why wait till they're dead? Ah, if I had only a crust of dry bread to eat, and a faggot to keep me warm in winter, a fine time I'd have of it, at home in my brother's poor old house in Combray. Down there you do feel you're alive. You haven't all these houses stuck up in front of you. There's so little noise at night time, you can hear the frog singing five miles off and more. That must indeed be fine, exclaimed the young footman with enthusiasm, as though this last attraction had been as peculiar to Combray as the gondola is to Venice. A more recent arrival in the household than my father's valet, he used to talk to Françoise about things which might interest not himself so much as her. And Françoise, whose face wrinkled up in disgust when she was treated as a mere cook, had for the young footman, who referred to her always as the housekeeper, that peculiar tenderness which princes not of the blood royal feel towards well-meaning young men who dignify them with a highness. At any rate, one knows what one's about there, and what time of year it is. It isn't like here, where you won't find one wretched buttercup flowering at Holy Easter, any more than you would at Christmas, and I can't hear so much as the tiniest Angelus ring when I lift my old bones out of the bed in the morning. Down there you can hear every hour. There's only the one poor bell, but you say to yourself, my brother will be coming in from the field now, and you watch the daylight fade and the bell rings to bless the fruits of the earth, and you have time to take a turn before you light the lamp. But here it's daytime and it's night time and you go to bed, and you can't say any more than the dumb beasts what you've been about all day. I gather Mes Eglises is a fine place too, madame, broke in the young footman, who found that the conversation was becoming a little too abstract for his liking, and happened to remember having heard us at table mention Mes Eglises. Oh, mes Eglise, is it? said Françoise, with the broad smile which one could always bring to her lips by uttering any of those names, mes Eglise, Combray, Tonsonville. They were so intimate a part of her life that she felt, on meeting them outside it, on hearing them used in conversation, a hilarity more or less akin to that which a professor excites in his class by making allusion to some contemporary personage whose name the students had never supposed could possibly greet their ears from the height of the academic chair. Her pleasure arose also from the feeling that these places were something to her which they were not for the rest of the world, old companions with whom one has shared many delights, and she smiled at them as if she found in them something witty, because she did find there a great part of herself. Yes, you may well say so, son. It is a pretty enough place, is Mes Eglis, she went on with a tinkling laugh. But how did you ever come to hear tell of Mes Eglis? How did I hear of Mes Eglis? But it's a well-known place. People have told me about it, yes, over and over again, he assured her, with that criminal inexactitude of the informer who, whenever we attempt to form an impartial estimate of the importance that a thing which matters to us may have for other people, makes it impossible for us to succeed. I can tell you it's better down there, under the cherry trees, 
than standing before the fire all day. She spoke to them even of Ulali as a good person, for since Ulali's death, Françoise had completely forgotten that she had loved her as little in her lifetime as she loved everyone whose cupboard was bare, who was dying of hunger, and after that came, like a good-for-nothing, thanks to the bounty of the rich, to put on airs. It no longer pained her that Ulali had so skilfully managed, Sunday after Sunday, to secure her trifle from my aunt. As for the latter, Françoise never left off singing her praises. But it was at Combray, surely, that you used to be with a cousin of Madame, asked the young footman. Yes, with Madame Octave. Oh, a dear, good, holy woman, my poor friends, and a house where there was always enough and to spare, and all of the very best. A good woman, you may well say, who had no pity on the partridges, or the pheasants, or anything. You might turn up five to a dinner or six. It was never the meat that was lacking, and of the first quality too, and white wine and red wine, and everything you could wish. Françoise used the word pity in the sense given it by La Bruyère. It was she that paid the damages always, even if the family stayed for months and years. This reflection was not really a slur on us, for Françoise belonged to an epoch when the words damages was not restricted to a legal use and meant simply expense. Ah, I can tell you, people didn't go empty away from that house. As his reverence the curé has told us many a time, if there was ever a woman who could count on going straight before the throne of God, it was she. Poor madame, I can hear her saying now, in the little voice she had, You know, Françoise, I can eat nothing myself, but I want it all to be just as nice for the others as if I could. They weren't for her, the victuals, you may be sure. If you'd only seen her, she weighed no more than a bag of cherries. There wasn't that much of her. She would never listen to a word I said. She would never send for the doctor. Ah, it wasn't in that house that you'd have to gobble down your dinner. She liked her servants to be fed properly. Here, it's been just the same again today. We haven't had time for so much as to break a crust of bread. Everything goes like ducks and drakes. What annoyed her more than anything were the rusks of pulled bread that my father used to eat. She was convinced that he had them simply to give himself airs and to keep her dancing. I can tell you frankly, the young footman assured her, that I never saw the like. He said it as if he had seen everything, and as if in him the range of a millennial experience extended over all countries and their customs, among which was not anywhere to be found a custom of eating pulled bread. Yes, yes, the butler muttered. But that will all be changed. The men are going on strike in Canada, and the minister told Monsieur the other evening that he's clearing 200,000 francs out of it. There was no note of censure in his tone, not that he was not himself entirely honest, but since he regarded all politicians as unsound, the crime of peculation seemed to him less serious than the pettiest larceny. He did not even stop to ask himself whether he had heard this historic utterance aright, and was not struck by the improbability that such a thing would have been admitted by the guilty party himself to my father, without my father's immediately turning him out of the house. But the philosophy of Combray made it impossible for Françoise to expect that the strikes in Canada could have any repercussion on the use of pulled bread. So long as the world goes round, look, there'll be masters to keep us on the trot and servants to do their bidding. In disproof of this theory of perpetual motion, for the last quarter of an hour, my mother, who probably did not employ the same measures of time as Françoise in reckoning the duration of the latter's dinner, had been saying, What on earth can they be doing? They have been at least two hours at their dinner. And she rang timidly three or four times. Françoise, her footman, the butler, heard the bell ring, not as a summons to themselves, and with no thought of answering it, but rather like the first sounds of the instruments being tuned when the next part of a concert is just going to begin. 
and one knows that there will be only a few minutes more of interval. And so, when the peals were repeated and became more urgent, our servants began to pay attention and, judging that they had not much time left and that the resumption of work was at hand, at a peal somewhat louder than the rest, gave a collective sigh and went their several ways, the footman slipping downstairs to smoke a cigarette outside the door, Françoise, after a string of reflections on ourselves, such as, they've got the jumps today, surely, going up to put her things tidy in her attic, while the butler, having supplied himself first with notepaper from my bedroom, polished off the arrears of his private correspondence. End of section one. Section 2 of The Guermantes Way, Le Côté de Guermantes, by Marcel Proust, translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michael O'Kelly. Names of People, the Duchesse de Guermantes. Despite the apparent stiffness of their butler, Françoise had been in a position from the first to inform me that the Guermont occupied their mansion by virtue not of an immemorial right, but of a quite recent tenancy, and that the garden over which it looked, on the side that I did not know, was quite small, and just like all the gardens along the street. And I realised at length that there were not to be seen there pit and gallows, or fortified mill, secret chamber, pillared dovecot, manorial bakehouse or tithe barn, dungeon or drawbridge, or fixed bridge either for that matter, any more than toll houses or pinnacles, charters, muniments, ramparts, or commemorative mounds. But just as Elster, when the Bay of Baalbek, losing its mystery, had become for me simply a portion interchangeable with any other of the total quantity of salt water distributed about the Earth's surface, had suddenly restored to it a personality of its own, by telling me that it was the Gulf of Opal, painted by Whistler in his Harmonies in Blue and Silver, so the name Guermont had seen perish under the strokes of Françoise's hammer, the last of the buildings that had issued from its syllables, when one day an old friend of my father said to us, speaking of the Duchess, she is the first lady in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, hers is the leading house, in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. No doubt the most exclusive drawing-room, the leading house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, was little or nothing after those other mansions of which I in turn had dreamed. And yet, in this one too, and it was to be the last of the series, there was something, however humble, quite apart from its material components, a secret differentiation. And it became all the more essential that I should be able to explore in the drawing room of Madame de Guermont, among her friends, the mystery of her name, since I did not find it in her person when I saw her leave the house in the morning on foot or in the afternoon in her carriage. Once before, indeed, in the church at Cambrai, she had appeared to me in the blinding flash of a transfiguration, with cheeks irreducible to, impenetrable by, the colour of the name Guermont, and of afternoons on the banks of the Vivonne, taking the place of my shattered dream, like a swan or willow, into which has been changed a god or nymph, and which, henceforward, subjected to natural laws, will glide over the water, or be shaken by the wind. And yet, when that radiance had vanished, hardly had I lost sight of it, before it formed itself again, like the green and rosy afterglow of sunset after the sweep of the oar has broken it. And in the solitude of my thoughts, the name had quickly appropriated to itself my impression of the face. But now, frequently, I saw her at her window, in the courtyard, in the street, and for myself at least, if I did not succeed in integrating in her the name Guermont, I cast the blame on the impotence of my mind, to accomplish the whole act that I demanded of it. But she, our neighbour, she seemed to make the same error, 
nay, more, to make it without discomfiture, without any of my scruples, without even suspecting that it was an error. Thus, Madame de Guermont showed in her dresses the same anxiety to follow fashions, as if, believing herself to have become simply a woman like all the rest, she had aspired to that elegance in her attire in which other ordinary women might equal and perhaps surpass her. I had seen her in the street gaze admiringly at a well-dressed actress, and in the morning, before she sallied forth on foot, as if the opinion of the passers-by, whose vulgarity she accentuated by parading familiarly through their midst her inaccessible life, could be a tribunal competent to judge her. I would see her before the glass, playing with a conviction free from all pretense or irony, with passion, with ill-humour, with conceit, like a queen who has consented to appear as a servant girl in theatricals at court, this part, so unworthy of her, of a fashionable woman. And in this mythological oblivion of her natural grandeur, she looked to see whether her veil was hanging properly, smoothed her cuffs, straightened her cloak, as the celestial swan performs all the movements natural to its animal species, keeps his eyes painted on either side of his beak without putting into them any glint of life, and darts suddenly after a bud or an umbrella, as a swan would without remembering that he is a god. But as the traveller, disappointed by the first appearance of a strange town, reminds himself that he will doubtless succeed in penetrating its charm if he visits its museums and galleries, so I assured myself that, had I been given the right of entry into Madame de Guermont's house, were I one of her friends, were I to penetrate into her life, I should then know what, within its glowing orange-tawny envelope, her name did really objectively enclose for other people, since, after all, my father's friend had said that the Guermont set was something quite by itself in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. The life which I supposed them to lead there flowed from a source so different from anything in my experience, and must, I felt, be so indissolubly associated with that particular house that I could not have imagined the presence at the Duchess's parties of people in whose company I myself had already been, of people who really existed. For, not being able suddenly to change their nature, they would have carried on conversations there of the sort that I knew. Their partners would perhaps have stooped to reply to them in the same human speech, and, in the course of an evening spent in the leading house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, there would have been moments identical with moments that I had already lived, which was impossible. It was thus that my mind was embarrassed by certain difficulties, and the presence of our Lord's body in the host seemed to me no more obscure a mystery than this leading house in the Faubourg, situated here on the right bank of the river, and so near that from my bed in the morning I could hear its carpets being beaten. But the line of demarcation that separated me from the Faubourg Saint-Germain seemed to me all the more real because it was purely ideal. I felt clearly that it was already part of the Faubourg when I saw the Guermont doormat spread out beyond that intangible equator, of which my mother had made bold to say, having, like myself, caught a glimpse of it one day when their door stood open, that it was in a shocking state. For the rest, how could their dining room, their dim gallery upholstered in red plush, into which I could see sometimes from our kitchen window, have failed to possess in my eyes the mysterious charm of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, to form part of it in an essential fashion, to be geographically situated within it, since to have been entertained to dinner in that room was to have gone into the Faubourg Saint-Germain, to have breathed its atmosphere, since the people who, before going to table, sat down by the side of Madame de Guermont on the leather-covered sofa in that gallery, were all of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. No doubt, elsewhere than in the Faubourg, at certain parties, 
one might see now and then, majestically enthroned amid the vulgar herd of fashion, one of those men who were mere names and varyingly assumed when one tried to form a picture of them the aspect of a tournament or of a royal forest. But here, in the leading house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, in the drawing room, in the dim gallery, there were only they. They were wrought of precious materials, the columns that upheld the temple. Indeed, for quiet family parties, it was from among them only that Madame de Garmont might select her guests. And in the dinners for twelve, gathered around the dazzling napery and plate, they were like the golden statues of the apostles in Saint-Chapelle, symbolic, consecrative pillars before the holy table. As for the tiny strip of garden that stretched between high walls at the back of the house, where on summer evenings Madame de Guermont had liqueurs and orangeade brought out after dinner, how could I not have felt that to sit there of an evening between nine and eleven on its iron chairs, endowed with a magic as potent as the leather and sofa, without inhaling the breezes peculiar to the Faubourg Saint-Germain, was as impossible as to take a siesta in the oasis of Figuigue, without thereby being necessarily in Africa. Only imagination and belief can differentiate from the rest certain objects, certain people, and can create an atmosphere. Alas, those picturesque sights, those natural accidents, those local curiosities, those works of art of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, never probably should I be permitted to set my feet among them, and I must content myself with a shiver of excitement as I sighted from the deep sea, and without the least hope of ever landing there, like an outstanding minaret, like the first palm, like the first sign of some exotic industry or vegetation, the well-trodden doormat of its shore. But if the Hôtel de Guermont began for me at its hall door, its dependencies must be regarded as extending a long way farther, according to the Duke, who, looking on all the other tenants as farmers, peasants, purchasers of forfeited estates, whose opinion was of no account, shaved himself every morning in his nightshirt at the window, came down into the courtyard, according to the warmth or coldness of the day, in his shirt sleeves, in pyjamas, in a plaid coat of startling colours, with a shaggy nap, in little light-coloured coats shorter than the jackets beneath, and made one of his grooms lead past him at a trot some horse that he had just been buying. More than once, indeed, the horse broke the window of Jupien's shop, whereupon Jupien, to the Duke's indignation, demanded compensation. If it were only in consideration of all the good that Madame la Duchesse does in the house, here and in the parish, said Monsieur de Garmont, it's an outrage on this fellow's part to claim a penny from us. But Jupien had stuck to his point, apparently not having the faintest idea what good the Duchess had ever done. And yet she did do good, but, since one cannot do good to everybody at once, the memory of the benefits that we have heaped on one person is a valid reason for our abstaining from helping another, whose discontent we thereby make all the stronger. From other points of view than that of charity, the quarter appeared to the Duke, and this over a considerable area, to be only an extension of his courtyard, a longer track for his horses. After seeing how a new acquisition trotted by itself, he would have it harnessed and taken through all the neighbouring streets, the groom running beside the carriage holding the reins, making it pass to and fro before the duke, who stood on the pavement, erect, gigantic, enormous in his vivid clothes, a cigar between his teeth, his head in the air, his eyeglass scrutinous, until the moment when he sprang into the box, drove the horse up and down for a little to try it, and then set off with his new turnout to pick up his mistress in the Champs-Élysées. Monsieur de Guermont bade good day before leaving the courtyard to two couples who belonged more or less to his world. 
The first, some cousins of his, who like working class parents, were never at home to look after their children, since every morning the wife went off to the scola to study counterpoint and fugue, and the husband to his studio to carve wood and beat leather, and after them the baron and the baronne de Norpois, always dressed in black, she like a pew opener, and he like a mute at a funeral, who emerged several times daily on their way to church. They were the nephew and niece of the old ambassador who was our friend, and whom my father had in fact met at the foot of the staircase without realising from where he came. For my father supposed that so important a personage, one who had come in contact with the most eminent men in Europe, and was probably quite indifferent to the empty distinctions of rank, was hardly likely to frequent the society of these obscure, clerical and narrow-minded nobles. They had not been long in the place. Dupin, who had come out into the courtyard to say a word to the husband, just as he was greeting Monsieur de Garmont, called him Monsieur Norpois, not being certain of his name. Monsieur Norpois, indeed. Oh, that really is good. Just wait a little. This individual will be calling you Comrade Norpois next, exclaimed Monsieur de Garmont, turning to the baron. He was at last able to vent his spleen against Dupin, who addressed him as Monsieur instead of Monsieur le Duc. One day, when Monsieur de Garmont required some information upon a matter of which my father had a professional knowledge, he had introduced himself to him with great courtesy. After that, he had often some neighbourly service to ask of my father, and, as soon as he saw him begin to come downstairs, his mind occupied with his work and anxious to avoid any interruption, the Duke, leaving his stable boys, would come up to him in the courtyard, straighten the collar of his greatcoat with the serviceable deftness inherited from a line of royal body servants in days gone by, take him by the hand, and, holding it in his own, patting it even, to prove to my father, with a courtesan's or courtier's shamelessness, that he, the Duc de Garmont, made no bargain about my father's right to the privilege of contact with the ducal flesh, led him, so to speak, on leash, extremely annoyed, and thinking only how he might escape through the garage entrance out into the street. He had given us a sweeping bow one day when we had come in just as he was going out in the carriage with his wife. He was bound to have told her my name, but what likelihood was there of her remembering it, or my face either? And besides, what a feeble recommendation to be pointed out simply as being one of her tenants. Another, more valuable, would have been my meeting the Duchess in the drawing room of Madame de Ville Parisi, who, as it happened, had just sent word by my grandmother that I was to go and see her, and, remembering that I had been intending to go in for literature, had added that I should meet several authors there. But my father felt that I was still a little young to go into society, and as the state of my health continued to give him uneasiness, he did not see the use of establishing precedents that would do me no good. As one of Madame de Guermont's footmen was in the habit of talking to Françoise, I picked up the name of several of the houses which she frequented, but formed no impression of any of them. From the moment in which they were a part of her life, of that life which I saw only through the veil of her name, were they not inconceivable? Tonight there's a big party with a Chinese shadow show at the Princesse de Parmes, said the footman. But we shan't be going, because at five o'clock Madame is taking the train to Chantilly to spend a few days with the Duc d'Aumal. But it'll be the lady's maid and valet that are going with her. I'm to stay here. She won't be at all pleased, the Princesse de Parmes won't. That's four times already she's written to Madame la Duchesse. Then you won't be going down to Guermont Castle this year? It's the first time we shan't be going there. It's because of the Duke's rheumatics. The doctor says he's not to go there till the hot pipes are in. But we've been there every year till now, right on to January. If the hot pipes aren't ready, perhaps Madame will go for a few days to Cannes or to the Duchesse de Guise. But nothing's settled yet. 
and to the theatre? Do you go sometimes? We go now and then to the opera, usually on the evenings when the Princesse de Parma is her box. That's once a week. It seems it's a fine show they give there, plays, operas, everything. Madame refused to subscribe to it herself, but we go all the same to the boxes Madame's friends take, one one night, another another, often with the Princesse de Guermont, the Duke's cousin's lady. She's sister to the Duke of Bavaria. So you've got to run upstairs again now, have you? went on the footman, who, albeit identified with the Guermont, looked upon masters in general as a political estate, a view which allowed him to treat Françoise with as much respect as if she too were in service with the Duchess. You enjoy good health, ma'am. Oh, if it wasn't for these cursed legs of mine, on the plain I can still get along. On the plain meant in the courtyard or in the streets, where Françoise had no objection to walking, in other words, on a plain surface. But it's these stairs that do me in, devil take them. Good day to you, sir. See you again, perhaps, this evening. She was all the more anxious to continue her conversations with the footman after he mentioned to her that the sons of dukes often bore a princely title which they retained until their fathers were dead. Evidently the cult of the nobility, blended with and accommodating itself to a certain spirit of revolt against it, must springing hereditarily from the soil of France, be very strongly implanted still in her people. For Françoise, to whom you might speak of the genius of Napoleon or of wireless telegraphy, without succeeding in attracting her attention and without her slackening for an instant the movements with which she was scraping the ashes from the grate or laying the table, if she were simply to be told these idiosyncrasies of nomenclature and that the younger son of the Duc de Guermont was generally called Prince d'Oléron, would at once exclaim, That's fine, that is, and stand there dazed, as though in contemplation of a stained window in the church. Françoise learnt also from the Prince d'Agrigant's valet, who had become friends with her by coming often to the house with notes for the Duchess, that he had been hearing a great deal of talk in society, about the marriage of the Marquis de saint Lou to Mademoiselle d'Ambroissac, and that it was practically settled. That villa, that opera box, into which Madame de Guermont transfused the current of her life, must, it seemed to me, be places no less fairy-like than her home. The names of Guise, of Parme, of guermont bavière differentiated from all possible others, the holiday places to which the Duchess resorted, the daily festivities which the track of her bowling wheels bound as with ribbons to her mansion. If they told me that in those holidays, in those festivities, consisted serially the life of Madame de Guermont, they brought no further light to bear on it. Each of them gave to the life of the Duchess a different determination, but succeeded only in changing the mystery of it, without allowing to escape any of its own mystery, which simply floated, protected by a covering, enclosed in a bell, through the tide of the life of all the world. The Duchess might take her luncheon on the shore of the Mediterranean at carnival time, but in the villa of Madame de Guise, where the Queen of Parisian society was nothing more in her white linen dress among numberless princesses than a guest like any of the rest, and on that account more moving still to me, more herself by being thus made new, like a star of the ballet, who in the fantastic course of a figure takes the place of each of her humbler sisters in succession. She might look at Chinese shadow shows, but at a party given by the Princesse de Parme, listen to tragedy or opera, but from the box of the Princesse de Guermont. As we localise in the body of a person all the potentialities of that person's life, our recollections of the people he knows and has just left or is on his way to meet, if, having learned from Françoise that Madame de Guermont was going on foot to luncheon with the Princesse de Parme, I saw her about midday emerge from a house in a gown of flesh-coloured satin over which her face 
was of the same shade, like a cloud that rises above the setting sun. It was all the pleasures of the Faubourg Saint-Germain that I saw before me, contained in that small compass, as in a shell between its twin valves that glowed with roseate nacre. My father had a friend of the ministry, one A. J. Moreau, who, to distinguish himself from the other Moreaus, took care always to prefix both initials to his name, with the result that people called him for short A. J. Well, somehow or other, this A. J. found himself entitled to a stall at the Opéra Comique on a gala night, and he sent the ticket to my father. And as Burma, whom I'd not been again to see since my first disappointment, was to give an act of Phaedre, my grandmother persuaded my father to pass it on to me. To tell the truth, I attached no importance to this possibility of hearing Burma, which a few years earlier had plunged me in such a state of agitation. And it was not without a sense of melancholy that I realised the fact of my indifference to what at one time I had put before health, comfort, everything. It was not that there had been any slackening in my desire for an opportunity to contemplate close at hand the precious particles of reality of which my imagination caught a broken glimpse, but my imagination no longer placed these in the diction of a great actress. Since my visits to Elstir, it was on certain tapestries, certain modern paintings, that I had brought to bear the inner faith I had once had in this acting, in this tragic art of Burma. My faith, my desire, no longer coming forward to pay incessant worship to the diction, the attitudes of Burma, the counterpart that I possessed of them in my heart, had gradually perished, like those other counterparts of the dead in ancient Egypt, which had to be fed continually in order to maintain their originals in eternal life. This art had become a feeble, tawdry thing. No deep-lying soul inhabited it any more. That evening, as, armed with the ticket my father had received from his friend, I was climbing the grand staircase of the opera, I saw in front of me a man whom I took at first for Monsieur de Charlu, whose bearing he had. When he turned his head to ask some question of one of the staff, I saw that I had been mistaken, but I had no hesitation in placing the stranger in the same class of society from the way not only in which he was dressed, but in which he spoke to the man who took the tickets and to the box openers who were keeping him waiting. For apart from personal details of similarity, there was still at this period between any smart and wealthy man of that section of the nobility and any smart and wealthy man of the world of finance or big business, a strongly marked difference. Where one of the latter would have thought he was giving proof of his exclusiveness by adopting a sharp, haughty tone in speaking to an inferior, the great gentleman, affable, pleasant, smiling, had the air of considering, practising, an affectation of humility and patience, a pretense of being just one of the audience, as a privilege of his good breeding. It is quite likely that, on seeing him thus dissemble behind a smile overflowing with good nature, the barred threshold of the little world apart which he carried in his person, more than one wealthy banker's son entering the theatre at that moment would have taken this great gentleman for a person of no importance if he had not remarked in him an astonishing resemblance to the portrait that had recently appeared in the illustrated papers of a nephew of the Austrian emperor, the Prince of Saxony, who happened to be in Paris at the time. I knew him to be a great friend of the Germont. As I reached the attendant, I heard the Prince of Saxony, or his double, say with a smile, I don't know the number. It was my cousin who told me I had only to ask for her box. He may well have been the Prince of Saxony. It was perhaps of the Duchesse de Guermont, whom in that event I should be able to watch in the process of living one of those moments of her unimaginable life in her cousin's box, that his eyes formed a mental picture when he referred to 
my cousin who told me I had only to ask for her box. So much so that that smiling gaze peculiar to himself, those so simple words, caressed my heart, far more gently than would any abstract meditation, with the alternative feelers of a possible happiness and a vague distinction. Whatever he was, in uttering this sentence to the attendant, he grafted upon a commonplace evening in my everyday life a potential outlet into a new world. The passage to which he was directed, after mentioning the word box, and along which he now proceeded, was moist and mildewed, and seemed to lead to subaqueous grottoes, to the mythical kingdom of the water nymphs. I had before me a gentleman in evening dress who was walking away from me, but I kept playing upon and around him as with a badly fitting reflector on a lamp, and without ever succeeding in making it actually coincide with him, the idea that he was the Prince of Saxony and was on his way to join the Duchesse de Guermont. And for all that he was alone, that idea, external to him, impalpable, immense, unstable as the shadow projected by a magic lantern, seemed to precede and guide him, like that deity, invisible to the rest of mankind, who stands beside the Greek warrior in his hour of battle. I took my seat, striving all the time to recapture a line from Phaedra, which I could not quite remember. In the form in which I repeated it to myself, it had not the right number of feet, but as I made no attempt to count them, between its unwieldiness and a classical line of poetry, it seemed as though no common measure could exist. It would not have surprised me to learn that I must subtract at least half a dozen syllables from that portentous phrase to reduce it to Alexandrine dimensions. But suddenly I remembered it. The irremediable asperities of an inhuman world vanished as if by magic. The syllables of the line at once filled up the requisite measure. What there was in excess floated off with the ease, the dexterity of a bubble of air that rises to burst on the water's brink. And, after all, this excrescence with which I had been struggling consisted of but a single foot. A certain number of orchestra stalls had been offered for sale at the box office and bought out of snobbishness or curiosity, by such as wished to study the appearance of people whom they might not have another opportunity of seeing at close quarters. And it was, indeed, a fragment of their true social life, ordinarily kept secret, that one could examine here in public. For the Princesse de Parme, having herself distributed among her friends the seats in stalls, balconies and boxes, the house was like a drawing-room, in which everyone changed his place, went to sit here or there, wherever he caught sight of a woman whom he knew. Next to me were some common people, who, not knowing the regular subscribers, were anxious to show that they were capable of identifying them, and named them aloud. They went on to remark that these subscribers behaved there as though they were in their own drawing-rooms, meaning that they paid no attention to what was being played which was the exact opposite of what did happen. A budding genius, who had taken a stall in order to hear Burma, thinks only of not soiling his gloves, of not disturbing, of making friends with the neighbour whom chance has put beside him, of pursuing with an intermittent smile the fugitive, avoiding, with apparent want of politeness, the intercepted gaze of a person of his acquaintance, whom he has discovered in the audience, and to whom, after a thousand indecisions, he makes up his mind to go and talk, just as the three hammer blows from the stage, sounding before he has had time to reach his friend, force him to take flight, like the Hebrews in the Red Sea, through a heaving tide of spectators and spectatresses, whom he has obliged to rise, and whose dresses he tears as he passes, or tramples on their boots. On the other hand, it was because the society people sat in their boxes, behind the general terrace of the balcony, as in so many little drawing-rooms, the fourth walls of which had been removed, or in so many little cafes, to which one might go for a refreshment, 
without letting oneself be intimidated by the mirrors in gilt frames or the red plush seats in the Neapolitan style of the establishment. It was because they rested an indifferent hand on the gilded shafts of the columns which upheld this temple of the lyric art. It was because they remained unmoved by the extravagant honours which seemed to be being paid them by a pair of carved figures which held out towards the boxes branches of palm and laurel, that they and they only would have had minds free to listen to the play, if only they had had minds. At first there was nothing visible but vague shadows, in which one suddenly struck, like the gleam of a precious stone which one cannot see, the phosphorescence of a pair of famous eyes, or, like a medallion of Henry the Fourth, on a dark background, the bent profile of the Duc d'Aumal, to whom an invisible lady was exclaiming, Monseigneur must allow me to take his coat, to which the prince replied, Oh, come, come, really, Madame d'Ambrasac. She took it in spite of this vague prohibition, and was envied by all the rest, her being thus honoured. But in the boxes, everywhere almost, the white deities who inhabited these sombre abodes had flown for shelter against their shadowy walls, and remained invisible. Gradually, however, as the performance went on, their vaguely human forms detached themselves, one by one, from the shades of night which they patterned, and, raising themselves towards the light, allowed their semi-nude bodies to emerge, and rose, and stopped at the limit of their course, at the luminous, shaded surface on which their brilliant faces appeared, behind the gaily breaking foam of the feather fans they unfurled and lightly waved. Beneath their hyacinthine locks begemmed with pearls, which the flow of the tide seemed to have caught and drawn with it. This side of them began the orchestra stalls, an abode of mortals forever separated from the transparent, shadowy realm to which, at points here and there, served as boundaries on its brimming surface, the limpid, mirroring eyes of the water nymphs. For the folding seats on its shore, the forms of the monsters in the stalls were painted upon the surface of those eyes, in simple obedience to the laws of optics, and according to their angle of incidence, as happens with those two sections of external reality to which, knowing that they do not possess any soul, however rudimentary, that can be considered as analogous to our own, we should think ourselves mad if we addressed a smile or a glance of recognition, namely, minerals and people to whom we have not been introduced. Beyond this boundary, withdrawing from the limit of their domain, the radiant daughters of the sea kept turning at every moment to smile up at the bearded tritons, who clung to the anfractuosities of the cliff, or towards some aquatic demigod whose head was a polished stone to which the tides had borne a smooth covering of seaweed, and his gaze a disk of rock crystal. They leaned towards these creatures, offering them sweetmeats. Sometimes the flood parted to admit a fresh nereid, who, belated, smiling, apologetic, had just floated into blossom out of the shadowy depths. Then the act ended, having no further hope of hearing the melodious sounds of earth which had drawn them to the surface, plunging back all in a moment, the several sisters vanished into the night. But of all these retreats, to the thresholds of which their mild desire to behold the works of man brought the curious goddesses who let none approach them, the most famous was the cube of semi-darkness known to the world as the stage box of the Princesse de Guermont. Like a mighty goddess who presides from far aloft over the sports of lesser deities, the princess had deliberately remained a little way back on a sofa placed sideways in the box, red as a reef of coral, beside a big glassy splash of reflection, which was probably a mirror, and made one think of the section cut by a ray of sunlight, vertical, clear, liquid, through the flashing crystal of the sea. At once plume and blossom, 
like certain subaqueous growths, a great white flower, downy as the wing of a bird, fell from the brow of the princess along one of her cheeks, the curve of which it followed with a pliancy, coquettish, amorous, alive, and seemed almost to unfold it like a rosy egg in the softness of a halcyon's nest. Over her hair, reaching in front to her eyebrows and caught back lower down at the level of her throat, was spread a net upon which those little white shells which are gathered on some shore of the South Seas alternated with pearls, a marine mosaic barely emerging from the waves and at every moment plunged back again into a darkness in the depths of which even then a human presence was revealed by the ubiquitous flashing of the princess's eyes. The beauty which set her far above all the other fabulous daughters of the dusk was not altogether materially and comprehensively inscribed on her neck, her shoulders, her arms, her figure. But the exquisite, unfinished line of the last was the exact starting point, the inevitable focus of invisible lines which the eye could not help prolonging, marvellous lines, springing into life round the woman like the spectrum of an ideal form projected upon the screen of darkness. That's the Princesse de Guermont, said my neighbour to the gentleman beside her, taking care to begin the word Princesse with a string of peas, to show that a title like that was absurd. She hasn't been sparing with her pearls. I'm sure if I had as many as that, I wouldn't make such a display of them. It doesn't look at all well, to my mind. And yet, when they caught sight of the princess, all those who were looking round to see who was in the audience felt springing up for her in their hearts the rightful throne of beauty. Indeed, with the Duchesse de Luxembourg, with Madame de Morienval, with Madame de saint Uvert, and any number of others, what enabled one to identify their faces would be the juxtaposition of a big red nose to a hair lip or of a pair of wrinkled cheeks to a faint moustache. These features were, nevertheless, sufficient in themselves to attract the eye, since, having merely the conventional value of a written document, they gave one to read a famous and impressive name. But also, they gave one, cumulatively, the idea that ugliness had about it something aristocratic, and that it was unnecessary that the face of a great lady, provided it was distinguished, should be beautiful as well. But like certain artists who, instead of the letters of their names, set at the foot of their canvas a form that is beautiful in itself, a butterfly, a lizard, a flower, so it was the form of a delicious face and figure that the princess had put in the corner of her box, thereby showing that beauty can be the noblest of signatures. For the presence there of Madame de Guermont Bavière, who brought to the theatre only such persons as at other times formed part of her intimate circle, was in the eyes of specialists in aristocracy the best possible certificate of the authenticity of the picture which her box presented, a sort of evocation of a scene in the ordinary private life of the princess in her palaces in Munich and in Paris. Our imagination being like a barrel organ out of order, which always plays some other tune than that shown on its card. Every time that I had heard any mention of the Princesse de Guermont Bavière, a recollection of certain 16th century masterpieces had begun singing in my brain. I was obliged to rid myself quickly of this association, now that I saw her engaged in offering crystallized fruit to a stout gentleman in a swallowtail coat. Certainly, I was very far from the conclusion that she and her guests were mere human beings, like the rest of the audience. I understood that what they were doing there was all only a game, and that, as a prelude to the acts of their real life, of which presumably this was not where they spent the important part they had arranged, in obedience to a ritual unknown to me, they were feigning to offer and decline sweetmeats, a gesture robbed of its ordinary significance 
and regulated beforehand, like the step of a dancer who alternately raises herself on her toes and circles about an upheld scarf. For all I knew, perhaps at the moment of offering him her sweetmeats, the goddess was saying, with that note of irony in her voice, for I saw her smile, Do have one, won't you? What mattered that to me? I should have found a delicious refinement in the deliberate dryness in the style of Merry May or Mayak of such words addressed by a goddess to a demigod who, conscious himself what were the sublime thoughts which they both had in their minds, in reserve, doubtless, until the moment when they would begin again to live their true life, consenting to join in the game, was answering with the same mysterious bitterness, Thanks, I should like a cherry. And I should have listened to this dialogue with the same avidity as to a scene from Le Mari de la Débutante, where the absence of poetry, of lofty thoughts, things so familiar to me which, I suppose, Mayak could easily, had he chosen, have put into it a thousand times over, seemed to me in itself a refinement, a conventional refinement, and therefore all the more mysterious and instructive. That fat fellow is the Marquis de Ganoncey, came in a knowing tone from the man next to me, who had not quite caught the name whispered in the row behind. The Marquis de Palancy, his face bent downwards at the end of his long neck, his round, bulging eye glued to the glass of his monocle, was moving with a leisurely displacement through the transparent shade, and appeared no more to see the public in the stalls than a fish that drifts past, unconscious of the press of curious gazers, behind the glass wall of an aquarium. Now and again he paused, a venerable, wheezing monument, and the audience could not have told whether he was in pain, asleep, swimming, about to spawn, or merely taking breath. No one else aroused in me so much envy as he, on account of his apparent familiarity with this box, and the indifference with which he allowed the princess to hold out to him her box of sweetmeats, throwing him at the same time a glance from her fine eyes cut in a pair of diamonds which at such moments wit and friendliness seemed to liquefy, whereas when they were at rest, reduced to their purely material beauty, to their mineral brilliance alone, if the least reflected flash disturbed them ever so slightly, they set the darkness ablaze with inhuman, horizontal, splendid fires. But now, because the act of Phaedre in which Burma was playing was due to start, the princess came to the front of the box, whereupon, as if she herself were a theatrical production, in the zone of light which she traversed, I saw not only the colour but the material of her adornments change, and in the box, dry now, emerging a part no longer of the watery realm, the princess, ceasing to be a nereid, appeared turbaned in white and blue, like some marvellous tragic actress dressed for the part of Zaire, or perhaps of Orosmane. Finally, when she had taken her place in the front row, I saw that the soft halcyon's nest, which tenderly shielded the rosy nacre of her cheeks, was downy, dazzling, velvety, an immense bird of paradise. But now my gaze was diverted from the Princesse de Guermont's box by a little woman who came in, ill-dressed, plain, her eyes ablaze with indignation, followed by two young men, and sat down a few places from me. At length the curtain went up. I could not help being saddened by the reflection that there remained now no trace of my old disposition at the period when, so as to miss nothing of the extraordinary phenomenon which I would have gone to the ends of the earth to see, I kept my mind prepared, like the sensitive plates which astronomers take out to Africa, to the West Indies, to make and record an exact observation of a comet or an eclipse, when I trembled for fear lest some cloud, a fit of ill-humour on the artist's part, or an incident in the audience, 
should prevent the spectacle from presenting itself with the maximum of intensity. When I should not have believed that I was watching it in the most perfect conditions, had I not gone to the very theatre which was consecrated to it like an altar, in which I then felt to be still a part of it, though an accessory part only, the officials with their white carnations appointed by her, the vaulted balcony covering a pit filled with a shabbily dressed crowd, the women selling programmes that had her photograph, the chestnut trees on the square outside, all those companions, those confidants of my impressions of those days, which seemed to me to be inseparable from them. Phèdre, the declaration scene, Burma, had had then for me a sort of absolute existence. Standing aloof from the world of current experience, they existed by themselves. I must go to meet them. I should penetrate what I could of them, and if I opened my eyes and soul to their fullest extent, I should still absorb but a very little of them. But how pleasant life seemed to me. The triviality of the form of it that I myself was leading mattered nothing, no more than the time we spend undressing, on getting ready to go out, since, transcending it, there existed in an absolute form good and difficult to approach, impossible to possess in their entirety, those more solid realities, Phèdre and the way in which Burma spoke her part. Steeped in these dreams of perfection in the dramatic art, a strong dose of which anyone who had at the time subjected my mind to analysis at any moment of the day or even the night would have been able to prepare from it, I was like a battery that accumulates and stores up electricity. And a time had come when, ill as I was, even if I had believed that I should die of it, I should still have been compelled to go and hear Burma. But now, like a hill which from a distance seems a patch of azure sky, but as we draw nearer returns to its place in our ordinary field of vision, all this had left the world of the absolute and was no more than a thing like other things, of which I took cognizance because I was there. The actors were people of the same substance as the people I knew, trying to speak in the best possible way these lines of Phèdre, which themselves no longer formed a sublime and individual essence, distinct from everything else, but were simply more or less effective lines, ready to slip back into the vast corpus of French poetry, of which they were merely a part. I felt a discouragement that was all the more profound in that, if the object of my headstrong and active desire no longer existed, the same tendencies, on the other hand, to indulge in a perpetual dream, which varied from year to year, but led me always to sudden impulses, regardless of danger, still persisted. The day on which I rose from my bed of sickness and set out to see, in some country house or other, a picture by Elstir, or a medieval tapestry, was so like the day on which I ought to have started for Venice, or that on which I did go to see Burma, or start for Baalbek, that I felt before going that the immediate object of my sacrifice would, after a little while, leave me cold, that then I might pass close by the place without stopping even to look at that picture, those tapestries, for which I would at this moment risk so many sleepless nights, so many hours of pain. I discerned in the instability of its object the vanity of my effort, and at the same time its vastness, which I had not before noticed, like a neurasthenic whose exhaustion we double by pointing out to him that he is exhausted. In the meantime, my musings gave a distinction to everything that had any connection with them, and even in my most carnal desires, magnetized always in a certain direction, concentrated about a single dream, I might have recognized as their primary motive an idea, an idea for which I would have laid down my life, at the innermost core of which, as in my daydreams when I sat reading all afternoon in the garden at Combray, lay the thought of perfection. I no longer felt the same indulgence as on the former occasion, 
towards the deliberate expressions of affection or anger which I had then remarked in the delivery and gestures of Arisi, Ismen, and Hippolyte. It was not that the players, they were the same, by the way, did not still seek, with the same intelligent application, to impart now a caressing inflection or a calculated ambiguity to their voices, now a tragic amplitude or a suppliant meekness to their movements. Their intonations bade the voice, Be gentle, sing like a nightingale, caress and woo, or else, Now wax furious, and then hurled themselves upon it, trying to carry it off with them in their frenzied rush. But it, mutinous, independent of their diction, remained unalterably their natural voice with its material defects or charms, its everyday vulgarity or affectation, and thus presented a sum total of acoustic or social phenomena which the sentiment contained in the lines they were repeating was powerless to alter. Similarly, the gestures of the players said to their arms, to their garments, Be majestic! But each of these unsubmissive members allowed to flaunt itself between shoulder and elbow a biceps which knew nothing of the part. They continued to express the triviality of everyday life and to bring into prominence, instead of fine shades of Racinian meaning, mere muscular attachments, and the draperies which they held up fell back again along vertical lines in which the natural law that governs falling bodies was challenged only by an insipid textile pliancy. At this point, the little woman who was sitting near me exclaimed, Not a hand! Did you ever see such a get-up? She's too old. She can't play the part. She ought to have retired ages ago. Amid a sibilant protest from their neighbours, the two young men with her succeeded in making her keep quiet, and her fury raged now only in her eyes. This fury could, moreover, be prompted only by the thought of success, of fame, for Burma, who had earned so much money, was overwhelmed with debts. Since she was always making business or social appointments which she was prevented from keeping, she had messengers flying with apologies along every street in Paris, and what with rooms in hotels which she would never occupy engaged in advance, oceans of scent to bathe her dogs, heavy penalties for breaches of contract with all her managers, failing any more serious expense and being not so voluptuous as Cleopatra, she would have found the means of squandering on telegrams and job masters, provinces and kingdoms. But the little woman was an actress who had never tasted success and had vowed a deadly hatred against Burma. The latter had just come onto the stage. And then, oh, the miracle, like those lessons which we laboured in vain to learn overnight and find intact got by heart on waking up next morning, like to those faces of dead friends which the impassioned efforts of our memory pursue without recapturing them, and which, when we are no longer thinking of them, are there before our eyes just as they were in life. The talent of Burma, which had evaded me when I sought so greedily to seize its essential qualities, now, after these years of oblivion, in this hour of indifference, imposed itself with all the force of a thing directly seen on my admiration. End of section two. Section three of The Guermantes Way, Le Côté de Guermantes, by Marcel Proust, translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michael O'Kelly. Names of People The Duchesse de Guermantes. Formerly, in my attempts to isolate the talent, I had deducted, so to speak, from what I had heard, the part itself, 
a part common to all the actresses who appeared as Phaedre, which I had myself studied beforehand, so that I might be capable of subtracting it, of receiving in the strained residue only the talent of Madame Berma. But this talent, which I sought to discover outside the part itself, was indissolubly one with it. So, with a great musician, it appears that this was the case with Vontai when he played the piano, his playing is that of so fine a pianist that one cannot even be certain whether the performer is a pianist at all, since, not interposing all that mechanism of muscular effort, crowned here and there with brilliant effects, all that spattering shower of notes, in which at least the listener who does not quite know where he is thinks that he can discern talent in all its material, tangible objectivity, his playing has become so transparent, so full of what he is interpreting, that himself one no longer sees, and he is nothing now but a window opening upon a great work of art. The intentions which surrounded, like a majestic or delicate border, the voice and mimicry of Arisi, Ismen, or Hippolyte, I had been able to distinguish. But Phaedre had taken hers into herself, and my mind had not succeeded in resting from her diction and attitudes, in apprehending in the miserly simplicity of their unbroken surfaces those treasures, those efforts, of which no sign emerged, so completely had they been absorbed. Burma's voice, in which not one atom of lifeless matter, refractory to the mind, remained undissolved, did not allow any sign to be discernible around it of that overflow of tears which one could feel because they had not been able to absorb it into themselves, trickling over the marble voice of Arisi or his men, but had been brought to an exquisite perfection in each of its tiniest cells, like the instrument of a master violinist in whom one means, when one says that his music has a fine sound, to praise not a physical peculiarity, but a superiority of soul. And, as in the classical landscape, where in the place of a vanished nymph there is an inanimate water spring, a clear and concrete intention had been transformed into a certain quality of tone, strangely, appropriately, coldly limpid. Burma's arms, which the lines themselves, by the same dynamic force that made the words issue from her lips, seemed to raise onto her bosom like leaves disturbed by a gush of water. Her attitude on the stage, which she had gradually built up, which she was to modify yet further, and which was based upon reasonings of a different profundity from those of which traces might be seen in the gestures of her fellow actors, but of reasonings that had lost their original deliberation and had melted into a sort of radiance in which they sent throbbing round the person of the heroine elements rich and complex, but which the fascinated spectator took not as an artistic triumph, but as a natural gift. Those white veils themselves, which tenuous and clinging, seemed to be of a living substance and to have been woven by the suffering half-pagan, half-Jansenist, around which they drew close like a frail, shrinking chrysalis, all of them, voice, attitude, gestures, veils, were nothing more round this embodiment of an idea, which a line of poetry is, an embodiment that, unlike our human bodies, covers the soul not with an opaque screen which prevents us from seeing it, but with a purified, a quickened garment through which the soul is diffused and we discover it, than additional envelopes, which instead of concealing, showed up in greater splendour the soul that had assimilated them to itself and had spread itself through them than layers of different substances grown translucent, the interpolation of which has the effect only of causing a richer refraction of the imprisoned central ray that pierces through them, 
and of making more extensive, more precious, and more fair the matter purified by fire in which it is enshrined. So Burma's interpretation was, around Racine's work, a second work, quickened also by the breath of genius. My own impression, to tell the truth, though more pleasant than on the earlier occasion, was not really different. Only I no longer put it to the test of a pre-existent, abstract and false idea of dramatic genius. And I understood now that dramatic genius was precisely this. It had just occurred to me that if I had not derived any pleasure from my first hearing of Burma, it was because, as earlier still when I used to meet Gilbert in the Champs-Élysées, I had come to her with too strong a desire. Between my two disappointments, there was perhaps not only this resemblance, but another more profound. The impression given us by a person or a work, or a rendering for that matter, of marked individuality, is peculiar to that person or work. We have brought to it the ideas of beauty, breadth of style, pathos, and so forth, which we might, failing anything better, have had the illusion of discovering in the commonplace show of a correct face or talent. But our critical spirit has before it the insistent challenge of a form of which it possesses no intellectual equivalent, in which it must detect and isolate the unknown element. It hears a shrill sound, an oddly interrogative intonation. It asks itself, is that good? Is what I am feeling just now admiration? Is that richness of colouring, nobility, strength? And what answers it again is a shrill voice, a curiously questioning tone, the despotic impression caused by a person whom one does not know, wholly material, in which there is no room left for breath of interpretation. And for this reason, it is the really beautiful works that, if we listen to them with sincerity, must disappoint us most keenly, because in the storehouse of our ideas, there is none that corresponds to an individual impression. This was precisely what Burma's acting showed me. This was what was meant by nobility, by intelligence of diction. Now I could appreciate the worth of a broad, poetical, powerful interpretation, or rather it was to this that those epithets were conventionally applied, but only as we give the names of Mars, Venus, Saturn to planets which have no place in classical mythology. We feel in one world, we think we give names to things in another. Between the two, we can establish a certain correspondence, but not bridge the interval. It was quite narrow, this interval, this fault that I had had to cross when, that afternoon on which I went first to hear Burma, having strained my ears to catch every word, I had found some difficulty in correlating my ideas of nobility of interpretation, of originality, and had broken out in applause only after a moment of unconsciousness, and as if my applause sprang not from my actual impression, but was connected in some way with my preconceived ideas, with the pleasure that I found in saying to myself, at last I am listening to Burma. And the difference that there is between a person or a work of art which is markedly individual and the idea of beauty exists just as much between what they make us feel and the idea of love or of admiration. Wherefore, we fail to recognise them. I had found no pleasure in listening to Burma, any more than earlier still in seeing Gilbert. I had said to myself, well, I do not admire this. But then... I was thinking only of mastering the secret of Burma's acting. I was preoccupied with that alone. I was trying to open my mind as wide as possible to receive all that her acting contained. I understand now that all this amounted to nothing more or less than admiration. 
This genius, of which Burma's rendering of the part was only the revelation, was it indeed the genius of Racine and nothing more? I thought so at first. I was soon to be undeceived when the curtain fell on the act from Phaedre, amid enthusiastic recalls from the audience, through which the old actress, beside herself with rage, drawing her little body up to its full height, turning sideways in her seat, stiffened the muscles of her face and folded her arms on her bosom to show that she was not joining the others in their applause and to make more noticeable a protest which to her appeared sensational, though it passed unperceived. The piece that followed was one of those novelties which at one time I had expected, since they were not famous, to be inevitably trivial and of no general application, devoid as they were of any existence outside the performance that was being given of them at the moment. But I had not with them, as with a classic, the disappointment of seeing the infinity and eternity of a masterpiece occupy no more space or time than the width of the footlights and the length of a performance which would finish it effectively as a piece written for the occasion. Besides, at every fresh passage which I felt had appealed to the audience and would one day be famous, in place of the fame which it was prevented from having won in the past, I added that which it would enjoy in the future. By a mental process, the converse of that which consists in imagining masterpieces on the day of their first thin performance, when it seemed inconceivable that a title which no one had ever heard before could one day be set, bathed in the same mellow light beside those of the author's other works. And this part would be set one day in the list of her finest impersonations, next to that of Phaedre. Not that in itself it was not destitute of all literary merit, but Burma was as sublime in one as in the other. I realised then that the work of the playwright was for the actress no more than the material, the nature of which was comparatively unimportant, for the creation of her masterpiece of interpretation, just as the great painter whom I had met at Baalbek, Elster, had found the inspiration for two pictures of equal merit, in a school building without any character, and a cathedral which was in itself a work of art. And as the painter dissolves houses, carts, people, in some broad effect of light which makes them all alike, so Burma spread out great sheets of terror or tenderness over words that were all melted together in a common mould, lowered or raised to one level, which a lesser artist would have carefully detached from one another. No doubt each of them had an inflection of its own, and Burma's diction did not prevent one from catching the rhythm of the verse. Is it not already a first element of ordered complexity, of beauty, when on hearing a rhyme, that is to say something which is at once similar to and different from the preceding rhyme, which was prompted by it, but introduces the variety of a new idea, one is conscious of two systems overlapping each other, one intellectual, the other prosodic. But Burma, at the same time, made her words, her lines, her whole speeches even, flow into lakes of sound vaster than themselves, at the margins of which it was a joy to see them obliged to stop, to break off. Thus it is that a poet takes pleasure in making hesitate for a moment at the rhyming point the word which is about to spring forth, and a composer in merging the various words of his libretto in a single rhythm which contradicts, captures and controls them. Thus into the prose sentences of the modern playwright, as into the poetry of Racine, Burma managed to introduce those vast images of grief, nobility, passion, which were the masterpieces of her own personal art, and in which she could be recognised as, in the portraits which she has made of different sitters, we recognise a painter. I had no longer any desire, as on the former occasion, 
to be able to arrest and perpetuate Burma's attitudes. The fine colour effect which she gave for a moment only in a beam of limelight, which at once faded never to reappear, nor to make her repeat a single line a hundred times over. I realised that my original desire had been more exacting than the intentions of the poet, the actress, the great decorative artist who supervised her productions, and that that charm which floated over a line as it was spoken, those unstable poses perpetually transformed into others, those successive pictures, were the transient result, the momentary object, the changing masterpiece which the art of the theatre undertook to create, and which would perish were an attempt made to fix it for all time by a too much enraptured listener. I did not even make a resolution to come back another day and hear Burma again. I was satisfied with her. It was when I admired too keenly not to be disappointed by the object of my admiration, whether that object were Gilbert or Burma, that I demanded in advance of the impression to be received on the morrow the pleasure that yesterday's impression had refused to afford me. Without seeking to analyse the joy which I had begun now to feel, and might perhaps have been turning to some more profitable use, I said to myself, as in the old days I might have said to one of my schoolfellows, Certainly I put Burma first. Not without a confused feeling that Burma's genius was not, perhaps, very accurately represented by this affirmation of my preference, or this award to her of a first place, whatever the peace of mind that it might incidentally restore to me. Just as the curtain was rising on this second play, I looked up at Madame de Guermont's box. The princess was in the act by a movement that called into being an exquisite line which my mind pursued into the void, of turning her head towards the back of the box. Her party were all standing, and also turning towards the back, and between the double hedge which they thus formed, with all the assurance, the grandeur of the goddess that she was, but with a strange meekness which so late an arrival, making everyone else get up in the middle of the performance, blended with the white muslin in which she was attired, just as an adroitly compounded air of simplicity, shyness and confusion tempered her triumphant smile, the Duchesse de Guermont, who had at that moment entered the box, came towards her cousin, made a profound obeisance to a young man with fair hair who was seated in the front row, and turning again towards the amphibian monsters who were floating in the recesses of the cavern, gave to these demigods of the jockey club, who at that moment, and among them all Monsieur de Palancy in particular, were the men whom I should most have liked to be, the familiar good evening of an old and intimate friend, an allusion to the daily sequence of her relations with them during the last fifteen years. I felt the mystery, but could not solve the riddle of that smiling gaze which she addressed to her friends in the azure brilliance with which it glowed while she surrendered her hand to one and then to another, a gaze which, could I have broken up its prism, analysed its crystallisation, might perhaps have revealed to me the essential quality of the unknown form of life which became apparent in it at that moment. The Duc de Guermont followed his wife, the flash of his monocle, the gleam of his teeth, the whiteness of his carnation, or of his pleated shirt front, scattering, to make room for their light, the darkness of his eyebrows, lips and coat. With a wave of his outstretched hand, which he let drop onto their shoulders vertically without moving his head, he commanded the inferior monsters, who were making way for him, to resume their seats, and made a profound bow to the fair young man. One would have said that the Duchess had guessed that her cousin, of whom it was rumoured she was inclined to make fun for what she called her exaggerations, a name which, from her own point of view, so typically French and restrained, would naturally be applied to the poetry and enthusiasm of the Teuton, 
would be wearing this evening one of those costumes in which the Duchess thought of her as dressed up, and that she had decided to give her a lesson in good taste. Instead of the wonderful downy plumage which, from the crown of the princess's head, fell and swept her throat, instead of her net of shells and pearls, the Duchess wore in her hair only a simple aigrette, which, rising above her arched nose and level eyes, reminded one of the crest on the head of a bird. Her neck and shoulders emerged from a drift of snow-white muslin, against which fluttered a swan's down fan, but below this her gown, the bodice of which had for its sole ornament innumerable spangles, either little sticks and beads of metal, or possibly brilliants, moulded her figure with a precision that was positively British. But, different as their two costumes were, after the princess had given her cousin the chair in which she herself had been previously sitting, they could be seen turning to gaze at one another in mutual appreciation. Possibly a smile would curve the lips of Madame de Guermantes when next day she referred to the headdress, a little too complicated, which the princess had worn, but certainly she would declare that it had been, all the same, quite lovely and marvellously arranged. And the princess, whose own tastes found something a little cold, a little austere, a little tailor-made in her cousin's way of dressing, would discover in this rigid sobriety an exquisite refinement. Moreover, the harmony that existed between them, the universal and pre-established gravitation exercised by their upbringing, neutralised the contrasts not only in their apparel, but in their attitude. By those invisible magnetic longitudes which the refinement of their manners traced between them, the expansive nature of the princess was stopped short, while on the other hand the former correctness of the duchess allowed itself to be attracted and relaxed, turned to sweetness and charm. As, in the play which was now being performed, to realise how much personal poetry Burma extracted from it, one only had to entrust the part which she was playing, which she alone could play, to no matter what other actress. So the spectator who should raise his eyes to the balcony might see in two smaller boxes there how an arrangement, supposed to suggest that of the Princess de Guermont, simply made the Baron de Morionval appear eccentric, pretentious, and ill-bred, while an effort as painstaking as it must have been costly to imitate the clothes and style of the Duchesse de Guermont only made Madame de Combremy look like some provincial schoolgirl, mounted on wires, rigid, erect, dry, angular, with a plume of raven's feathers stuck vertically in her hair. Perhaps the proper place for this lady was not a theatre in which it was only with the brightest stars of the season that the boxes even those in the highest tier, which from below seemed like great hampers, brimming with human flowers, and fastened to the gallery on which they stood by the red cords of their plush-covered partitions, composed a panorama which deaths, scandals, illnesses, quarrels would soon alter, but which this evening was held motionless by attention, heat, giddiness, dust, smartness or boredom, in that, so to speak, everlasting moment of unconscious waiting and calm torpor, which, in retrospect, seems always to have preceded the explosion of a bomb or the first flicker of a fire. The explanation of Madame de Combremet's presence on this occasion was that the Princesse de Parme, devoid of snobbishness as are most truly royal personages, and to make up for this devoured by a pride in and passion for charity, which held an equal place in her heart with her taste for what she believed to be the arts, had bestowed a few boxes here and there upon women like Madame de Combremet, who were not numbered among the highest aristocratic society, but with whom she was connected in various charitable undertakings. Madame de Combremet never took her eyes off the Duchesse and the Princesse de Guermantes, which was all the simpler for her since, not being actually acquainted with either, she could not be suspected of angling for recognition. 
Inclusion in the visiting lists of these two great ladies was nevertheless the goal towards which she had been marching for the last ten years with untiring patience. She had calculated that she might reach it, possibly in five years more. But having been smitten by a relentless malady, the inexorable character of which, for she prided herself upon her medical knowledge, she thought she knew, she was afraid that she might not live so long. This evening she was happy at least in the thought that all these women whom she barely knew would see in her company a man who was one of their own set, the young Marquis de Beausargent, Madame d'Argencourt's brother, who moved impartially in both worlds and with whom the women of the second were greatly delighted to bedizen themselves before the eyes of those of the first. He was seated behind Madame de Combremet on the chair placed at an angle, so that he might rake the other boxes with his glasses. He knew everyone in the house, and to greet his friends, with the irresistible charm of his beautifully curved figure and a fine fair head, he half rose from his seat, stiffening his body, a smile brightening his blue eyes with a blend of deference and detachment, a picture delicately engraved in its rectangular frame and placed at an angle to the wall, like one of those old prints which portray a great nobleman in his courtly pride. He often accepted these invitations to go with Madame de Combremay to the play. In the theatre itself, and on their way out in the lobby, he stood gallantly by her side in the thick of the throng of more brilliant friends whom he saw about him, and to whom he refrained from speaking to avoid any awkwardness, just as though he had been in doubtful company. If at such moments there swept by him the Princesse de Guermantes, light-foot and fair as Diana, letting trail behind her the folds of an incomparable cloak, turning after her every head and followed by every eye, and most of all by Madame de Combremais, Monsieur de Beausargent would become absorbed in conversation with his companion, acknowledging the friendly and dazzling smile of the princess only with constraint, under compulsion, and with the well-bred reserve, the considerate coldness of a person whose friendliness might, at the moment, have been inconvenient. Had not Madame de Combremay known already that the box belonged to the princess, she could still have told that the Duchesse de Guermont was the guest, from the air of keener interest with which she was surveying the spectacle of stage and stalls, out of politeness to her hostess. But simultaneously with this centrifugal force, an equal and opposite force, generated by the same desire to be sociable, drew her attention back to her own attire, her plume, her necklace, her bodice, and also to that of the princess, whose subject, whose slave, her cousin seemed thus to proclaim herself, come thither solely to see her, ready to follow her elsewhere, should it have taken the fancy of the official occupant of the box to rise and leave, and regarding as composed merely of strangers, worth looking at simply as curiosities, the rest of the house, in which, nevertheless, she numbered many friends, to whose boxes she regularly repaired on other evenings, and with regard to whom she never failed on these occasions to demonstrate a similar loyalism, exclusive, conditional, and hebdomadary. Madame de Combremay was surprised to see her there that evening. She knew that the Duchess was staying on very late at Guermont, and had supposed her to be there still, but she had been told also that sometimes, when there was some special function in Paris which she considered it worth her while to attend, Madame de Guermont would order one of her carriages to be brought round as soon as she had taken tea with the guns, and, as the sun was setting, start out at a spanking pace through the gathering darkness of the forest, then over the high road, to join the train at Combray, and so be in Paris the same evening. Perhaps she has come up from Guermont on purpose to hear Burma, thought Madame de Combremay, and marvelled at the thought. And she remembered having heard Swann say, in that ambiguous jargon which he used in common with Monsieur de Charlu, the Duchess is one of the noblest souls in Paris, the cream of the most refined, the choicest society. 
for myself, who derived from the names of Guermont, Bavaria and Condé, what I imagined to be the life, the thoughts of the two cousins, I could no longer so ascribe their faces, having seen them, I would rather have had their opinion of Phaedre than that of the greatest critic in the world, for in his I should have found merely intellect, an intellect superior to my own, but similar in kind. But what the Duchesse and Princesse de Garmont might think, an opinion which would have furnished me with an invaluable clue to the nature of these two poetic creatures, I imagined with the aid of their names, I endowed with an irrational charm, and with the thirst, the longing of a fever-stricken wretch, what I demanded that their opinion of Phaedre should yield to me was the charm of the summer afternoons that I had spent wandering along the Guermont Way. Madame de Combremé was trying to make out how exactly the cousins were dressed. For my own part, I never doubted that their garments were peculiar to themselves, not merely in the sense in which the livery with red collar or blue facings had belonged once exclusively to the houses of Guermont and Condé, but rather, as is peculiar to a bird, the plumage which, as well as being a heightening of its beauty, is an extension of its body. The toilet of these two ladies seemed to me like a materialization, snow white or patterned with colour, of their internal activity, and, like the gestures which I had seen the Princesse de Guermont make, with no doubt in my mind that they corresponded to some idea latent in hers, the plumes which swept downward from her brow and her cousin's glittering spangled bodice seemed each to have a special meaning, to be to one or the other lady an attribute which was hers and hers alone, the significance of which I would eagerly have learned. The bird of paradise seemed inseparable from its wearer, as her peacock is from Juno, and I did not believe that any other woman could usurp that spangled bodice any more than the fringed and flashing aegis of Minerva. When I turned my eyes to their box, far more than on the ceiling of the theatre, painted with cold and lifeless allegories, it was as though I had seen, thanks to a miraculous rending of the clouds that ordinarily veiled it, the assembly of the gods, in the act of contemplating the spectacle of mankind beneath a crimson canopy in a clear lighted space between two pillars of heaven. I gazed on this brief transfiguration with a disturbance which was partly soothed by the feeling that I myself was unknown to these immortals. The Duchess had indeed seen me once with her husband, but could surely have kept no memory of that and it gave me no pain that she found herself, owing to the place that she occupied in the box, in a position to gaze down upon the nameless collective madrepores of the public in the stalls. For I had the happy sense that my own personality had been dissolved in theirs when, at the moment in which, by the force of certain optical laws, there must, I suppose, have come to paint itself on the impassive current of those blue eyes the blurred outline of the protozoon, devoid of any individual existence, which was myself, I saw a ray illumine them. The Duchess, goddess turned woman, and appearing in that moment a thousand times more lovely, raised, pointed in my direction the white-gloved hand which had been resting on the balustrade of the box, waved it at me in token of friendship. My gaze felt itself trapped in the spontaneous incandescence of the flashing eyes of the princess, who had unconsciously set them ablaze, merely by turning her head to see who it might be that her cousin was thus greeting, while the duchess, who had remembered me, showered upon me the sparkling and celestial torrent of her smile. And now, every morning, Long before the hour at which she would appear, I went by a devious course to post myself at the corner of the street along which she generally came, and, when the moment of her arrival seemed imminent, strolled homewards with an air of being absorbed in something else, looking the other way and raising my eyes to her face as I drew level with her, 
but as though I had not in the least expected to see her. Indeed, for the first few mornings, so as to be sure of not missing her, I waited opposite the house, and every time that the carriage gate opened, letting out one after another so many people who were none of them she for whom I was waiting, its grinding rattle continued in my heart in a series of oscillations which took me a long time to subdue. For never was a devotee of a famous actress whom he did not know, posting himself and patrolling the pavement outside the stage door, never was angry or idolatrous crowd gathered to insult or to carry in triumph through the streets the condemned assassin or the national hero whom it believes to be on the point of coming. Whenever a sound is heard from the inside of the prison or the palace, never were these so stirred by their emotion as I was, awaiting the emergence of this great lady, who in her simple attire was able, by the grace of her movements, quite different from the gait she affected on entering a drawing room or a box, to make of her morning walk, and for me there was no one in the world but herself out walking, a whole poem of elegant refinement and the finest ornament, the most curious flower of the season. But after the third day, so that the porter should not discover my stratagem, I betook myself much further afield, to some point upon the Duchess's usual route. Often, before that evening at the theatre, I had made similar little excursions before luncheon, when the weather was fine. If it had been raining, at the first gleam of sunshine, I would hasten downstairs to take a turn, and if, suddenly, coming towards me, on the still wet pavement, changed by the sun into a golden lacquer, in the transformation of a crossroads, dusty with a grey mist which the sun had tanned and gilded, I caught sight of a schoolgirl, followed by her governess, or of a dairymaid with her white sleeves. I stood motionless, my hand pressed to my heart, which was already leaping towards an unexplored form of life. I tried to bear in mind the street, the time, the number of the door through which the girl, whom I followed sometimes, had vanished and failed to reappear. Fortunately, the fleeting nature of these cherished images, which I promised myself that I would make an effort to see again, prevented them from fixing themselves with any vividness in my memory. No matter... I was less sad now at the thought of my own ill health, of my never having summoned up courage to set to work, to begin a book. The world appeared to me now a pleasanter place to live in, life a more interesting experience now that I had learned that the streets of Paris, like the roads around Baalbek, were a flower with those unknown beauties whom I had so often sought to evoke from the woods of Méséglise, each one of whom aroused a sensual longing which she alone appeared capable of assuaging. On coming home from the Opéra Comique, I had added for next morning to the list of those which for some days past I had been hoping to meet again the form of Madame de Guermantes, tall, with her high-piled crown of silky golden hair, with the kindness promised me in the smile which she had directed at me from her cousin's box. I would follow the course which Françoise had told me that the Duchess generally took, and I would try at the same time, in the hope of meeting two girls, whom I had seen a few days earlier, not to miss the break-up of their respective class and catechism. But in the meantime, ever and again, the scintillating smile of Madame de Guermont, the pleasant sensation it had given me, returned, and without exactly knowing what I was doing, I tried to find a place for them, as a woman studies the possible effect on her dress of some set of jewelled buttons that have just been given her, beside the romantic ideas which I had long held, and which Albertine's coldness, Giselle's premature departure, and before them my deliberate and too long sustained separation from Gilbert had set free. The idea, for instance, of being loved by a woman, of having a life in common with her. Next, it had been the image of one or other of the two girls seen in the street 
that I brought into relation with those ideas, to which immediately afterwards I was trying to adapt my memory of the Duchess. Compared with those ideas, my memory of Madame de Guermont at the Opera Comique was a very little thing, a tiny star twinkling beside the long tail of a blazing comet. Moreover, I had been quite familiar with the ideas long before I came to know Madame de Guermont. My memory of her, on the contrary, I possessed but imperfectly. Every now and then it escaped me. It was during the hours when, from floating vaguely in my mind in the same way as the images of various other pretty women, it passed gradually into unique and definite association, exclusive of every other feminine form, with those romantic ideas of so much longer standing than itself, it was during those few hours in which I remembered it most clearly that I ought to have taken steps to find out exactly what it was. But I did not then know the importance which it was to assume for me. It was pleasant merely as a first private meeting with Madame de Guermont inside myself. It was the first, the only accurate sketch the only one taken from life, the only one that was really Madame de Guermont. During the few hours in which I was fortunate enough to retain it, without having the sense to pay it any attention, it must all the same have been charming, that memory, since it was always to it, and quite freely, moreover, to that moment, without haste, without strain, without the slightest compulsion or anxiety, that my ideas of love returned. Then, as gradually those ideas fixed it more definitely, it acquired from them a proportionately greater strength, but itself became more vague. Presently, I could no longer recapture it, and in my dreams I probably altered it completely. For whenever I saw Madame de Guermont, I realised the difference never twice as it happened the same, between what I had imagined and what I saw. And now every morning, certainly at the moment when Madame de Guermont emerged from her gateway at the top of the street, I saw again her tall figure, her face with its bright eyes and crown of silken hair, all the things for which I was there waiting, but on the other hand, a minute or two later, when having first turned my eyes away so as not to appear to be waiting for this encounter which I had come out to seek, I raised them to look at the Duchess at the moment in which we converged. What I saw then were red patches, as to which I know not whether they were due to the fresh air or to a faulty complexion, on a sullen face, which, with the curtest of nods, a long way removed from the affability of the Fedre evening, acknowledged my salute, which I addressed to her daily with an air of surprise, which did not seem to please her. And yet, after a few days, during which my memory of the two girls fought against heavy odds for the mastery of my amorous feelings against that of Madame de Guermont, it was in the end the latter, which, as though of its own accord, generally prevailed while its competitors withdrew. It was to it that I finally found myself, deliberately moreover, and as though by preference, and for my own pleasure, to have transferred all my thoughts of love. I had ceased to dream of the little girls coming from their catechism, or of a certain dairymaid, and yet I had also lost all hope of encountering in the street what I had come out to seek, either the affection promised to me at the theatre in a smile, or the profile, the bright face beneath its pile of golden hair, which were so only when seen from afar. Now I should not have been able to say what Madame de Guermont was like, by what I recognised her, for every day, in the picture which she presented as a whole, the face was different, as were the dress and the hat. Why did I, one morning, when I saw bearing down on me beneath a violet hood a sweet, smooth face whose charms were symmetrically arranged about a pair of blue eyes, a face 
in which the curve of the nose seemed to have been absorbed, gauge from a joyous emotion in my bosom that I was not going to return home without having caught a glimpse of Madame de Guermantes, and on the next feel the same disturbance, affect the same indifference, turn away my eyes in the same careless manner as on the day before, on the apparition seen in profile as she crossed from a side street and crowned with a navy blue toque of a beak-like nose bounding a flushed cheek, checkered with a piercing eye like some Egyptian deity. Once it was not merely a woman with a bird's beak that I saw, but almost the bird itself. The outer garments, even to the toque of Madame de Guermont, were of fur, and since she thus left no cloth visible, she seemed naturally furred, like certain vultures, whose thick, smooth, dusky, downy plumage suggests rather the skin of a wild beast. From the midst of this natural plumage, the tiny head arched out its beak, and the two eyes on its surface were piercing keen and blue. One day I had been pacing up and down the street for hours on end, without a vestige of Madame de Guermantes, when suddenly, inside a pastry cook's shop, tucked in between two of the mansions of this aristocratic and plebeian quarter, there appeared, took shape, the vague and unfamiliar face of a fashionably dressed woman who was asking to see some little cakes. And before I had had time to make her out, there shot forth at me like a lightning flash, reaching me sooner than its accompaniment of thunder, the glance of the Duchess. Another time, having failed to meet her and hearing twelve strike, I realised that it was not worth my while to wait for her any longer. I was sorrowfully making my way homewards, and, absorbed in my own disappointment, looking absently after and not seeing a carriage that had overtaken me, I realised suddenly that the movement of her head which I saw a lady make through the carriage was meant for me, and that this lady, whose features, relaxed and pale, or it might equally be tense and vivid, composed, beneath a round hat which nestled at the foot of a towering plume, the face of a stranger whom I had supposed I did not know, was Madame de Guermont, by whom I had let myself be greeted without so much as acknowledging her bow. And sometimes I came upon her as I entered the gate, standing outside the lodge where the detestable porter, whose scrutinous eye I loathed and dreaded, was in the act of making her a profound obeisance, and also, no doubt, his daily report, for the entire staff of the Guermont household, hidden beneath the window curtains, were trembling as they watched a conversation which they were unable to overhear, but which meant, as they very well knew, that one or other of them would certainly have his day out stopped by the Duchess, to whom this Cerberus was betraying him. In view of the whole series of different faces which Madame Guermont displayed thus one after another, faces that occupied a relative and varying extent, contracted one day, vast the next, in her person and attire as a whole, my love was not attached to any one of those changeable and ever-changing elements of flesh and fabric which replaced one another as day followed day, and which she could modify, could almost entirely reconstruct without altering my disturbance, because beneath them, beneath the new colour and the strange cheek, I felt that it was still Madame de Guermont. What I loved was the invisible person who set all this outward show in motion, her whose hostility so distressed me, whose approach set me trembling, whose life I would fain have made my own and driven out of it her friends. She might flaunt a blue feather or show a fiery cheek without her actions losing their importance for me. I should not myself have felt that Madame de Guermont was tired of meeting me day after day had I not learned it indirectly by reading it on the face, stiff with coldness, 
disapproval and pity which Françoise showed me when she was helping me to get ready for these morning walks. The moment I asked her for my outdoor things, I felt a contrary wind arise in her worn and battered features. I made no attempt to win her confidence, for I knew I should not succeed. She had, for at once discovering any unpleasant thing that might have happened to my parents or myself, a power the nature of which I've never been able to fathom. Perhaps it was not supernatural, but was to be explained by sources of information that were open to her alone. As it may happen that the news which often reaches a savage tribe several days before the post has brought it to the European colony has really been transmitted to them not by telepathy, but from hilltop to hilltop by a chain of beacon fires. So, in the particular instance of my morning walks, possibly Madame de Guermont's servants had heard their mistress say how tired she was of running into me every day without fail wherever she went, and had repeated her remarks to Françoise. My parents might, it is true, have attached some servant other than Françoise to my person. Still, I should have been no better off. Françoise was, in a sense, less of a servant than the others. In her way of feeling things, of being kind and pitiful, hard and distant, superior and narrow, of combining a white skin with red hands, she was still the village maiden whose parents had had a place of their own, but, having come to grief, had been obliged to put her into service. Her presence in our household was the country air, the social life of a farm of fifty years ago, wafted to us by a sort of reversal of the normal order of travel, whereby it is the place that comes to visit the person. As the glass cases in a local museum are filled with specimens of the curious handiwork which the peasants still carve or embroider or whatever it may be in certain parts of the country, so our flat in Paris was decorated with the words of Françoise, inspired by a traditional local sentiment and governed by extremely ancient laws. And she could in Paris find her way back, as though by clues of coloured thread, to the song birds and cherry trees of her childhood, to her mother's deathbed, which she still vividly saw. But in spite of all this wealth of background, once she had come to Paris and had entered our service, she had acquired, as obviously anyone else coming there in her place would have acquired, the ideas, the system of interpretation used by the servants on the other floors. Compensating for the respect which she was obliged to show us by repeating the rude words that the cook on the fourth floor had used to her mistress, with a servile gratification so intense that, for the first time in our lives, feeling a sort of solidarity between ourselves and the detestable occupant of the fourth floor flat, we said to ourselves that possibly we too were employers after all. This alteration in Françoise's character was perhaps inevitable. Certain forms of existence are so abnormal that they are bound to produce certain characteristic faults. Such was the life led by the king at Versailles among his courtiers, a life as strange as that of a pharaoh or a doge, and far more even than his, the life of his courtiers. The life led by our servants is probably of an even more monstrous abnormality, which only its familiarity can prevent us from seeing. But it was actually in details more intimate still that I should have been obliged if I had dismissed Françoise, to keep the same servant. For various others might, in years to come, enter my service. Already furnished with the defects common to all servants, they underwent, nevertheless, a rapid transformation with me. As in the rules of tactics, an attack in one sector compels a counter-attack in another, so as not to be hurt by the asperities of my nature, all of them effected in their own an identical resilience, 
always at the same points, and, to make up for this, took advantage of the gaps in my line to thrust out advanced posts. Of these gaps I knew nothing, any more than of the salients to which they gave rise, precisely because they were gaps. But my servants, by gradually becoming spoiled, taught me of their existence. It was from the defects which they invariably acquired that I learned what were my own natural and invariable shortcomings. Their character offered me a sort of negative plate of my own. We had always laughed, my mother and I, at Madame Cesarat, who used, in speaking of her servants, expressions like the lower orders or the servant class. But I am bound to admit that what made it useless to think of replacing Françoise by anyone else was that her successor would inevitably have belonged just as much to the race of servants in general and to the class of my servants in particular. End of section 3section 4 of the Guermantes way le côté de Guermantes by Marcel Proust translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michael o'kelly saint-loup at doncier to return to françoise i never in my life experienced any humiliation without having seen beforehand on her face a store of condolences prepared and waiting. And if then, in my anger at the thought of being pitied by her, I tried to pretend that, on the contrary, I had scored a distinct success, my lies broke feebly on the wall of her respectful but obvious unbelief, and the consciousness that she enjoyed of her own infallibility. For she knew the truth. She refrained from uttering it, and made only a slight movement with her lips, as if she still had her mouth full and was finishing a tasty morsel. She refrained from uttering it, or so at least I long believed, for at that time I still supposed that it was by means of words that one communicated the truth to others. Indeed, the words that people used to me recorded their meaning so unalterably on the sensitive plate of my mind that I could no more believe it to be possible that anyone who had professed to love me did not love me than Françoise herself could have doubted when she read it in a newspaper that some clergyman or gentleman was prepared on receipt of a stamped envelope to furnish us free of charge with an infallible remedy for every known complaint or with the means of multiplying our income an hundredfold. If, on the other hand, our doctor were to prescribe for her the simplest ointment to cure a cold in the head, she, so stubborn to endure the keenest suffering, would complain bitterly of what she had been made to sniff, insisting that it tickled her nose and that life was not worth living. But she was the first person to prove to me by her example, which I was not to understand until long afterwards, when it was given me afresh and to my greater discomfort, as will be seen in the later volumes of this work, by a person who was dearer to me than Françoise, that the truth has no need to be uttered to be made apparent, and that one may perhaps gather it with more certainty, without waiting for words, without even bothering one's head about them, from a thousand outward signs, even from certain invisible phenomena, analogous in the sphere of human character to what in nature are atmospheric changes. I might perhaps have suspected this, since to myself at that time it frequently occurred that I said things in which there was no vestige of truth, while I made the real truth plain by all manner of involuntary confidences expressed by my body and in my actions, which were at once interpreted by Françoise. I ought perhaps to have suspected it, but to do so I should first have had to be conscious that I myself was occasionally untruthful and dishonest. Now, untruthfulness and dishonesty were with me, as with most people, called into being in so immediate, 
so contingent a fashion and in self-defense by some particular interest that my mind fixed on some lofty ideal allowed my character in the darkness below to set about these urgent, sordid tasks and did not look down to observe them. When Francoise in the evening was polite to me and asked my permission before sitting down in my room, it seemed as though her face became transparent and I could see the goodness and honesty that lay beneath. But Jupien, who had lapses into indiscretion, of which I learned only later, revealed to me afterwards that she had told him that I was not worth the price of a rope to hang me and that I had tried to insult her in every possible way. These words of Jupien set up at once before my eyes, in new and strange colours, the print of a picture of my relations with Françoise, so different from that on which I used to like letting my eyes rest, and in which, without the least possibility of doubt, Françoise adored me and lost no opportunity of singing my praises, that I realised that it is not only the material world that is different from the aspect in which we see it, that all reality is perhaps equally dissimilar from what we think ourselves to be directly perceiving, that the trees, the sun and the sky would not be the same as what we see if they are apprehended by creatures having eyes differently constituted from ours, or, better still, endowed for that purpose with organs other than eyes, which would furnish trees and sky and sun with equivalents, though not visual. However that might be, this sudden outlet which Jupien threw open for me upon the real world appalled me. So far it was only Françoise that was revealed, and of her I barely thought. Was it the same for all one's social relations? And in what depths of despair might this not some day plunge me if it were the same with love? That was the future's secret. For the present, only Françoise was concerned. Did she sincerely believe what she had said to Jupien? Had she said it to embroil Jupien with me, possibly so that we should not appoint Jupien's girl as her successor? At any rate, I realised the impossibility of obtaining any direct and certain knowledge of whether Françoise loved or loathed me. And thus it was she who first gave me the idea that a person does not as I had imagined, stand motionless and clear before our eyes, with his merits, his defects, his plans, his intentions with regard to ourself, exposed on his surface, like a garden at which, with all its borders spread out before us, we gaze through a railing, but is a shadow which we can never succeed in penetrating, of which there can be no such thing as direct knowledge, with respect to which we form countless beliefs based upon his words and sometimes upon his actions, though neither words nor actions can give us anything but inadequate and, as it proves, contradictory information, a shadow behind which we can alternately imagine with equal justification that there burns the flame of hatred and of love. I was genuinely in love with Madame de Guermantes, the greatest happiness that I could have asked of God would have been that he should overwhelm her under every imaginable calamity, and that, ruined, despised, stripped of all the privileges that divided her from me, having no longer any home of her own or people who would condescend to speak to her, she should come to me for refuge. I imagined her doing so. And indeed, on those evenings when some change in the atmosphere or in my own condition, brought to the surface of my consciousness some forgotten scroll on which were recorded impressions of other days. Instead of profiting by the refreshing strength that had been generated in me, instead of employing it to decipher in my own mind thoughts which, as a rule, escaped me, instead of setting myself at last to work, I preferred to relate aloud, to plan out in the third person, with a flow of invention as useless as was my declamation of it, a whole novel, crammed with adventure, in which the Duchess, fallen upon misfortune, came to implore assistance from me, 
me who had become by a converse change of circumstances rich and powerful. And when I had let myself thus for hours on end imagine the circumstances, rehearsed the sentences with which I should welcome the Duchess beneath my roof, the situation remained unaltered. I had, alas, in reality, chosen to love the very woman who, in her own person, combined perhaps the greatest possible number of different advantages, in whose eyes, accordingly, I could not hope myself ever to cut any figure. For she was as rich as the richest commoner, and noble also, without reckoning that personal charm which set her at the pinnacle of fashion, made her, among the rest, a sort of queen. I felt that I was annoying her by crossing her path in this way every morning. But even if I had had the courage to refrain for two or three days consecutively from doing so, perhaps that abstention, which would have represented so great a sacrifice on my part, Madame de Guermont would not have noticed, or would have set it down to some obstacle beyond my control. And indeed, I could not have succeeded in making myself cease to track her down, except by arranging that it should be impossible for me to do so. For the need incessantly reviving in me to meet her, to be for a moment the object of her attention, the person to whom her bow was addressed, was stronger than my fear of arousing her displeasure. I should have had to go away for some time, and for that I had not the heart. I did think of it more than once. I would then tell Françoise to pack my boxes, and immediately afterwards to unpack them. And as the spirit of imitation, the desire not to appear behind the times, alters the most natural and most positive form of oneself, Françoise, borrowing the expression from her daughter's vocabulary, used to remark that I was dippy. She did not approve of this. She said that I was always balancing, for she made use, when she was not aspiring to rival the moderns, of the language of Saint-Simon. It is true that she liked it still less when I spoke to her as master to servant. She knew that this was not natural to me, and did not suit me a condition which she rendered in words as, where there isn't a will. I should never have had the heart to leave Paris, except in a direction which would bring me closer to Madame de Guermont. This was by no means an impossibility. Should I not indeed find myself nearer to her than I was in the morning, in the street, solitary, abashed, feeling that not a single one of the thoughts which I should have liked to convey to her ever reached her, in that weary patrolling up and down of walks which might be continued day after day forever without the slightest advantage to myself if I were to go miles away from Madame de Guermont but to go to some one of her acquaintance, someone whom she knew to be particular in the choice of his friends and who would appreciate my good qualities, would be able to speak to her about me and if not obtain it from her, at least make her know what I wanted someone by means of whom, in any event, simply because I should discuss with him whether or not it would be possible for him to convey this or that message to her, I should give to my solitary and silent meditations a new form, spoken, active, which would seem an advance, almost a realisation. What she did during the mysterious daily life of the Guermont that she was, this was the constant object of my thoughts. And to break through the mystery, even by indirect means, as with a lever, by employing the services of a person to whom were not forbidden the townhouse of the Duchess, her parties, unrestricted conversation with her, would that not be a contact more distant, but at the same time more effective than my contemplation of her every morning in the street? The friendship the admiration that saint Lou felt for me seemed to me undeserved and had hitherto left me unmoved. All at once I attached a value to them. I would have liked him to disclose them to Madame de Guermont. I was quite prepared even to ask him to do so. For when we are in love, all the trifling little privileges that we enjoy 
we would like to be able to divulge to the woman we love, as people who have been disinherited and bores of other kinds do to us in everyday life. We are distressed by her ignorance of them. We seek consolation in the thought that just because they are never visible, she has perhaps added to the opinion which you already had of us this possibility of further advantages that must remain unknown. saint Lou had not for a long time been able to come to Paris. Whether, as he himself explained, on account of his military duties, or, as was more likely, on account of the trouble he was having with his mistress, with whom he had twice now been on the point of breaking off relations. He had often told me what a pleasure it would be for him if I came to visit him at that garrison town, the name of which, a couple of days after his leaving Baalbek, had caused me so much joy when I had read it on the envelope of the first letter I received from my friend. It was not so far from Baalbek as its wholly inland surroundings might have led one to believe, one of those little fortified towns, aristocratic and military, set in a broad expanse of country, over which, on fine days, there floats so often into the distance a sort of intermittent haze of sound, which, as a screen of poplars by its sinuosities, outlines the course of a river which one cannot see, indicates the movements of a regiment on parade, so that the very atmosphere of its streets, avenues and squares has been gradually tuned to a sort of perpetual vibration, musical and martial, while the most ordinary note of cartwheel or tramway is prolonged in vague trumpet calls, indefinitely repeated to the hallucinated ear by the silence. It was not too far away from Paris for me to be able, if I took the express, to return, join my mother and grandmother, and sleep in my own bed. As soon as I realised this, troubled by a painful longing, I had too little willpower to decide not to return to Paris, but rather to stay in this town, but also too little to prevent a porter from carrying my luggage to a cab and not to adopt as I walked behind him, the unburdened mind of a traveller who is looking after his luggage and for whom no grandmother is waiting anywhere at home, to get into the carriage with the complete detachment of a person who, having ceased to think of what it is that he wants, has the air of knowing what he wants, and to give the driver the address of the cavalry barracks. I thought that saint Lou might come to sleep that night at the hotel at which I should be staying, so as to make less painful for me the first shock of contact with this strange town. One of the guard went to find him, and I waited at the barrack gate, before that huge ship of stone, booming with the November wind, out of which every moment, for it was now six o'clock, men were emerging in pairs into the street, staggering as if they were coming ashore in some foreign port in which they found themselves temporarily anchored. Saint Lou appeared, moving like a whirlwind, his eyeglass spinning in the air before him. I had not given my name. I was eager to enjoy his surprise and delight. Oh, what a bore, he exclaimed, suddenly catching sight of me and blushing to the tips of his ears. I've just had a week's leave, and I shan't be off duty again for another week. And, preoccupied by the thought of my having to spend this first night alone, for he knew better than anyone my bedtime agonies, which he had often remarked and soothed at Baalbek, he broke off his lamentation to turn and look at me, coax me with little smiles, with tender though unsymmetrical glances, half of them coming directly from his eye, the other half through his eyeglass, but both parts alike an allusion to the emotion he felt on seeing me again, an allusion also to that important matter which I did not always understand, but which concerned me now vitally, our friendship. I say, where are you going to sleep? Really, I can't recommend the hotel where we mess. It is next to the exhibition ground, where there's a show just starting. You'll find it beastly crowded. 
No, you'd better go to the Hôtel de Flandre. It's a little 18th century palace with old tapestries. It makes quite an old world residence. Salou employed in every connection the word makes for has an air of because the spoken language, like the written, feels from time to time the need of these alterations in the meanings of words, these refinements of expression. And just as journalists often have not the least idea from what school of literature come the turns of speech that they borrow, so the vocabulary, the very diction of saint Lou, were formed in imitation of three different aesthetes, none of whom he knew personally, but whose way of speaking had been indirectly instilled into him. Besides, he concluded, the hotel, I mean, is more or less adapted to your supersensitiveness of hearing. You will have no neighbours. I quite see that that is a slender advantage, and as, after all, another visitor may arrive tomorrow, it would not be worth your while to choose that particular hotel with so precarious an object in view. No, it is for its appeal to the eye that I recommend it. The rooms are quite attractive. All the furniture is old and comfortable. There's something reassuring about that. But to me, less of an artist than saint Lou, the pleasure that an attractive house could give was superficial, almost non-existent, and could not calm my growing anguish, as painful as that which I used to feel long ago at Combray, when my mother did not come upstairs to say good night, or that which I felt on the evening of my arrival at Baalbek, in the room with the unnaturally high ceiling, which smelt of flowering grasses. Salou read all this in my fixed gaze. A lot you care, though, about this charming palace, my poor fellow. You're quite pale, and here I am, like a great brute, talking to you about tapestries which you won't have the heart to look at even. I know the room they have put you in. Personally, I find it most enlivening but I can quite understand that it won't have the same effect on you with your sensitive nature. You mustn't think I don't understand. I don't feel the same myself, but I can put myself in your place. At that moment, a sergeant, who was exercising a horse on the square, entirely absorbed in making the animal jump, disregarding the salutes of passing troopers, but hurling volleys of oaths as such as got in his way, turned with a smile to saint Lou and, seeing that he had a friend with him, saluted us. But his horse at once reared. saint Lou flung himself at its head, caught it by the bridle, succeeded in quieting it, and returned to my side. Yes, he resumed, I assure you that I fully understand. I feel for you as keenly as you do yourself. I am wretched, he went on, laying his hand lovingly on my shoulder when I think that if I could have stayed with you tonight, I might have been able, if we'd talked till morning, to relieve you of a little of your unhappiness. I can lend you any number of books, but you won't want to read if you're feeling like that. And I shan't be able to get anyone else to take my duty here. I've been off now twice running because my girl came down to see me. And he knitted his brows, partly with vexation, and also in the effort to decide, like a doctor, what remedy he might best apply to my disease. Run along and light the fire in my quarters, he called to a trooper who passed us. Hurry up, get a move on. After which he turned once more to me, and his eyeglass and his peering myopic gaze hinted an allusion to our great friendship. No, to see you here in these barracks where I have spent so much time thinking about you I can scarcely believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. And how are you? Better, I hope. You must tell me all about yourself presently. We'll go up to my room. We mustn't hang about too long on the square. There's a devil of a draught. I don't feel it now myself, but you aren't accustomed to it. I'm afraid of your catching cold. And what about your work? Have you started yet? No, you are a quaint fellow. If I had your talent, I'm sure I should be writing morning, noon, and night. It amuses you more to do nothing? What a pity it is that it's the useless fellows like me who are always ready to work, and the ones who could if they wanted to, won't. There, 
and have clean forgotten to ask you how your grandmother is. Her prudons are in safe keeping. I never part from them. An officer, tall, handsome, majestic, emerged with slow and solemn gait from the foot of a staircase. Saint Lou saluted him and arrested the perpetual instability of his body for the moment occupied in holding his hand against the peak of his cap. But he had flung himself into the action with so much force, straightening himself with so sharp a movement, and the salute ended, let his hand fall with so abrupt a relaxation, altering all the positions of shoulder, leg and eyeglass, that this moment was one not so much of immobility as of a throbbing tension in which were neutralised the excessive movements which he had just made and those on which he was about to embark. Meanwhile, the officer, without coming any nearer us, calm, benevolent, dignified, imperial, representing, in short, the direct opposite of saint Lou, himself also, but without haste, raised his hand to the peak of his cap. I must just say a word to the captain, whispered saint Lou. Be a good fellow, and go and wait for me in my room. It's the second on the right, on the third floor. I'll be with you in a minute. And, setting off at the double, preceded by his eyeglass, which fluttered in every direction, he made straight for the slow and stately captain, whose horse had just been brought round, and who, before preparing to mount, was giving orders, with a studied nobility of gesture, as in some historical painting, and as though he were setting forth to take part in some battle of the First Empire, whereas he was simply going to ride home to the house which he had taken for the period of his service at Doncières, and which stood in a square that was named, as though in ironical anticipation of the arrival of this Napoleonid Place de la République. I started to climb the staircase, nearly slipping on each of its nail-studded steps, catching glimpses of barrack rooms, their bare walls edged with a double line of beds and kits. I was shown saint Lou's room. I stood for a moment outside its closed door, for I could hear someone stirring. He moved something, let fall something else. I felt that the room was not empty, that there must be somebody there. But it was only the freshly lighted fire beginning to burn. It could not keep quiet. It kept shifting its faggots about, and very clumsily. I entered the room. It let one roll into the fender, and set another smoking. And even when it was not moving, like an ill-bred person, it made noises all the time, which, from the moment I saw the flames rising, revealed themselves to me as noises made by a fire, although if I had been on the other side of the wall, I should have thought that they came from someone who was blowing his nose and walking about. I sat down in the room and waited. Liberty hangings and old German stuffs of the 18th century managed to rid it of the smell that was exhaled by the rest of the building, a coarse, insipid, mouldy smell like that of stale toast. It was here in this charming room that I could have dined and slept with a calm and happy mind. saint Lou seemed almost to be present by reason of the textbooks which littered his table between his photographs, among which I could make out my own and that of the Duchesse de Guermantes by the light of the fire which had at length grown accustomed to the grate, and, like an animal crouching in an ardent, noiseless, faithful watchfulness, let fall only now and then a smouldering log which crumbled into sparks, or licked with a tongue of flame the sides of the chimney. I heard the tick of saint Lou's watch, which could not be far away. This tick changed its place every moment, for I could not see the watch. It seemed to come from behind, from in front of me, from my right, from my left, sometimes to die away as though at a great distance. Suddenly, I caught sight of the watch on the table. Then I heard the tick in a fixed place, from which it did not move again. That is to say, I thought I heard it at this place. I did not hear it there. I saw it there, for sounds have no position in space. Or rather, 
we associate them with movements, and in that way they serve the purpose of warning us of those movements, of appearing to make them necessary and natural. Certainly it happens commonly enough that a sick man, whose ears have been stopped with cotton wool, ceases to hear the noise of a fire, such as was crackling at that moment in saint Louis fireplace, labouring at the formation of brands and cinders, which it then lets fall into the fender, nor would he hear the passage of the tramway cars, whose music took its flight at regular intervals over the Grand Place of Doncières. Let the sick man then read a book, and the pages will turn silently before him, as though they were moved by the fingers of a god. The dull thunder of a bath, which is being filled, becomes thin, faint, and distant as the twitterings of the birds in the sky. The withdrawal of its sound, its dilution, take from it all its power to hurt us. Driven mad a moment ago by hammer blows, which seemed to be shattering the ceiling above our head, it is with a quiet delight that we now gather in their sounds, light, caressing, distant, like the murmur of leaves playing by the roadside with the passing breeze. We play games of patience with cards which we do not hear, until we imagine that we have not touched them, that they are moving of their own accord, and, anticipating our desire to play with them, have begun to play with us. And in this connection, we may ask ourselves whether, in the case of love, to which, indeed, we may add the love of life and the love of fame, since there are, it appears, persons who are acquainted with these latter sentiments, we ought not to act like those who, when a noise disturbs them, instead of praying that it may cease, stop their ears, and with them for our pattern, bring to our attention our defensive strength to bear on ourselves, give ourselves as an objective to capture not the other person with whom we are in love, but our capacity for suffering at that person's hands. To return to the problem of sounds, we have only to thicken the wads which close the aural passages, and they can find to a pianissimo the girl who has just been playing a boisterous tune overhead. If we go further and steep the wad in Greece, at once the whole household must obey its despotic rule. Its laws extend even beyond our portals. Pianissimo is not enough. The wand instantly orders the piano to be shut, and the music lesson is abruptly ended. The gentleman who is walking up and down in the room above breaks off in the middle of his beat. The movement of carriages and tramways is interrupted as though a sovereign was expected to pass. And indeed this attenuation of sounds sometimes disturbs our slumbers instead of guarding them. Only yesterday the incessant noise in our ears, by describing to us in a continuous narrative all that was happening in the street and in the house, succeeded at length in making us sleep like a boring book. Tonight, through the sheet of silence that is spread over our sleep, a shock louder than the rest manages to make itself heard, gentle as a sigh, unrelated to any other sound, mysterious, and the call for an explanation which it emits is sufficient to awaken us. Take away for a moment from the sick man the cotton wool that has been stopping his ears, and in a flash the full daylight, the sun of sound, dawns afresh, dazzling him, is born again in his universe. In all haste, returns the multitude of exiled sounds. We are present as though it were the chanting of choirs of angels at the resurrection of the voice. The empty streets are filled for a moment with the whir of the swift, consecutive wings of the singing tramway cars. In the bedroom itself, the sick man has created, not like Prometheus, fire, but the sound of fire. And when we increase or reduce the wads of cotton wool, it is as though we were pressing alternately one and the other of the two pedals with which we have extended the resonant compass of the outer world. Only there are also suppressions of sound which are not temporary. The man who has grown completely deaf cannot even heat a pan of milk by his bedside, 
but he must keep an eye open to watch on the tilted lid for the white arctic reflection like that of a coming snowstorm which is the warning sign which he is wise to obey by cutting off as our lord bade the waves be still the electric current for already the swelling jerkily climbing egg of boiling milk film is reaching its climax in a series of sidelong movements has filled and set bellying the drooping sails with which the cream has skimmed its surface sends in a sudden storm a scud of pearly substance flying overboard sails which the cutting off of the current if the electric storm is hushed in time will fold back upon themselves and let fall with the ebbing tide changed now to magnolia petals but if the sick man should not be quick enough in taking the necessary precautions presently when his drowned books and watch are seen barely emerging from the milky tide he will be obliged to call the old nurse who though he be himself an eminent statesman or a famous writer will tell him that he has no more sense than a child of five at other times in the magic chamber between us and the closed door a person who was not there a moment ago makes his appearance it is a visitor whom we did not hear coming in and who merely gesticulates like a figure in one of those little puppet theatres so restful for those who have taken a dislike to the spoken tongue and for this totally deaf man since the loss of a sense adds as much beauty to the world as its acquisition it is with ecstasy that he walks now upon an earth grown almost an eden in which sound has not yet been created the highest waterfalls unfold for his eyes alone their ribbons of crystal stiller than the glassy sea like the cascades of paradise as sound was for him before his deafness the perceptible form in which the cause of a movement was draped objects moved without sound seemed to be being moved also without cause deprived of all resonant quality they show a spontaneous activity seem to be alive they move halt become a light of their own accord of their own accord they vanish in the air like the winged monsters of prehistoric days in the solitary and unneighboured home of the deaf man the service which before his infirmity was complete was already showing an increased discretion was being carried on in silence is now assured him with a sort of surreptitious deafness by mutes as at the court of a fairy tale king and as upon the stage the building on which the deaf man looks from his window be it barracks church or town hall is only so much scenery if one day it should fall to the ground it may emit a cloud of dust and leave visible ruins but less material even than a palace on the stage though it has not the same exiguity it will subside in the magic universe without letting the fall of its heavy blocks of stone tarnish with anything so vulgar as sound the chastity of the prevailing silence the silence though only relative which reigned in the little barrack room where i sat waiting was now broken the door opened and saint lou dropping his eyeglass dashed in ah my dear robert you make yourself very comfortable here i said to him how jolly it would be if one were allowed to dine and sleep here and to be sure had it not been against the regulations what repose untinged by sadness i could have tasted there guarded by that atmosphere of tranquillity vigilance and gaiety which was maintained by a thousand wills controlled and free from care a thousand heedless spirits in that great community called a barracks where time having taken the form of action the sad bell that tolled the hours outside was replaced by the same joyous clarion of those martial calls the ringing memory of which was kept perpetually alive in the paved streets of the town like the dust that floats in a sunbeam a voice sure of being heard and musical because it was the command not only of authority to obedience but of wisdom to happiness so you'd rather stay with me and sleep here would you than go to the hotel by yourself saint lou asked me smiling 
Oh, Robert, it is cruel of you to be sarcastic about it, I pleaded. You know it's not possible, and you know how wretched I shall be over there. Good, you flatter me, he replied. It occurred to me just now that you would rather stay here tonight, and that is precisely what I stopped to ask the captain. And he has given you leave, I cried. He hasn't the slightest objection. Oh, I adore him. No, that would be going too far. But now, let me just get hold of my Batman and tell him to see about our dinner, he went on, while I turned away so as to hide my tears. We were several times interrupted by one or other of saint Lou's friends coming in. He drove them all out again. Get out of here, buzz off! I begged him to let them stay. No, really, they would bore you stiff. They are absolutely uncultured. All they can talk about is racing or stables shop. Besides, I don't want them here either. They would spoil these precious moments I've been looking forward to. But you mustn't think, when I tell you that these fellows are brainless, that everything military is devoid of intellectuality. Far from it. We have a major here who's a splendid chap. He's given us a course in which military history is treated like a demonstration, like a problem in algebra. Even from the aesthetic point of view, there is a curious beauty alternately inductive and deductive about it, which you couldn't fail to appreciate. That's not the officer who's given me leave to stay here tonight. No, thank God. The man you adore for so very trifling a service is the biggest fool that ever walked the face of the earth. He is perfect at looking after messing and at kit inspections. He spends hours with the sergeant major and the master tailor. There you have his mentality. Apart from that, he has a vast contempt, like everyone here, for the excellent major I was telling you about. No one will speak to him, because he's a Freemason and doesn't go to confession. The Prince de Borodino would never have an outsider like that in his house, which is pretty fair cheek, when all said and done, from a man whose great-grandfather was a small farmer, and who would probably be a small farmer himself if it hadn't been for the Napoleonic Wars. Not that he hasn't a lurking sense of his own rather ambiguous position in society, where he's neither flesh nor fowl. He hardly ever shows his face at the jockey. It makes him feel so juiced awkward, this so-called prince, added Robert, who, having been led by the same spirit of imitation to adopt the social theories of his teachers and the worldly prejudices of his relatives, had unconsciously wedded the democratic love of humanity to a contempt for the nobility of the empire. I was looking at the photograph of his aunt, and the thought that, since saint Lou had this photograph in his possession, he might perhaps give it to me, made me feel all the fonder of him, and hoped to do him a thousand services, which seemed to me a very small exchange for it. For this photograph was like one encounter more, added to all those that I had already had, with Madame de Guermont. Better still, a prolonged encounter, as if by some sudden stride forward in our relations, she had stopped beside me in a garden hat, and had allowed me for the first time to gaze at my leisure at that plump cheek, that arched neck, that tapering eyebrow, veiled from me hitherto by the swiftness of her passage, the bewilderment of my impressions, the imperfection of memory, and the contemplation of them as well as of the bare bosom and arms of the woman whom I had never seen save in a high-necked and long-sleeved bodice, was to me a voluptuous discovery, a priceless favour. Those lines which had seemed to me almost a forbidden spectacle, I could study there, as in a textbook of the only geometry that had any value for me. Later on, when I looked at Robert, I noticed that he too was a little like the photograph of his aunt, and by a mysterious process which I found almost as moving, since, if his face had not been directly created by hers, the two had, nevertheless, a common origin. The features of the Duchesse de Guermont, which were pinned to my vision of Combray, the nose like a falcon's beak, the piercing eyes, seemed to have served also as a pattern for the cutting out in another copy, analogous and slender, with too delicate a skin, of Robert's face, 
which might almost be superimposed upon his aunt's. I saw in him, with a keen longing, those features characteristic of the Germont, of that race which had remained so individual in the midst of a world with which it was not confounded, in which it remained isolated in the glory of an ornithomorphic divinity, for it seemed to have been the issue, in the age of mythology, of the union of a goddess with a bird. Robert, without being aware of its cause, was touched by my evident affection. This was, moreover, increased by the sense of comfort inspired in me by the heat of the fire and by the champagne which bedewed at the same time my brow with beads of sweat and my cheeks with tears. It washed down the partridges. I ate mine with the dumb wonder of a profane mortal of any sort when he finds in a form of life with which he is not familiar what he has supposed that form of life to exclude. The wonder, for instance, of an atheist who sits down to an exquisitely cooked dinner in a presbytery. And next morning, when I awoke, I rose and went to cast from St. Lou's window, which, being at a great height, overlooked the whole countryside, a curious scrutiny to make the acquaintance of my new neighbour, the landscape which I had not been able to distinguish the day before, having arrived too late, at an hour when it was already sleeping, beneath the outspread cloak of night. And yet, early as it had awoken from its sleep, I could see the ground, when I opened the window and looked out, only as one sees it from the window of a country house, overlooking the lake, shrouded still in its soft white morning gown of mist, which scarcely allowed me to make out anything at all. But I knew that, before the troopers who were busy with their horses in the square had finished grooming them, it would have cast its gown aside. In the meantime, I could see only a meagre hill rearing close up against the side of the barracks, a back already swept clear of darkness, rough and wrinkled. Through the transparent curtain of frost, I could not take my eyes from this stranger who, too, was looking at me for the first time. But when I had formed the habit of coming to the barracks, my consciousness that the hill was there, more real, consequently, even when I did not see it, than the hotel at Baalbec, than our house in Paris, of which I thought of as absent or dead friends, that is to say, without any strong belief in their existence, brought it about that, even although I was not aware of it myself, its reflected shape outlined itself on the slightest impressions that I formed at Doncières, and among them, to begin with, this first morning, on the pleasing impression of warmth given me by the cup of chocolate prepared by saint Louis Batman in this comfortable room, which had the effect of being an optical centre from which to look out at the hill. The idea of there being anything else to do but just gaze at it, the idea of actually climbing it, being rendered impossible by this same mist. Imbibing the shape of the hill, associated with the taste of hot chocolate and with the whole web of my fancies at that particular time, this mist, without my having thought at all about it, succeeded in moistening all my subsequent thoughts about that period, just as a massive and unmelting lump of gold had remained allied to my impressions of Baalbek, or as the proximity of outside stairs of blackish sandstone gave a grey background to my impressions of Combray. It did not, however, persist late into the day. The sun began by hurling at it in vain a few darts, which sprinkled it with brilliance before they finally overcame it. The hill might expose its grizzled rump to the sun's rays, which, an hour later, when I went down to the town, gave to the russet tints of the autumn leaves to the red and blues of the election posters pasted on the walls, an exaltation which raised my spirits also and made me stamp, singing as I went on the pavements from which I could hardly keep myself from jumping in the air for joy. But after that first night I had to sleep at the hotel, and I knew beforehand that I was doomed to find sorrow there. It was like an unbreathable aroma 
which all my life long had been exhaled for me by every new bedroom, that is to say, by every bedroom. In the one which I usually occupied, I was not present. My mind remained elsewhere, and in its place sent only the sense of familiarity. But I could not employ this servant, less sensitive than myself, to look after things for me in the new place, where I preceded him, where I arrived by myself, where I must bring into contact with its environment that self which I rediscovered only at year-long intervals, but always the same, having not grown at all since Combray, since my first arrival at Baalbec, weeping, without any possibility of consolation, on the edge of an unpacked trunk. As it happened, I was mistaken. I had no time to be sad, for I was not left alone for an instant. The fact of the matter was that there remained of the old palace a superfluous refinement of structure and decoration, out of place in a modern hotel, which, released from the service of any practical purpose, had in its long spell of leisure acquired a sort of life. Passages winding about in all directions, which one was continually crossing in their aimless wanderings, lobbies as long as corridors and as ornate as drawing rooms, which had the air rather of being dwellers there themselves than of forming part of a dwelling, which could not be induced to enter and settle down in any of the rooms, but wandered about outside mine and came up at once to offer me their company. Neighbours of a sort, idle but never noisy, Menial ghosts of the past, who had been granted the privilege of staying, provided they kept quiet, by the doors of the rooms which were let to visitors, and who, every time that I came across them, greeted me with a silent deference. In short, the idea of a lodging, of simply a case for our existence from day to day, which shields us only from the cold and from being overlooked by other people, was absolutely inapplicable to this house, an assembly of rooms as real as a colony of people, living, it was true, in silence, but things which one was obliged to meet, to avoid, to appreciate, as one came in. One tried not to disturb them, and one could not look without respect at a great drawing-room which had formed, far back in the 18th century, the habit of stretching itself at its ease among its hangings of old gold and beneath the cloud of its painted ceiling. And one was seized with a more personal curiosity as to the smaller rooms which, without any regard for symmetry, ran all round it, innumerable, startled, fleeing in disorder as far as the garden to which they had so easy an access down three broken steps. If I wished to go out or come in without taking the lift or being seen from the main staircase, a smaller private staircase, no longer in use, offered me its steps so skilfully arranged, one close above the other, that there seemed to exist in their gradation a perfect proportion of the same kind as those which, in colours, scents, savours, often arouse in us a peculiar sensuous pleasure. But the pleasure to be found in going up and down stairs I had had to come here to learn, as once before to a health resort in the Alps to find that the act, as a rule not noticed, of drawing breath could be a perpetual delight. I received that dispensation from effort which is granted to us only by the things to which long use has accustomed us when I set my feet for the first time on those steps familiar before I ever knew them, as if they possessed, deposited on them, perhaps embodied in them by the masters of long ago, whom they used to welcome every day, the prospective charm of habits which I had not yet contracted, and which indeed could only grow weaker once they had become my own. I looked into a room. The double doors closed themselves behind me. The hangings let in a silence in which I felt myself invested with a sort of exhilarating royalty, a marble mantelpiece with ornaments of wrought brass, 
of which one would have been wrong to think that its sole idea was to represent the art of the directory, offered me a fire, and a little easy chair on short legs helped me to warm myself as comfortably as if I had been sitting on the hearth rug. The walls held the room in a close embrace, separating it from the rest of the world, and, to let in, to enclose what made it complete, parted to make way for the bookcase, reserved a place for the bed, on either side of which a column airily upheld the raised ceiling of the alcove. And the room was prolonged in depth by two closets as large as itself, the latter of which had hanging from its wall to scent the occasion on which one had recourse to it, a voluptuary rosary of orris roots. The doors, if I left them open when I withdrew into this innermost retreat, were not content with tripling its dimensions without its ceasing to be well proportioned, and not only allowed my eyes to enjoy the delights of extension after those of concentration, but added further to the pleasure of my solitude, which, while still inviolable, was no longer shut in, the sense of liberty. This closet looked out upon a courtyard, a fair, solitary stranger, whom I was glad to have for a neighbour when next morning my eyes fell on her, a captive between her high walls, in which no other window opened, with nothing but two yellowing trees, which were enough to give a pinkish softness to the pure sky above. End of section 4section 5 of the garmont way le côté de garmont by marcel proust translated by charles kenneth scott moncrief this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michael o'kelly saint loup at dancier before going to bed i decided to leave the room in order to explore the whole of my fairy kingdom i walked down a long gallery which did me homage successively with all that it had to offer me if I could not sleep, an armchair placed waiting in a corner, a spinet on a table against the wall, a bowl of blue crockery filled with cinerarias, and in an old frame the phantom of a lady of long ago whose powdered hair was starred with blue flowers, holding in her hand a bunch of carnations. When I came to the end, the bare wall, in which no door opened, said to me simply, Now you must turn and go back, but you see, you are at home here. The house is yours. While the soft carpet, not to be left out, added that if I did not sleep that night, I could easily come in barefoot, and the unshuttered windows, looking out over the open country, assured me that they would hold a sleepless vigil, and that... Whatever hour I chose to come in, I need not be afraid of disturbing anyone. And beside a hanging curtain, I surprised only a little closet, which, stopped by the wall and unable to escape any farther, had hidden itself there with a guilty conscience, and gave me a frightened stare from its little round window, glowing blue in the moonlight. I went to bed, but the presence of the eiderdown quilt, of the pillars, of the neat fireplace, by straining my attention to a pitch beyond that of Paris, prevented me from letting myself go upon my habitual train of fancies. And as it is this particular state of strained attention that enfolds our slumbers, acts upon them, modifies them, brings them into line with this or that series of past impressions, the images that filled my dreams that first night were borrowed from a memory entirely distinct from that on which I was in the habit of drawing. If I had been tempted while asleep to let myself be swept back upon my ordinary current of remembrance, the bed to which I was not accustomed, the comfortable attention which I was obliged to pay to the position of my various limbs when I turned over, were sufficient to correct my error, to disentangle and to keep running the new thread of my dreams. It is the same with sleep as with our perception of the external world. 
It needs only a modification in our habits to make it poetic. It is enough that while undressing we should have dozed off unconsciously upon the bed for the dimensions of our dream world to be altered and its beauty felt. We awake, look at our watch, see four o'clock. It is only four o'clock in the morning, but we imagine that the whole day has gone by. So vividly does this nap of a few minutes, unsought by us, appear to have come down to us from the skies by virtue of some divine right, full-bodied, vast, like an emperor's orb of gold. In the morning, while worrying over the thought that my grandfather was ready, was waiting for me to start on our walk along the Mezeglise Way, I was awakened by the blare of a regimental band, which passed every day beneath my windows. But on several occasions, and I mention these because one cannot properly describe human life unless one shows it soaked in the sleep in which it plunges, which, night after night, sweeps round it as a promontory is encircled by the sea, the intervening layer of sleep was strong enough to bear the shock of the music, and I heard nothing. On the other mornings it gave way for a moment, but, still velvety with the refreshment of having slept, my consciousness, like those organs by which, after a local anaesthetic, a cauterization not perceived at first, is felt only at the very end, and then as a faint burning smart, was touched only gently by the shrill points of the fifes which caressed it with a vague, cool, matutinal warbling. And after this brief interruption, in which the silence had turned to music, it relapsed into my slumber before even the dragoons had finished passing, depriving me of the latest opening buds of the sparkling, clangorous nosegay. And the zone of my consciousness, which its springing stems had brushed, was so narrow, so circumscribed with sleep, that later on, when saint Lou asked me whether I had heard the band, I was no longer certain that the sound of its brasses had not been as imaginary as that which I had heard during the day echo after the slightest noise from the paved streets of the town. Perhaps I had heard it only in a dream, prompted by my fear of being awakened, or else of not being awakened, and so not seeing the regiment march past. For often, when I was still asleep, at the moment when, on the contrary, I had supposed that the noise would awaken me, for the next hour I imagined I was awake, while still drowsing, and I enacted to myself with tenuous shadow shapes on the screen of my slumber the various scenes of which it deprived me, but at which I had the illusion of looking on. What one has meant to do during the day, as it turns out, sleep intervening, one accomplishes only in one's dreams. That is to say, after it has been distorted by sleep into a following another line than one would have chosen when awake. The same story branches off and has a different ending. When all is said, the world in which we live when we are asleep is so different that people who have difficulty in going to sleep seek, first of all, to escape from the waking world. After having desperately for hours on end, with shut eyes, revolved in their minds thoughts similar to those which they would have had with their eyes open, they take heart again on noticing that the last minute has been crawling under the weight of an argument in formal contradiction of the laws of thought, and their realisation of this, and the brief absence to which it points, indicate that the door is now open through which they will perhaps be able presently to escape from the perception of the real, to advance to a resting place more or less remote on the other side, which will mean their having a more or less good night. But already a great stride has been made when we turn our back on the real, when we reach the cave in which auto-suggestions prepare, like witches, the hell-broth of imaginary maladies or of the recurrence of nervous disorders, and watch for the hour 
that which the storm that has been gathering during our unconscious sleep will break with sufficient force to make sleep cease. Not far thence is the secret garden in which grow, like strange flowers, the kinds of sleep so different from one another, the sleep induced by datura, by the multiple extracts of ether, the sleep of belladonna, of opium, of valerian, flowers whose petals remain shut until the day when the predestined visitor shall come and, touching them, bid them open, and for long hours inhale the aroma of their peculiar dreams into a marvelling and bewildered being. At the end of the garden stands the convent with open windows through which we hear voices repeating the lessons learned before we went to sleep, which we shall know only at the moment of awakening, while a presage of that moment sounds the resonant tick of that inward alarum which our preoccupation has so effectively regulated that when our housekeeper comes in with the warning, it's seven o'clock, she will find us awake and ready. On the dim walls of that chamber which opens upon our dreams, within which toils without ceasing that oblivion of the sorrows of love, whose task, interrupted and brought to naught at times by a nightmare big with reminiscence, is ever speedily resumed, hang, even after we are awake, the memories of our dreams, but so overshadowed that often we catch sight of them for the first time only in the broad light of the afternoon, when the ray of a similar idea happens by chance to strike them. Some of them brilliant and harmonious while we slept, but already so distorted that, having failed to recognise them, we can but hasten to lay them in the earth like dead bodies, too quickly decomposed, or relics so seriously damaged, so nearly crumbling into dust, that the most skilful restorer could not bring them back to their true form, or make anything of them. Near the gate is the quarry, to which our heavier slumbers repair, in search of substances which coat the brain with so unbreakable a glaze that, to awaken the sleeper, his own will is obliged, even on a golden morning, to smite him with mighty blows, like a young Siegfried. Beyond this again are the nightmares, of which the doctors foolishly assert that they tire us more than does insomnia, whereas, on the contrary, they enable the thinker to escape from the strain of thought. Those nightmares, with their fantastic picture books, in which our relatives who are dead are shown meeting with a serious accident, which at the same time does not preclude their speedy recovery. Until then, we keep them in a little rat cage, in which they are smaller than white mice, and covered with big red spots, out of each of which a feather sprouts, engage us in Ciceronian dialogues. Next to this picture book is the revolving disc of awakening, by virtue of which we submit for a moment to the tedium of having to return at once to a house which was pulled down fifty years ago, the memory of which is gradually effaced as sleep grows more distant by a number of others, until we arrive at that memory which the disc presents only when it has ceased to revolve, and which coincides with what we shall see with opened eyes. Sometimes I had heard nothing, being in one of those slumbers into which we fall as into a pit from which we are heartily glad to be drawn up a little later, heavy, overfed, digesting all that has been brought to us, as by the nymphs who fed the infant Hercules, by those agile vegetative powers whose activity is doubled while we sleep. That kind of sleep is called sleeping like lead, and it seems as though one has become oneself and remains for a few minutes after such a sleep is ended simply a leaden image. One is no longer a person. How then, seeking for one's mind, one's personality, as one seeks for a thing that is lost, does one recover one's own self rather than any other? 
why, when one begins again to think, is it not another personality than yesterday's that is incarnate in one? One fails to see what can dictate the choice, or why, among the millions of human beings, any one of whom one might be, it is on him who one was overnight that one unerringly lays one's hand. What is it that guides us when there has been an actual interruption, whether it be that our unconsciousness has been complete or our dreams entirely different from ourselves? There has indeed been death, as when the heart has ceased to beat and a rhythmical friction of the tongue revives us. No doubt the room, even if we have seen it only once before, awakens memories to which other older memories cling. Or were some memories also asleep in us, of which we now become conscious? The resurrection at our awakening, after that healing attack of mental alienation which is sleep, must, after all, be similar to what occurs when we recapture a name, a line, a refrain that we have forgotten. And perhaps the resurrection of the soul after death is to be conceived of as a phenomenon of memory. When I had finished sleeping, tempted by the sunlit day, but discouraged by the chill of those last autumn mornings, so luminous and so cold, in which winter begins, to get up and look at the trees, on which the leaves were indicated now only by a few strokes, golden or rosy, which seemed to have been left in the air on an invisible web, I raised my head from the pillow and stretched my neck, keeping my body still hidden beneath the bedclothes. Like a chrysalis in the process of change, I was a dual creature, with the different parts of which a single environment did not agree. For my eyes, colour was sufficient, without warmth. My chest, on the other hand, was anxious for warmth and not for colour. I rose only after my fire had been lighted and studied the picture, so delicate and transparent, of the pink and golden morning, to which I had now added by artificial means the element of warmth that it lacked, poking my fire, which burned and smoked like a good pipe, and gave me, as a pipe would have given me, a pleasure at once coarse, because it was based upon a material comfort, and delicate, because beyond it was printed a pure vision. The walls of my dressing room were covered with a paper on which a violent red background was patterned with black and white flowers, to which it seemed that I should have some difficulty in growing accustomed. But they succeeded only in striking me as novel, in forcing me to enter not into conflict, but into contact with them, in modulating the gaiety, the songs of my morning toilet, they succeeded only in imprisoning me in the heart of a sort of poppy, out of which to look at a world which I saw quite differently from in Paris, from the gay screen which was this new dwelling place, of a different aspect from the house of my parents, and into which flowed a purer air. On certain days I was agitated by the desire to see my grandmother again, or by the fear that she might be ill, or else it was the memory of some undertaking which I had left half finished in Paris, and which seemed to have made no progress. Sometimes again it was some difficulty in which, even here, I had managed to become involved. One or other of these anxieties had kept me from sleeping, and I was without strength to face my sorrow which in a moment grew to fill the whole of my existence. Then, from the hotel, I sent a messenger to the barracks with a line to saint Lou. I told him that, should it be materially possible, I knew that it was extremely difficult for him, I should be most grateful if he would look in for a moment. An hour later he arrived, and on hearing his ring at the door, I felt myself liberated from my obsessions. I knew that, if they were stronger than I, he was stronger than they, and my attention was diverted from them and concentrated on him who would have to settle them. He came into the room, 
and already he had enveloped me in the gust of fresh air in which, from before dawn, he had been displaying so much activity, a vital atmosphere very different from that of my room, to which I had once adapted myself by appropriate reactions. I hope you weren't angry with me for bothering you. There is something that is worrying me, as you probably guessed. Not at all. I just supposed you wanted to see me, and I thought it very nice of you. I was delighted that you should have sent for me. But what is the trouble? Things aren't going well? What can I do to help? He listened to my explanations and gave careful answers. But before he had uttered a word, he had transformed me to his own likeness. Compared with the important occupations which kept him so busy, so alert, so happy, the worries which, a moment ago, I had been unable to endure for another instant, seemed to me, as to him, negligible. It was like a man who, not having been able to open his eyes for some days, sends for a doctor who neatly and gently raises his eyelid, removes from beneath it, and shows him a grain of sand. The sufferer is healed and comforted. All my cares resolved themselves into a telegram, which saint Lou undertook to dispatch. Life seemed to me so different, so delightful. I was flooded with such a surfeit of strength that I longed for action. What are you doing now? I asked him. I must leave you, I'm afraid. We're going on a route march in three quarters of an hour, and I have to be on parade. Then it's been a great bother to you coming here. No, no bother at all. The captain was very good about it. He told me that if it was for you, I must go at once. But you understand, I don't like to seem to be abusing the privilege. But if I got up and dressed quickly and went by myself to the place where you'll be training, it would interest me immensely, and I could perhaps talk to you during the breaks. I shouldn't advise you to do that. You've been lying awake, racking your brains over a thing which I assure you is not of the slightest importance, but now that it has ceased to worry you, lay your head down on the pillow and go to sleep, which you will find an excellent antidote to the demineralization of your nerve cells. Only you mustn't sleep too long, because our band boys will be coming along under your windows. But as soon as they have passed, I think you'll be left in peace, and we shall meet again this evening at dinner. But soon I was constantly going to see the regiment being trained in field operations, when I began to take an interest in the military theories which saint Lou's friends used to expound over the dinner table and when it had become the chief desire of my life to see at close quarters their various leaders, just as a person who makes music his principal study and spends his life in the concert halls finds pleasure in frequenting the cafes in which one mingles with the life of the members of the orchestra. To reach the training ground, I used to have to take tremendously long walks. In the evenings after dinner, the longing for sleep made my head drop every now and then, as in a swoon. Next morning, I realised that I had no more heard the band than at Baalbec, after the evenings on which saint Lou had taken me to dinner at Riva Bell, I used to hear the concert on the beach. At the moment when I wished to rise, I had a delicious feeling of incapacity. I felt myself fastened to a deep, invisible ground by the articulations of which my tiredness made me conscious, of muscular and nutritious roots. I felt myself full of strength. Life seemed to extend more amply before me. This was because I had reverted to the good tiredness of my childhood at Combray on the mornings following the days on which we had taken the Guermont walk. Poets make out that we recapture for a moment the self that we were long ago, when we enter some house or garden in which we used to live in our youth. But these are most hazardous pilgrimages, which end as often in disappointment as in success. The fixed places, contemporary with different years, it is in ourselves that we should rather seek to find them. This is where the advantage comes in, to a certain extent, of great exhaustion, 
followed by a good night's rest. Good nights to make us descend into the most subterranean galleries of sleep, where no reflection from overnight, no gleam of memory, comes to lighten the inward monologue, if so be that it cease not also, turn so effectively the soil and break through the surface stone of our body that we discover there where our muscles dive down and throw out their twisted roots and breathe the air of the new life, the garden in which as a child we used to play. There is no need to travel in order to see it again. We must dig down inwardly to discover it. What once covered the earth is no longer upon it, but beneath. A mere excursion does not suffice for a visit to the dead city. Excavation is necessary also. But we shall see how certain impressions, fugitive and fortuitous, carry us back even more effectively to the past, with a more delicate precision, with a flight more light-winged, more immaterial, more headlong, more unerring, more immortal than these organic dislocations. Sometimes my exhaustion was greater still. I had, without any opportunity of going to bed, been following the operations for several days on end. How blessed then was my return to the hotel. As I got into bed, I seemed to have escaped at last from the hands of enchanters, sorcerers like those who people the romances, beloved of our forebears in the 17th century. My sleep that night and the lazy morning that followed it were no more than a charming fairy tale. Charming, beneficent perhaps also. I reminded myself that the keenest sufferings have their place of sanctuary, that one can always, when all else fails, find repose. These thoughts carried me far. On days when, although there was no parade, saint Lou had to stay in barracks, I used often to go and visit him there. It was a long way. I had to leave the town and cross the viaduct, from either side of which I had an immense view. A strong breeze blew, almost always, over this high ground, and filled all the buildings erected on three sides of the barrack square, which howled incessantly like a cave of the winds. While I waited for Robert, he being engaged on some duty or other, outside the door of his room or in the mess, talking to some of his friends to whom he had introduced me, and whom later on I came now and then to see, even when he was not to be there, looking down from the window three hundred feet to the country below, bare now except where recently sown fields, often still soaked with rain and glittering in the sun, showed a few stripes of green, of the brilliance and translucent limpidity of enamel, I could hear him discussed by the others, and I soon learnt what a popular favourite he was. Among many of the volunteers, belonging to other squadrons, sons of rich business or professional men who looked at the higher aristocratic society only from outside and without penetrating its enclosure, the attraction which they naturally felt towards what they knew of saint Lou's character was reinforced by the distinction that attached in their eyes to the young man whom, on Saturday mornings, when they went on pass to Paris, they had seen supping in the Café de la Paix with the Duc de Zay and the Prince d'Orléans. On that account, into his handsome face, his casual way of walking and saluting officers, the perpetual dance of his eyeglass, the affectation shown in the cut of his service dress, the caps always too high, the breeches of too fine a cloth and too pink a shade, they had introduced the idea of a tone, which they were positive was lacking in the best turned out officers in the regiment, even the majestic captain to whom I had been indebted for the privilege of sleeping in barracks, who seemed in comparison too pompous and almost common. One of them said that the captain had brought a new horse. He can buy as many horses as he likes. I passed Saint-Loup on Sunday morning in the Allée des Acacias. 
Now he's got some style on a horse, replied his companion, and knew what he was talking about, for these young fellows belonged to a class which, if it does not frequent the same houses and know the same people, yet, thanks to money and leisure, does not differ from the nobility in its experience of all those refinements of life which money can procure. At any rate, their refinement had, in the matter of clothes, for instance, something about it more studied, more impeccable than the free and easy negligence which had so delighted my grandmother in saint Lou. It gave quite a thrill to these sons of big stockbrokers or bankers as they sat eating oysters after the theatre to see at an adjoining table Sergeant saint Lou, what a tale there was to tell in barracks on Monday night after a weekend leave by one of them who was in Robert's squadron and to whom he had said, how do you do, most civilly, while another, who was not in the same squadron, was quite positive that, in spite of this, saint Lou had recognised him, for two or three times he had put up his eyeglass and stared in the speaker's direction. Yes, my brother saw him at the pay, said another, who had been spending the day with his mistress. My brother says his dress coat was cut too loose and didn't fit him. What was the waistcoat like? He wasn't wearing a white waistcoat. It was purple, with sort of palms on it. Stunning. To the old soldiers, sons of the soil who had never heard of the jockey club and simply put saint Lou in the category of ultra-rich non-commissioned officers, in which they included all those who, whether bankrupt or not, lived in a certain style, whose income or debts ran into several figures and who were generous towards their men, the gate, the eyeglass, the breeches, the caps of saint Lou, even if they saw in them nothing particularly aristocratic, furnished nevertheless just as much interest and meaning. They recognised in these peculiarities the character, the style, which they had assigned once and for all time to this most popular of the stripes in the regiment. Manners like no one's else, scornful indifference to what his superior officers might think, which seemed to them the natural corollary of his goodness to his subordinates. The morning cup of coffee in the canteen, the afternoon lay down in the barrack room, seemed pleasanter somehow when some old soldier fed the hungering lazy section with some savoury titbit as to the cap in which saint Lou had appeared on parade. It was the height of my pack. Come off it, old chap. You don't expect us to believe that. It couldn't have been the height of your pack, interrupted a young college graduate, who hoped by using these slang terms not to appear a learned beggar, and by venturing on this contradiction to obtain confirmation of the fact, the thought of which enchanted him. Oh, so it wasn't the height of my pack, wasn't it? You measured it, I suppose. I tell you this much, the CO glared at it, as if he'd have liked to put him in clink. But you needn't think the great saint Lou fell squashed. No, he went and came, and down with his head, and up with his head, and that blinking glass screwed in his eye all the time. We'll see what the capstan has to say when he hears. Oh, very likely he'll say nothing, but you may be sure he won't be pleased. But there's nothing so wonderful about that cap. I hear he's got thirty of them, and more at home at his house in town. Where did you hear that, old chap? From our blasted corporal dog? asked the young graduate, pedantically displaying the new forms of speech which he had only recently acquired and with which he took a great pride in garnishing his conversation. Where did I hear it? From his Batman. What do you think? Ah, now you're talking. That's a chap who knows when he's well off. I should say so. He's got more in his pocket than I have, certain sure. And besides... He gives them all his own things and everything. He wasn't getting his grub properly, he said. Along comes de saint Lou and gives Cookie hell. I want him to be properly fed, you hear, he says, and I don't care what it costs. The old soldier made up for the triviality of the words quoted by the emphasis of his tone in a feeble imitation of the speaker, which had an immense success. On leaving the barracks, I would take a stroll to fill up the time before I went, as I did every evening, 
to dine with Saint Lou at the hotel in which he and his friends had established their mess, I made for my own as soon as the sun had set, so as to have a couple of hours in which to rest and read. In the square, the evening light bedecked the pepper pot turrets of the castle with little pink clouds which matched the colour of the bricks and completed the harmony by softening the tone of the latter where it bathed them. So strong a current of vitality coursed through my nerves that no amount of movement on my part could exhaust it. Each step I took, after touching a stone of the pavement, rebounded off it. I seemed to have growing on my heels the wings of mercury. One of the fountains was filled with a ruddy glow, while in the other the moonlight had already begun to turn the water opalescent. Between them were children at play, uttering shrill cries, wheeling in circles, obeying some necessity of the hour, like swifts or bats. Next door to the hotel, the old national courts and the Louis the Sixteenth orangery, in which were installed now the savings bank and the army corps headquarters, were lighted from within by the palely gilded globes of their gas jets, which, seen in the still clear daylight outside, suited those vast, tall, eighteenth-century windows from which the last rays of the setting sun had not yet departed as would have suited a complexion heightened with rouge, a headdress of yellow tortoise shell, and persuaded me to seek out my fireside and the lamp which, alone in the shadowy front of my hotel, was striving to resist the gathering darkness, and for the sake of which I went indoors before it was quite dark, for pleasure as to an appetizing meal. I kept, when I was in my room, the same fullness of sensation that I had felt outside. It gave such an apparent convexity of surface to things, which as a rule seemed flat and empty, to the yellow flame of the fire, the coarse blue paper on the ceiling, on which the setting sun had scribbled corkscrews and whirligigs, like a schoolboy with a piece of red chalk, the curiously patterned cloth on the round table, on which a ream of essay paper and an ink pot lay in readiness for me, with one of Bergot's novels, that ever since then these things have continued to seem to me to be enriched with a whole form of existence which I feel that I should be able to extract from them if it were granted me to set eyes on them again. I thought with joy of the barracks that I had just left and of their weathercock turning with every wind that blew. Like a diver breathing through a pipe which rises above the surface of the water, I felt that I was in a sense maintaining contact with a healthy, open-air life, when I kept as a baiting place those barracks, that towering observatory dominating the countryside, furrowed with canals of green enamel, into whose various buildings I esteemed as a priceless privilege, which I hoped would last, my freedom to go whenever I chose, always certain of a welcome. At seven o'clock, I dressed myself and went out again to dine with saint Lou at the hotel where he took his meals. I liked to go there on foot. It was by now pitch dark, and after the third day of my visit, there began to blow, as soon as night had fallen, an icy wind which seemed a harbinger of snow. As I walked, I ought not, strictly speaking, to have ceased for a moment to think of Madame de Guermantes, it was only in the attempt to draw near her to her that I had come to visit Robert's garrison. But a memory, a grief, are fleeting things. There are days when they remove so far that we are barely conscious of them. We think that they have gone forever. Then we pay attention to other things. And the streets of this town had not yet become for me what streets are in the place where one is accustomed to live simply a means of communication between one part and another. The life led by the inhabitants of this unknown world must, it seemed to me, be a marvellous thing. And often the lighted windows of some dwelling house kept me standing for a long while motionless in the darkness by laying before my eyes the actual and mysterious scenes 
of an existence into which I might not penetrate. Here the fire spirit displayed to me in purple colouring the booth of a chestnut cellar in which a couple of sergeants, their belts slung over the backs of chairs, were playing cards, never dreaming that a magician's wand was making them emerge from the night like a transparency on the stage and presenting them in their true lineaments at that very moment to the eyes of an arrested passer-by whom they could not see. In a little curiosity shop, a candle, burnt almost to its socket, projecting its warm glow over an engraving, reprinted it in sanguine, while, battling against the darkness, the light of the big lamp tanned a scrap of leather, inlaid a dagger with fiery spangles, on pictures which were only bad copies, spread a priceless film of gold, like the patina of time, or the varnish used by a master, made, in fact, of the whole hovel, in which there was nothing but pinchbeck rubbish, a marvellous composition by Rembrandt. Sometimes I lifted my gaze to some huge old dwelling place, on which the shutters had not been closed, and in which amphibious men and women floated slowly to and fro in the rich liquid that after nightfall rose incessantly from the wells of the lamps to fill the rooms to the very brink of the outer walls of stone and glass, the movement of their bodies sending through it long, unctuous golden ripples. I proceeded on my way, and often, in the dark alley that ran past the cathedral, as long ago on the road to Mezeglise, the force of my desire caught and held me. It seemed that a woman must be on the point of appearing to satisfy it. If, in the darkness, I felt suddenly brush past me a skirt, the violence of the pleasure which I then felt made it impossible for me to believe that the contact was accidental, and I attempted to seize in my arms a terrified stranger. This gothic alley meant for me something so real that if I had been successful in raising and enjoying a woman there, it would have been impossible for me not to believe that it was the ancient charm of that place that was bringing us together, even though she were no more than a common street walker, stationed there every evening. Still, the wintry night, the strange place, the darkness, the medieval atmosphere would have lent her their mysterious glamour. I thought of what might be in store for me. To try to forget Madame de Guermont seemed to me a dreadful thing, but reasonable, and for the first time possible, easy perhaps even. In the absolute quiet of this neighbourhood, I could hear ahead of me shouted words and laughter which must come from tipsy revellers staggering home. I waited to see them. I stood peering in the direction from which I heard the sound. But I was obliged to wait for some time, for the surrounding silence was so intense that it allowed to travel with the utmost clearness and strength sounds that were still a long way off. Finally, the revellers did appear, not, as I had supposed, in front of me, but ever so far behind. Whether the intersection of side streets, the interposition of buildings, had by reverberation brought about this acoustic error, or because it is very difficult to locate a sound when the place from which it comes is not known, I had been as far wrong over direction as over distance. The wind grew stronger. It was thick and bristling with coming snow. I returned to the main street and jumped on board the little tramway car on which, from its platform, an officer, without apparently seeing them, was acknowledging the salutes of the loutish soldiers who trudged past along the pavement, their faces daubed crimson by the cold, reminding me, in this little town, which the sudden leap from autumn into early winter seemed to have transported further north, of the rubicund faces which Bruegel gives to his merry, junketing, frost-bound peasants. And sure enough, at the hotel where I was to meet Saint-Loup and his friends, and to which the fair, now beginning, 
had attracted a number of people from near and far, I found, as I hurried across the courtyard with its glimpses of glowing kitchens in which chickens were turning on spits, pigs were roasting, lobsters being flung alive into what the landlord called the everlasting fire, an influx worthy of some numbering of the people before Bethlehem, such as the old Flemish masters used to paint, of new arrivals who assembled there in groups, asking the landlord or one of his staff, who, if he did not like the look of them, would recommend lodging elsewhere in the town, whether they could have dinner and beds, while a scullion hurried past holding a struggling fowl by the neck. And similarly, in the big dining room which I crossed the first day before coming to the smaller room in which my friend was waiting for me, it was of some feast in the Gospels, portrayed with a medieval simplicity and an exaggeration typically Flemish, that one was reminded by the quantity of fish, pullets, grouse, woodcock, pigeons, brought in, dressed and garnished, and piping hot by breathless waiters, who slid over the polished floor to gain speed, and set them down on the huge carving table, where they were at once cut up, but where, for most of the people had nearly finished dinner when I arrived, they accumulated untouched, as though their profusion and the haste of those who brought them in were due not so much to the requirements of the diners as to respect for the sacred text, scrupulously followed in the letter, but quaintly illustrated by real details borrowed from local custom, and to an aesthetic and religious scruple for making evident to the eye the solemnity of the feast by the profusion of the victuals and the assiduity of the servers. One of these stood lost in thought at the far end of the room by a sideboard, and to find out from him, who alone appeared calm enough to be capable of answering me, in which room our table had been laid, making my way forward among the chafing dishes that had been lighted here and there to keep the latecomer's plates from growing cold, which did not, however, prevent the dessert in the centre of the room from being piled on the outstretched hands of a huge mannequin, sometimes supported on the wings of a duck, apparently of crystal but really of ice, carved afresh every day with a hot iron by a sculptor cook, quite in the Flemish manner, I went straight, at the risk of being knocked down by his colleagues, towards this servitor, in whom I felt that I recognised a character who is traditionally present in all these sacred subjects, for he reproduced with scrupulous accuracy the blunt features, fatuous and ill-drawn, the musing expression, already half aware of the miracle of a divine presence, which the others have not yet begun to suspect. I should add that, in view probably of the coming fair, this presentation was strengthened by a celestial contingent, recruited in mass of cherubim and seraphim. A young angel musician, whose fair hair enclosed a fourteen-year-old face, was not, it was true, playing on any instrument, but stood musing before a gong or a pile of plates, while other less infantile angels flew swiftly across the boundless expanse of the room, beating the air with the ceaseless fluttering of the napkins, which fell along the lines of their bodies like the wings in primitive paintings with pointed ends. Fleeing those ill-defined regions, screened by a hedge of palms, through which the angelic servitors looked from a distance as though they had floated down out of the Empyrean, I explored my way to the smaller room in which saint Lou's table was laid. I found there several of his friends who dined with him regularly, nobles except for one or two commoners in whom the young nobles had, in their school days, detected likely friends, and with whom they readily associated, proving thereby that they were not on principle hostile to the middle class, even though it were a republican, provided it had clean hands and went to mass. On the first of these evenings, before we sat down to dinner, I drew saint Lou into a corner, and in front of all the rest, but so that they should not hear me, said to him, Robert, this is hardly the time or the place for what I am going to say, but I shan't be a second. I keep forgetting to ask you when I'm in the barracks. 
Isn't that Madame de Garmont's photograph that you have on your table? Why, yes, my good aunt. Of course she is. What a fool I am. You told me before that she was. I'd forgotten all about her being your aunt. I say your friends will be getting impatient. We must be quick. They're looking at us. Another time will do. It isn't at all important. That's all right. Go on as long as you like. They can wait. No, no, I do want to be polite to them. They're so nice. Besides, it doesn't really matter in the least, I assure you. Do you know that worthy Oriane, then? This worthy Oriane, as he might have said, that good Oriane, did not imply that saint Lou regarded Madame de Guermont as especially good. In this instance, the words good, excellent, worthy, are mere reinforcements of the demonstrative that, indicating a person who is known to both parties and of whom the speaker does not quite know what to say to someone outside the intimate circle. The word good does duty as a stopgap and keeps the conversation going for a moment until the speaker has hit upon do you see much of her or I haven't set eyes on her for months or I should be seeing her on Tuesday or she must be getting on now, you know. I can't tell you how funny it is that it should be her photograph because we're living in her house now in Paris and I've been hearing the most astounding things I should have been hard put to it to say what about her which have made me immensely interested in her only from a literary point of view, don't you know from a, how shall I put it from a Balzacian point of view but you're so clever you can see what I mean I don't need to explain things to you but we must hurry up what on earth will your friends think of my manners? They will think absolutely nothing. I've told them that you're sublime, and they are a great deal more alarmed than you are. You're too kind. But listen, what I want to say is this. I suppose Madame de Guermont hasn't any idea that I know you, has she? I can't say. I haven't seen her since the summer, because I haven't had any leave since she's been in town. What I was going to say was this. I've been told that she looked on me as an absolute idiot. That I do not believe. Oriane is not exactly an eagle, but all the same, she's by no means stupid. You know that, as a rule, I don't care about your advertising the good opinion you're kind enough to hold of me. I'm not conceited. That's why I'm sorry you should have said flattering things about me to your friends here. We'll go back to them in two seconds. But Madame de Guermont is different. If you could let her know, if you would even exaggerate a trifle, what you think of me, you'd give me great pleasure. Why, of course I will, if that's all you want me to do. It's not very difficult. But what difference can it possibly make to you what she thinks of you? I suppose you think her no end of a joke, really. Anyhow, if that's all you want, we can discuss it in front of the others, or when we're by ourselves. I'm afraid of your tiring yourself if you stand talking, and it's so inconvenient, too, when we have heaps of opportunities of being alone together. It was precisely this inconvenience that had given me courage to approach Robert. The presence of the others was for me a pretext that justifies my giving my remarks a curt and incoherent form, under cover of which I could more easily dissemble the falsehood of my saying to my friend that I had forgotten his connection with the Duchess, and also did not give him time to frame with regard to my reasons for wishing that Madame de Guermont should know that I was his friend, was clever, and so forth, questions which would have been all the more disturbing in that I should not have been able to answer them. Robert, I'm surprised that a man of your intelligence should fail to understand that, that one doesn't discuss the things that will give one's friends pleasure. One does them. Now I, if you were to ask me, no matter what, and indeed I only wish you would ask me to do something for you, I can assure you, I shouldn't want any explanations. I may ask you for more than I really want. I've no desire to know, Madame de Guermont, but just to test you, I ought to have said that I was anxious to dine with Madame de Guermont. I'm sure you would never have done it. Not only should I have done it, I will do it. When? Next time I'm in Paris. Three weeks from now, I expect. We shall see. I dare say she won't want to see me, though. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Not at all, it's nothing. Don't say that. It's everything in the world, because now I can see what sort of a friend you are. Whether what I ask you to do is important or not, 
disagreeable or not, whether I'm really keen about it or ask you only as a test, it makes no difference. You say you will do it, and there you show the fineness of your mind and heart. A stupid friend would have started a discussion, which was exactly what he had just been doing, but perhaps I wanted to flatter his self-esteem. Perhaps also I was sincere, the sole touchstone of merit seeming to me to be the extent to which a friend could be useful in reflect of the one thing that seemed to me to have any importance, namely my love. Then I went on, perhaps from cunning, possibly from a genuine increase of affection inspired by gratitude, expectancy, and the copy of Madame de Guermont's very features which nature had made in producing her nephew Robert. But, I say, we mustn't keep them waiting any longer, and I've mentioned only one of the two things I wanted to ask you, the less important. The other is more important to me, but I'm afraid you will never consent. Would it bore you if we were to call each other tu? Bore me, my dear fellow, joy, tears of joy, undreamt of happiness. Thank you, tu, I mean. You begin first, ever so much. It is such a pleasure to me that you needn't do anything about Madame de Guermont if you'd rather not. This is quite enough for me. I can do both. I say, Robert, listen to me a minute, I said to him later, while we were at the dinner. Oh, it's really too absurd, the way our conversation is always being interrupted. I can't think why. You remember the lady I was speaking to you about just now? Yes. You're quite sure you know who I mean? Why, what do you take me for, a village idiot? You wouldn't care to give me her photograph, I suppose. I'd meant to ask him only for the loan of it, but when the time came to speak, I felt shy. I decided that the request was indiscreet, and in order to hide my confusion, I put the question more bluntly and increased my demand, as if it had been quite natural. No, I should have to ask her permission first, was his answer. He blushed as he spoke. I could see that he had a reservation in his mind, that he credited me also with one, that he would give only a partial service to my love, under the restraint of certain moral principles, and for this I hated him. At the same time, I was touched to see how differently San Lu behaved towards me now that I was no longer alone with him and that his friends formed an audience. His increased affability would have left me cold had I thought it was deliberately assumed, but I could feel that it was spontaneous and consisted only of all that he had to say about me in my absence and refrained, as a rule, from saying when we were together by ourselves. In our private conversations, I might certainly suspect the pleasure he found in talking to me, but that pleasure he almost always left unexpressed. Now, at the same remarks from me, which, as a rule, he enjoyed without showing it, he watched from the corner of his eye to see whether they produced on his friends the effect on which he had counted, an effect corresponding to what he had promised them beforehand. The mother of a girl in her first season could be no more unrelaxing in her attention to her daughter's responses and to the attitude of the public. If I had made some remark at which, alone in my company, he would merely have smiled, he was afraid that the others might not have seen the point and put in a, what's that? To make me repeat what I had said, to attract attention and turning at once to his friends and making himself automatically by facing them with a hearty laugh, the fugal man of their laughter, presented me for the first time with the opinion that he actually held of me and must often have expressed to them, so that I caught sight of myself suddenly from without, like a person who reads his name in a newspaper or sees himself in a mirror. It occurred to me one of these evenings to tell a mildly amusing story about Madame Blondet, but I stopped at once, remembering that saint Lou knew it already, and that when I tried to tell him it on the day following my arrival, he had interrupted me with, You told me that before at Balbec. I was surprised, therefore, to find him begging me to go on, and assuring me that he did not know of the story, 
and that it would amuse him immensely. You've forgotten it for the moment, I said to him, but you'll remember as I go on. No, really, I swear you're mistaken. You never told me. Do go on. And throughout the story, he fixed a feverish and enraptured gaze, alternately on myself and on his friends. I realised only after I had finished, amid general laughter, that it had struck him that this story would give his friends a good idea of my wit, and that it was for this reason that he pretended not to know it. Such is the stuff of friendship. On the third evening, one of his friends, to whom I had not had an opportunity before of speaking, conversed with me at great length, and I overheard him telling San Lu how much he had been enjoying himself. And indeed we sat talking together almost all evening, leaving our glasses of Sauterne untouched on the table before us, isolated, sheltered from the others by the sumptuous curtains of one of those intuitive sympathies between man and man which, when they are not based on any physical attraction, are the only kind that is altogether mysterious. Of such an enigmatic nature had seemed to me, at Baalbek, that feeling which saint Lou had for me, which was not to be confused with the interest of our conversations, a feeling free from any material association, invisible, intangible, and yet a thing of the presence of which, in himself, like a sort of inflammatory gas, he had been so far conscious as to refer to it with a smile. Yet there was something more surprising still in this sympathy born here in a single evening, like a flower that had budded and opened in a few minutes in the warmth of this little room. I could not help asking Robert, when he spoke to me about Baalbec, whether it were really settled that he was to marry Mademoiselle d'Ambrassac. He assured me that not only was it not settled, but that there had never been any thought of such a match. He had never seen her. He did not know who she was. If at that moment I had happened to see any of the social gossipers who had told me of this coming event, they would promptly have announced the betrothal of Mademoiselle d'Ambrassac to someone who was not saint Lou, and that of saint Lou to someone who was not Mademoiselle d'Ambrassac. I should have surprised them greatly had I reminded them of their incompatible and still so recent predictions. In order that this little game may continue and multiply, false reports by attaching the greatest possible numbers to every name in turn, nature has furnished those who play it with a memory as short as their credulity is long. End of section 5《セクション6 of the Guermantes Way, Le Côté de Guermantes, by Marcel Proust, translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michael O'Kelly. Saint-Loup at Doncières. Saint-Loup had spoken to me of another of his friends who was present also one with whom he was on particularly good terms just then, since they were the only two advocates in their mess of the retrial of Dreyfus. Just as a brother of this friend of saint Lou, who had been trained in the Scola Cantorum, thought about every new musical work, not at all what his father, his mother, his cousins, his club friends thought, but exactly what the other students thought at the Scola, so this non-commissioned nobleman of whom Bloch formed an extraordinary opinion when I told him about him, because, touched to hear that he belonged to the same party as himself, he nevertheless imagined him, on account of his aristocratic birth and religious and military upbringing, to be as different as possible, endowed with the same romantic attraction as a native of a distant country, had a mentality, as people were now beginning to say, analogous to that of the whole body of Dreyfusar in general, and of Bloch in particular, on which the traditions of his family and the interests of his career could retain no hold whatsoever. Similarly, one of saint Lou's cousins had married a young Eastern princess, who was said to write poetry 
quite as fine as Victor Hugo's or Alfred de Vigny's, and in spite of this was supposed to have a different type of mind from what one would naturally expect, the mind of an Eastern princess immured in an Arabian night's palace. For the writers who had the privilege of meeting her was reserved the disappointment, or rather the joy, of listening to conversation which gave the impression not of Scheherazade, but of a person of genius of the type of Alfred de Vigny or Victor Hugo. That fellow, oh, he's not like saint Lou. He's a regular devil, my new friend informed me. He's not even straight about it. At first he used to say, Just wait a little, there's a man I know well, a clever, kind-hearted fellow, General de bois d'Effre. You need have no hesitation in accepting his decision. But as soon as he heard that bois d'Effre had pronounced Dreyfus guilty, bois d'Effre ceased to count. Clericalism, staff prejudices, prevented his forming a candid opinion. Although there is no one in the world, or was rather, before this Dreyfus business, half so clerical as our friend. Next, he told us that now we were sure to get the truth. The case had been put in the hands of Saussier, and he, a soldier of the Republic, our friend coming of an ultra-monarchist family, if you please, was a man of bronze, a stern, unyielding conscience. But when Saussier pronounced Estrahazy innocent, he found fresh reasons to account for the decision, reasons damaging not to Dreyfus, but to General Saussier. It was the military spirit that had blinded Saussier, and I must explain to you that our friend is just as much militarist as clerical, or at least was. I don't know what to think of him now. His family are all broken-hearted at seeing him possessed by such ideas. Don't you think, I suggested, turning half towards saint Lou, so as not to appear to be cutting myself off from him as well as towards his friend, and so that we might all join in the conversation, that the influence we ascribe to environment is particularly true of intellectual environment. One is the man of one's idea. There are far fewer ideas than men, therefore all men with similar ideas are alike. As there is nothing material in an idea, so the people who are only materially neighbours of the man with an idea can do nothing to alter it. At this point I was interrupted by saint Lou, because another of the young men had leaned across to him with a smile, and pointing to me, exclaimed, Do rock! Do rock all over! I had no idea what this might mean, but I felt the expression on the shy young face to be more than friendly. While I was speaking, the approbation of the party seemed to saint Lou superfluous. He insisted on silence. Just as the conductor stops his orchestra with a rap from his baton, because someone in the audience has made a noise. So he rebuked the author of this disturbance. Giberg, you must keep your mouth shut when people are speaking. You can tell us about it afterwards. And to me, please go on. I gave a sigh of relief, for I had been afraid that he was going to make me begin all over again. As an idea, I went on, is a thing that cannot participate in human interests and would be incapable of deriving any benefit from them, the men who are governed by an idea are not influenced by material considerations. When I had finished, That's one in the eye for you, my boys, exclaimed saint Lou, who had been following me with his gaze with the same anxious solicitude as if I had been walking upon a tightrope. What were you going to say, Gilbert? I was just saying that your friend reminded me of Major Duroc, I seem to hear him speaking. Why, I've often thought so myself, replied saint Lou. They have several points in common, but you'll find there are a thousand things in this fellow that Duroc hasn't got. saint Lou was not satisfied with this comparison. In an ecstasy of joy, into which no doubt entered the joy that he felt in making me shine before his friends, with extreme volubility, stroking me, as though he were rubbing down a horse that had just come first past the post, he reiterated, You're the cleverest man I know, do you hear? He corrected himself and added, You and Elster, 
You don't mind my bracketing him with you, I hope. You understand punctiliousness. It's like this. I say it to you as one might have said to Balzac. You are the greatest novelist of the century. You and Stendhal. Mm, excessive punctiliousness, don't you know? And at heart, an immense admiration. No, you don't admit Stendhal? He went on with an ingenuous confidence in my judgment, which found expression in a charming, smiling, almost childish glance of interrogation from his green eyes. Oh, good, I see you're on my side. Bloch can't stand Stendhal. I think it's idiotic of him. The Chartreuse is, after all, an immense work, don't you think? I'm so glad you agree with me. What is it you like best in the Chartreuse? Answer me! He appealed to me with a boyish impetuosity, and the menace of his physical strength made the question almost terrifying. Mosca? Fabrice? I answered timidly that Mosca reminded me a little of Monsieur de Norpois. Whereupon, peals of laughter from the young Siegfried saint Lou. And while I was going on to explain, but Mosca is far more intelligent, not so pedantic, I heard Robert cry, Bravo! actually clapping his hands and, helpless with laughter, gasp, Oh, perfect! Admirable! You really are astounding! I took a particular pleasure in talking to this young man, as for that matter to all Robert's friends, and to Robert himself, about their barracks, the officers of the garrison, and the army in general. Thanks to the immensely enlarged scale on which we see things, however petty they may be, in the midst of which we eat and talk and lead our real life, thanks to that formidable enlargement which they undergo, and the effect of which is that the rest of the world, not being present, cannot compete with them, and assumes in comparison the unsubstantiality of a dream, I had begun to take an interest in the various personalities of the barracks, in the officers whom I saw on the square when I went to visit saint Lou, or, if I was awake then, when the regiment passed beneath my windows. I should have liked to know more about the major whom saint Lou so greatly admired and about the course of military history, which would have appealed to me even from an aesthetic point of view. I knew that with Robert the spoken word was, only too often, a trifle hollow, but at other times implied the assimilation of valuable ideas, which he was fully capable of grasping. Unfortunately, from the military point of view, Robert was exclusively preoccupied at this time with the case of Dreyfus, he spoke little about it, since he alone of the party at the table was a Dreyfusar. The others were violently opposed to the idea of a fresh trial, except my other neighbour, my new friend, and his opinions appeared to be somewhat vague. A firm admirer of the colonel, who was regarded as an exceptionally competent officer, and had denounced the current agitation against the army in several of his regimental orders, which won him the reputation of being an anti dreyfusar my neighbour had heard that his commanding officer had let fall certain remarks which had led to the supposition that he had doubts as to the guilt of Dreyfus, and retained his admiration for Picard. In the latter respect, at any rate, the rumour of Dreyfusism, as applied to the colonel, was as ill-founded as are all the rumours, springing from none knows where, which float around any great scandal. For, shortly afterwards, this colonel, having been detailed to interrogate the former chief of the intelligence branch, had treated him with a brutality and contempt the like of which had never been known before. However this might be, and naturally he had not taken the liberty of going direct to the colonel for his information, my neighbour had paid saint Lou the compliment of telling him, in the tone in which a Catholic lady might tell a Jewish lady that her parish priest denounced the pogroms in Russia and might openly admire the generosity of certain Israelites, that their colonel was not, with regard to Dreyfusism, to a certain kind of Dreyfusism at least, the fanatical, narrow opponent that he had been made out to be. 
I'm not surprised, was Saint Lou's comment, for he's a sensible man. But in spite of that, he is blinded by the prejudices of his caste, and above all, by his clericalism. Now, he turned to me, Major Duroc, the lecturer on military history I'm telling you about, there's a man who is wholeheartedly in support of our views, or so I'm told. And I should have been surprised to hear that he wasn't, for he is not only a brilliantly clever man, but a radical socialist and a Freemason. Partly out of courtesy to his friends, whom these expressions of Sandu's faith in Dreyfus made uncomfortable, and also because the subject was of more interest to myself, I asked my neighbour if it were true that this major gave a demonstration of military history which had a genuine aesthetic beauty. It is absolutely true. But what do you mean by that? Well, all that you read, let us say, in the narrative of a military historian, the smallest facts, the most trivial happenings, are only the outward signs of an idea which has to be analysed, and which often brings to light other ideas, like a palimpsest, so that you have a field for study as intellectual as any science you care to name, or any art, and one that is satisfying to the mind. Give me an example or two, if you don't mind. Well, it's not very easy to explain, Salou broke in. You read, let us say, that this or that corps has tried, but before we go any further, the serial number of the corps, its order of battle, are not without their significance. If it is not the first time that the operation has been attempted, and if for the same operation we find a different corps was brought up, it is perhaps a sign that the previous corps have been wiped out or have suffered heavy casualties in the said operation, that they are no longer in a fit state to carry it through successfully. Next, we must ask ourselves, what was this corps which is now out of action? If it was composed of shock troops held in reserve for big attacks, a fresh corps of inferior quality will have little chance of succeeding where the first has failed. Furthermore, if we are not at the start of a campaign, this fresh corps may itself be a composite formation of odds and ends withdrawn from other corps, which throws a light on the strength of the forces the belligerent still has at his disposal and the proximity of the moment when his forces shall be definitely inferior to the enemy's, which gives the operation on which this corps is about to engage a different meaning because if it is no longer in a condition to make good its losses, its successes even will only help mathematically to bring it nearer to its ultimate destruction. And then the serial number of the core that it has facing it is of no less significance. If, for instance, it is a much weaker unit, which has already accounted for several important units of the attacking force, the whole nature of the operation is changed since, even if it should end in the loss of the position which the defending force has been holding, simply to have held it for any length of time may be a great success if a very small defending force has been sufficient to disable highly important forces on the other side. You can understand that if, in the analysis of the core engaged on both sides, there are all these points of importance, the study of the position itself of the roads, of the railways which it commands, of the lines of communication which it protects, is of the very highest. One must study what I may call the whole geographical context, he added with a laugh. And indeed, he was so delighted with this expression that every time he employed it, even months afterwards, it was always accompanied by the same laugh. While the operation is being prepared by one of the belligerents, if you read that one of his patrols has been wiped out in the neighbourhood of the position by the other belligerent, one of the conclusions which you are entitled to draw is that one side was attempting to reconnoitre the defensive works with which the other intended to resist his attack. An exceptional burst of activity at a given point may indicate the desire to capture that point, but equally well the desire to hold the enemy in check there not to retaliate at the point at which he has attacked you. Or it may indeed be only a feint, 
intended to cover, by an increased activity, the relief of troops in that sector, which was a classic feint in Napoleon's wars. On the other hand, to appreciate the significance of any movement, its probable object, and, as a corollary, the other movements by which it will be accompanied or followed, is not immaterial to consult, not so much the announcements issued by the higher command, which may be intended to deceive the enemy, to mask a possible check, as the manual of field operations in use in the country in question. We are always entitled to assume that the manoeuvre which an army has attempted to carry out is that prescribed by the rules that are applicable to the circumstances. If, for instance, the rule lays down that a frontal attack should be accompanied by a flank attack, if, after the flank attack has failed, the higher command makes out that it had no connection with the main attack and was merely a diversion, there is a strong likelihood that the truth will be found by consulting the rules and not the reports issued from headquarters. And there are not only the regulations governing each army to be considered, but their traditions, their habits, their doctrines. The study of diplomatic activities, with their perpetual action or reaction upon military activities, must not be neglected either. The incidents, apparently insignificant, which at the time are not understood, will explain to you how the enemy, counting upon a support which these incidents show to have been withheld, was able to carry out only a part of his strategic plan. So that, if you can read between the lines of military history, what is a confused jumble for the ordinary reader becomes a chain of reasoning as straightforward as a picture is for the picture lover who can see what the person portrayed is wearing and has in his hands, while the visitor hurrying through the gallery is bewildered by a blur of colour which gives him a headache. But just as with certain pictures in which it is not enough to observe that the figure is holding a chalice, but one must know why the painter chose to place the chalice in his hands, what it is intended to symbolise, so these military operations, apart from their immediate object, are quite regularly traced in the mind of the general responsible for the campaign from the plans of earlier battles, which we may call the past experience, the literature, the learning, the etymology, the aristocracy, whatever you like, of the battles of today. Observe that I am not speaking for the moment of the local, the, what shall I call it, spatial identity of battles. That exists also. A battlefield has never been, and never will be, throughout the centuries, simply the ground upon which a particular battle has been fought. If it has been a battlefield, that was because it combined certain conditions of geographical position, of geological formation, drawbacks even, of a kind that would obstruct the enemy, a river, for instance, cutting his force in two, which made it a good field of battle. And so, what it has been, it will continue to be. A painter doesn't make a studio out of any old room, so you won't make a battlefield out of any old piece of ground. There are places set apart for the purpose. But, once again, this is not what I was telling you about. It was the type of battle which one follows, in a sort of strategic tracing, a tactical imitation, if you like. Battles like Ulm, Lodi, Leipzig, Cannae. I can't say whether there is ever going to be another war, or what nations are going to fight in it, but if a war does come, you may be sure that it will include, and deliberately on the commander's part, a Cannae, an Austerlitz, a Rothbach, a Waterloo. Some of our people say quite openly that Marshal von Schiefer and General Falkenhausen have prepared a battle of Cannae against France in the Hannibal style, pinning their enemy down along his whole front and advancing on both flanks, especially through Belgium, while Bernhardi prefers the oblique order of Frederick the Great, Lenten rather than Cannae. Others expound their views less crudely, but I can tell you one thing, my boy, that Beauconseil, the squadron commander I introduced you to the other day, 
who is an officer with a very great future before him, has swatted up a little Pratzen attack of his own. He knows it inside out. He's keeping it up his sleeve. And if ever he has an opportunity to put it into practice, he will make a clean job of it and let us have it on a big scale. The breakthrough in the centre at Rivoli, too. That's a thing that will crop up if there's ever another war. It's no more obsolete than the Iliad. I must add that we're practically condemned to make frontal attacks because we can't afford to repeat the mistake we made in 70. We must assume the offensive and nothing else. The only thing that troubles me is that if I see only the slower, more antiquated minds among us opposing this splendid doctrine. Still, one of the youngest of my masters, who is a genius, I mean Mongan, would like us to leave room, provisionally of course, for the defensive. It's not very easy to answer him when he cites the example of Austerlitz, where the defence was merely a prelude to attack and victory. The enunciation of these theories by saint Lou made me happy. They gave me to hope that perhaps I was not being led astray in my life at Doncier with regard to these officers whom I used to hear being discussed while I sat sipping a sautern which bathed them in its charming golden glint by the same magnifying power which had swollen to such enormous proportions in my eyes while I was at Baalbek, the king and queen of the South Sea Island, the little group of the four epicures, the young gambler, Le Grondin's brother-in-law, now shrunken so in my view as to appear non-existent. What gave me pleasure today would not perhaps leave me indifferent tomorrow, as had always happened hitherto. The creature that I still was at this moment was not perhaps doomed to immediate destruction, since to the ardent and fugitive passion which I had heard on these few evenings for everything connected with military life, saint Lou, by what he had just been saying to me, touching the art of war, added an intellectual foundation of a permanent character, capable of attaching me to itself so strongly that I might, without any attempt to deceive myself, feel assured that after I had left Doncier I should continue to take an interest in the work of my friends there, and should not be long in coming to pay them another visit. At the same time, so as to make quite sure that this art of war was indeed an art in the true sense of the word. You interest me, I I beg your pardon, to interest me enormously, I said to saint Lou. but tell me, there is one point that puzzles me. I feel that I could be keenly thrilled by the art of strategy, but if so, I must first be sure that it is not so very different from the other arts, that knowing the rules is not everything. You tell me that plans of battles are copied. I do find something aesthetic, just as you said, in seeing beneath a modern battle the plan of an older one. I can't tell you how attractive it sounds. But then, does the genius of the commander count for nothing? Does he really do no more than apply the rules? Or, in point of science, are there great generals, as are great surgeons, who when the symptoms exhibited by two states of ill health are identical to the outward eye, nevertheless feel, for some infinitesimal reason, founded perhaps on their experience, but interpreted afresh, that in one case they ought to do one thing, in another case another, that in one case it is better to operate, in another to wait? I should say so. You'll find Napoleon not attacking when all the rules ordered him to attack, but some obscure divination warned him not to. For instance, look at Austerlitz, or in 1806, take his instructions to Lannes, but you will find certain generals slavishly imitating one of Napoleon's movements and arriving at a diametrically opposite result. There are a dozen examples of that in 1870. But even for the interpretation of what the enemy may do, What he actually does is only a symptom, which may mean any number of different things. Each of them has an equal chance of being the right thing, 
if one looks only to reasoning and science. Just as in certain difficult cases, all the medical science in the world will be powerless to decide whether the invisible tumour is malignant or not, whether or not the operation ought to be performed. It is his instinct, his divination, like Madame de Teb, you follow me, which decides in the great general as in the great doctor. Thus, I've been telling you, to take one instance, what might be meant by a reconnaissance on the eve of a battle. But it may mean a dozen other things also, such as to make the enemy think you are going to attack him at one point, whereas you intend to attack him at another, to put out a screen which will prevent him from seeing the preparations for your real operation, to force him to bring up fresh troops, to hold them, to immobilise them in a different place from where they are needed, to form an estimate of the forces at his disposal, to feel him, to force him to show his hand. Sometimes, indeed, the fact that you employ an immense number of troops in an operation is by no means proof that it is your true objective, for you may be justified in carrying it out, even if it is only a feint, so that your feint may have a better chance of deceiving the enemy. If I had time now to go through the Napoleonic Wars from this point of view, I assure you that these simple classic movements which we study here, and which you will come and see us practising in the field, just for the pleasure of a walk, you young rascal. No, I know you're not well, I apologise. Well, in a war, when you feel behind you the vigilance, the judgement, the profound study of the higher command, you are as much moved by them as by the simple lamps of a lighthouse. Only a material combustion, but an emanation of the spirit, sweeping through space to warn ships of danger. I may have been wrong, perhaps, in speaking to you only of the literature of war. In reality, as the formation of the soil, the direction of wind and light tell us which way a tree will grow, so the conditions in which a campaign is fought, the features of the country to which you march, prescribe to a certain extent and limit the number of the plans among which the general has to choose. Which means that along a mountain range, through a system of valleys, over certain plains, it is almost with the inevitability and the tremendous beauty of an avalanche that you can forecast the line of an army on the march. Now you deny me that freedom of choice in the commander, that power of divination in the enemy who is trying to discover his plan, which you allowed me a moment ago. Not at all. You remember that book of philosophy we read together at Baalbek? The richness of the world of possibilities compared with the real world? Very well. It's the same thing with the art of strategy. In a given situation, there will be four plans that offer themselves, one of which the general has to choose, as a disease may pass through various phases for which the doctor has to watch. And here again, the weakness and greatness of the human elements are fresh causes of uncertainty. For of these four plans, let us assume that contingent reasons, such as the attainment of minor objects or time which may be pressing, or the smallness of his effective strength or shortness of rations, leads the general to prefer the first, which is less perfect, but less costly also to carry out, is more rapid, and has for its terrain a richer country for feeding his troops. He may, after having begun with this plan, which the enemy, uncertain at first, will soon detect, find that success lies beyond his grasp, the difficulty being too great. That is what I call the element of human weakness. Abandon it, and try the second, or third, or fourth. But it may equally be that he has tried the first plan, and this is what I call human greatness, merely as a feint to pin down the enemy, so as to surprise him later at a point where he has not been expecting an attack. Thus at Ulm, Mac, who expected the enemy to advance from the west, was surrounded from the north, where he thought he was perfectly safe. My example is not a very good one, as a matter of fact, and Ulm is a better type of enveloping battle, which the future will see reproduced, because it is not only a classic example from which generals will seek inspiration, but a form that is to some extent necessary, one of several necessities, 
which leave room for choice, for variety, like a type of crystallization. But it doesn't much matter really, because these conditions are, after all, artificial. To go back to our philosophy book, it is like the rules of logic or scientific laws. Reality does conform to it more or less, but bear in mind that the great mathematician Poincaré is by no means certain that mathematics are strictly accurate. As to the rules themselves, which I mentioned to you, they are of secondary importance really, and besides, they are altered from time to time. We cavalrymen, for instance, have to go by the field service of 1895, which you may say is out of date, since it is based on the old and obsolete doctrine which maintains that cavalry warfare has little more than a moral effect in the panic that the charge creates in the enemy. Whereas, the more intelligent of our teachers, all the best brains in the cavalry, and particularly the major I was telling you about, anticipate, on the contrary, that the decisive victory will be obtained by a real hand-to-hand -hand encounter in which our weapons will be sabre and lance, and the side that can hold out longer will win, not simply morally and by creating panic, but materially. saint Lou is quite right, and it is probable that the next field service will show signs of this evolution, put in my other neighbour. I am not ungrateful for your support, for your opinions seem to make more impression upon my friend than mine, said saint Lou with a smile, whether because the growing attraction between his comrade and myself annoyed him slightly, or because he thought it graceful to solemnise it with this official confirmation. Perhaps I may have underestimated the importance of the rules. I don't know. They do change, that must be admitted. But in the meantime, they control the military situation, the plans of campaign and concentration. If they reflect a false conception of strategy, they may be the principal cause of defeat, all this is a little too technical for you, he remarked to me. After all, you may say that what does most to accelerate the evolution of the art of war is wars themselves. In the course of a campaign, if it is at all long, you will see one belligerent profiting by the lessons furnished him by the successes and mistakes, perfecting the methods of the other, who will improve on him in turn. But that is a thing of the past. With the terrible advance of artillery, the wars of the future, if there are to be any more wars, will be so short that, before we have had time to think of putting our lessons into practice, peace will have been signed. Don't be so touchy, I told saint Lou, reverting to the first words of this speech. I was listening to you eagerly. If you will kindly not fly into a passion and will allow me to speak, his friend went on. I shall add to what you have just been saying that if battles copy and coincide with one another, it is not merely due to the mind of the commander. It may happen that a mistake on his part, for instance his failure to appreciate the strength of the enemy, will lead him to call upon his men for extravagant sacrifices, sacrifices which certain units will make with an abnegation so sublime that their part in the battle will be analogous to that played by some other unit in some other battle, and these will be quoted in history as interchangeable examples. To stick to 1870, we have the Prussian guard at saint Privat and the Turcos at Frischwiller and Wissembourg. Ah, interchangeable. Very neat. Excellent. The lad has brains, was saint Lou's comment. I was not unmoved by these last examples, as always when, beneath the particular instance, I was afforded a glimpse of the general law. Still, the genius of the commander, that was what interested me. I was anxious to discover in what it consisted, what steps, in given circumstances, when the commander who lacked genius could not withstand the enemy, the inspired leader would take to re-establish his jeopardised position, which according to saint Lou, was quite possible, and had been done by Napoleon more than once. And to understand what military worth meant, I asked for comparisons between the various generals whom I knew by name, 
which of them had most markedly the character of a leader, the gifts of a tactician, at the risk of boring my new friends, who, however, showed no signs of boredom, but continued to answer me with an inexhaustible good nature. I felt myself isolated, not only from the great freezing night which extended far around us and in which we heard from time to time the whistle of a train which only rendered more keen the pleasure of being where we were or the chime of an hour which, happily, was still a long way short of that at which these young men would have to buckle on their sabres and go, but also from all my external obsessions, almost from the memory of Madame de Guermont, by the hospitality of saint Lou, to which that of his friends, reinforcing it, gave, so to speak, a greater solidity. By the warmth also of this little dining room, by the savour of the well-chosen dishes that were set before us, they gave as much pleasure to my imagination as to my appetite. Sometimes the little piece of still life from which they had been taken, the rugged holy water stoop of the oyster in which lingered a few drops of brackish water, or the knotted stem, the yellow leaves of a bunch of grapes still enveloped them, inedible, poetic, and remote as a landscape, and producing at different points in the course of the meal the impressions of rest in the shade of a vine and of an excursion out to sea. On other evenings it was the cook alone who threw into relief these original properties of our food, which he presented in its natural setting, like a work of art, and a fish cooked in wine was brought in on a long earthenware dish, on which, as it stood out in relief on a bed of bluish herbs, unbreakable now, but still contorted from having been dropped alive into boiling water, surrounded by a circle of satellite creatures in their shells, crabs, shrimps and mussels, it had the appearance of being a ceramic design by Bernard Palissy. I am jealous, I am furious, saint Lou attacked me, half smiling, half in earnest, alluding to the interminable conversations aside which I had been having with his friend. Is it because you find him more intelligent than me? Do you like him better than me? Well, I suppose he's everything now, and no one else is to have a look in. Men who are enormously in love with a woman, who live in the society of woman lovers, allow themselves pleasantries on which others, who would see less innocence in them, would never venture. When the conversation became general, they avoided any reference to Dreyfus for a fear of offending saint Lou. The following week, however, two of his friends were remarking what a curious thing it was that, living in so military an atmosphere, he was so keen a Dreyfusar, almost an anti-militarist. The reason is, I suggested, not wishing to enter into details, that the influence of environment is not so important as people think. I intended, of course, to stop at this point and not to reiterate the observations which I had made to saint Lou a few days earlier. Since, however, I had repeated these words almost textually, I proceeded to excuse myself by adding, as in fact I was saying the other day, but I had reckoned without the reverse side of Robert's polite admiration of myself and certain other persons. That admiration reached its fulfilment in so entire an assimilation of their ideas that, in the course of a day or two, he would have completely forgotten that those ideas were not his own. And so, in the matter of my modest theory, saint Lou, for all the world, as though it had always dwelt in his own brain, as though I were merely poaching on his preserves, felt it incumbent upon him to greet my discovery with warm approval. Why, yes, environment is of no importance. And with as much vehemence as if he were afraid of my interrupting or failing to understand him, the real influence is that of one's intellectual environment. One is a man of one's idea. 
He stopped for a moment, with the satisfied smile of one who has digested his dinner, dropped his eyeglass, and, fixing me with a gimlet-like stare, All men with similar ideas are alike, he informed me, with a challenging air. Probably he had completely forgotten that I myself had said to him, only a few days earlier, what, on the other hand, he remembered so well. I did not arrive at St. Louis' restaurant every evening in the same state of mind. If a memory, a sorrow that weigh in us, are able to leave us so effectively that we are no longer aware of them, they can also return and sometimes remain with us for a long time. There were evenings when, as I passed through the town on my way to the restaurant, I felt so keen a longing for Madame de Guermont that I could scarcely breathe. You might have said that part of my breast had been cut open by a skilled anatomist, taken out and replaced by an equal part of immaterial suffering, by an equivalent load of longing and love. And however neatly the wound may have been stitched together, there is not much comfort in life when regret for the loss of another person is substituted for one's entrails. It seems to be occupying more room than they. One feels it perpetually. And besides, what a contradiction in terms to be obliged to think a part of one's body. Only it seems that we are worth more somehow. At the whisper of a breeze, we sigh from oppression, but from weariness also. I would look up at the sky. If it were clear, I would say to myself, perhaps she is in the country. She is looking at the same stars. And for all I know, when I arrive at the restaurant, Robert may say to me, Good news! I've just heard from my aunt. She wants to meet you. She's coming down here. It was not the firmament alone that I enshrined with the thought of Madame de Guermont. A passing breath of air, more fragrant than the rest, seemed to bring me a message from her, as long ago from Gilbert in the cornfields of Maiseglise. We do not change. We introduce into the feeling with which we regard a person many slumbering elements, which that feeling revives, but which are foreign to it. Besides, with these feelings for particular people, there is always something in us that is trying to bring them nearer to the truth, that is to say, to absorb them in a more general feeling, common to the whole of humanity, with which people and the suffering that they cause us are merely a means to enable us to communicate. What brought a certain pleasure into my grief was that I knew it to be a tiny fragment of the universal love. Simply because I thought that I recognised sorrows which I had felt on Gilbert's account, or else when in the evenings at Cambrai Mama would not stay in my room, and also the memory of certain pages of Bergot in the agony I now felt to which Madame de Guermont, her coldness, her absence, were not clearly linked as causes to effect in the mind of a philosopher, I did not conclude that Madame de Guermont was not the cause of that agony. Is there not such a thing as a diffused bodily pain, extending, radiating out into other parts, which, however, it leaves to vanish altogether if the practitioner lays his finger on the precise spot from which it springs? And yet, until that moment, its extension gave it for us so vague, so fatal a semblance that, powerless to explain or even to locate it, we imagined that there was no possibility of it being healed. As I made my way to the restaurant, I said to myself, a fortnight already since I last saw Madame de Guermont. A fortnight which did not appear so enormous an interval, save to me, who, when Madame de Guermont was concerned, reckoned time by minutes. 
For me, it was no longer the stars and the breeze merely, but the arithmetical divisions of time that assumed a dolorous and poetic aspect. Each day now was like the loose crest of a crumbling mountain, down one side of which I felt that I could descend into oblivion, but down the other was borne by the necessity of seeing the Duchess again. And I was continually inclining one way or the other, having no stable equilibrium. One day I said to myself, perhaps there will be a letter tonight, and on entering the dining room I found courage to ask saint Lou. You don't happen to have had any news from Paris? Yes, he replied gloomily. Bad news. I breathed a sigh of relief when I realised that it was only he who was unhappy, and that the news came from his mistress. But I soon saw that one of its consequences would be to prevent Robert for ever so long from taking me to see his aunt. I learned that a quarrel had broken out between him and his mistress, through the post, presumably, unless she had come down to pay him a flying visit between trains. And the quarrels, even when relatively slight, which they had previously had, had always seemed as though they must prove insoluble. For she was a girl of violent temper, who would stamp her foot and burst into tears for reasons as incomprehensible as those that make children shut themselves into dark cupboards, not come out for dinner, refuse to give any explanation, and only redouble their sobs when, our patients exhausted, we visit them with a whipping. To say that saint Lou suffered terribly from this estrangement would be an understatement of the truth, which would give the reader a false impression of his grief. When he found himself alone, the only picture in his mind being that of his mistress parting from him with the respect which he had felt for him at the sight of his energy, the anxieties which he had had at first gave way before the irreparable, and the cessation of an anxiety is so pleasant a thing that the rupture, once it was certain, assumed for him something of the same kind of charm as a reconciliation. What he began to suffer from, a little later, was a secondary and accidental grief, the tide of which flowed incessantly from his own heart. At the idea that perhaps she would be glad to make it up, that it was not inconceivable that she was waiting for a word from him, that in the meantime to be avenged on him, she would perhaps on a certain evening, in a certain place, do a certain thing, and that he had only to telegraph to her that he was coming for it not to happen, that others, perhaps, were taking advantage of the time which he was letting slip, and that in a few days it would be too late to recapture her, for she would already be bespoke. Among all these possibilities, he was certain of nothing, his mistress preserved a silence which wrought him up to such a frenzy of grief that he began to ask himself whether she might not be hiding in Doncier or have sailed to the Indies. It has been said that silence is a force. In another and widely different sense, it is a tremendous force in the hands of those who are loved. It increases the anxiety of the lover who has to wait. Nothing so tempts us to approach another person as what is keeping us apart, and what barrier is there so insurmountable as silence? It has been said also that silence is a torture, capable of goading to madness him who is condemned to it in a prison cell. But what a torture, keener than that of having to keep silence, is to have to endure the silence of the person one loves. Robert asked himself, what can she be doing, never to send me a single word like this? 
She hates me, perhaps, and will always go on hating me. And he reproached himself. Thus, her silence did indeed drive him mad with jealousy and remorse. Besides, more cruel than the silence of prisons, that kind of silence is in itself a prison. An immaterial enclosure, I admit, but impenetrable. This interposed slice of empty atmosphere through which, despite its emptiness, the visual rays of the abandoned lover cannot pass. Is there a more terrible illumination than that of silence, which shows us not one absent love, but a thousand, and shows us each of them in the act of indulging in some fresh betrayal? Sometimes, in an abrupt relaxation of his strain, Robert would imagine that this period of silence was just coming to an end, that the long-expected letter was on its way. He saw it. It arrived. He started at every sound. His thirst was already quenched. He murmured, The letter! The letter! After this glimpse of a phantom oasis of affection, he found himself once more toiling across the real desert of a silence without end. He suffered in anticipation, without a single omission, all the griefs and pains of a rupture which, at other moments, he fancied he might somehow contrive to avoid. Like people who put all their affairs in order with a view to a migration abroad, which they never make, whose minds, no longer certain where they will find themselves living next day, flutter helplessly for the time being, detached from them, like a heart that is taken out of a dying man and continues to beat though disjoined from the rest of his body. Anyhow, this hope that his mistress would return gave him courage to persevere in the rupture, as the belief that one will return alive from the battle helps one to face death. And inasmuch as habit is, of all the plants of human growth, the one that has least need of nutritious soil in order to live, and is the first to appear upon what is apparently the most barren rock. Perhaps, had he begun by effecting their rupture as a feint, he would, in the end, have grown genuinely accustomed to it. But his uncertainty kept him in a state of emotion which, linked with the memory of the woman herself, was akin to love. He forced himself, nevertheless, not to write to her, thinking, perhaps, that it was a less cruel torment to live without his mistress than with her in certain conditions, or else that, after the way in which they had parted, it was necessary to wait for excuses from her if she was to keep what he believed her to feel for him in the way, if not of love, at any rate of esteem and regard. He contented himself with going to the telephone, which had recently been installed at Doncières, and asking for news from, or giving instructions to, a lady's maid whom he had procured and placed with his friend. These communications were, as it turned out, complicated, and took up much of his time, since, influenced by what her literary friends preached to her about the ugliness of the capital, but principally for the sake of her animals, her dogs, her monkey, her canaries and her parakeet, whose incessant din her Paris landlord had declined to tolerate for another moment, Robert's mistress had now taken a little house in the neighbourhood of Versailles. Meanwhile he, down at Doncières, no longer slept a wink all night. Once in my room, overcome by exhaustion, he dozed off for a little, but suddenly he began to talk, tried to get up and run, to stop something from happening, said, I hear, you shan't, you shan't. He awoke. He had been dreaming, he explained to me, that he was in the country with the sergeant major. His host had tried to keep him away from a certain part of the house. Saint-Loup had discovered that the sergeant major 
had staying with him a subaltern, extremely rich and extremely vicious, whom he knew to have a violent passion for his mistress, and suddenly, in his dream, he had distinctly heard the spasmodic, regular cries which his mistress was in the habit of uttering at the moment of gratification. He had tried to force the sergeant major to take him to the room in which he was, and the other had held him back to keep him from going there, with an air of annoyance at such a want of discretion in a guest which, Robert said, he would never be able to forget. It was an idiotic dream, he concluded, still quite breathless. All the same, I could see that, during the hour that followed, he was more than once on the point of telephoning to his mistress to beg for a reconciliation. My father had now had the telephone for some time at home, but I doubt whether that would have been much use to saint Lou. Besides, it hardly seemed to me quite proper to make my parents, or even a mechanical instrument installed in their house, play pander between saint Lou and his mistress, ladylike and high-minded as the latter might be. His bad dream began to fade from his memory. With a fixed and absent stare, he came to see me on each of those cruel days which traced in my mind as they followed one after the other the splendid sweep of a staircase forged in hard metal on which Robert stood, asking himself what decision his friend was going to take. At length she wrote to ask whether he would consent to forgive her. As soon as he realised that a definite rupture had been avoided, he saw all the disadvantages of a reconciliation. Besides, he had already begun to suffer less acutely, and had almost accepted a grief, the sharp tooth of which he would have, in a few months perhaps, to feel again if their intimacy were to be resumed. He did not hesitate for long, and perhaps he hesitated only because he was now certain of being able to recapture his mistress, of being able to do it, and therefore of doing it. Only she asked him, so that she might have time to recover her equanimity, not to come to Paris at the new year. Now he had not the heart to go to Paris without seeing her. On the other hand, she had declared her willingness to go abroad with him, but for that he would need to make a formal application for leave, which Captain de Borodino was unwilling to grant. End of section 6「Section 7 of The Guermont Way »« Le Côté de Guermont » by Marcel Proust Translated by Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrief This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michael O'Kelly Saint-Loup at Doncières I'm sorry about it because of your meeting with my aunt, which will have to be put off. I dare say I shall be in Paris at Easter. We shan't be able to call on Madame de Guermont then, because I shall have gone to Baalbec. But really, it doesn't matter in the least, I assure you. To Baalbec? But you didn't go there till August. I know, but next year they're making me go there earlier for my health. All that he feared was that I might form a bad impression of his mistress after what he had told me. She's violent simply because she's too frank, too thorough in her feelings. But she is a sublime creature. You can't imagine what exquisite poetry there is in her. She goes every year to spend All Souls Day at Bruges. Nice of her, don't you think? If you ever do meet her, you'll see what I mean. She has a greatness. And, as he was infected with certain of the mannerisms used in the literary circles in which the lady moved, there's something sidereal about her, in fact, something bardic. You know what I mean, the poet merging into the priest. I was searching all through dinner for a pretext which would enable saint Lou to ask his aunt to see me without my having to wait until he came to Paris. Now, such a pretext was furnished 
by the desire I had to see some more pictures by Elster, the famous painter whom San Lu and I had met at Baalbeck. A pretext behind which there was, moreover, an element of truth, for if, on my visit to Elster, what I had asked of his painting had been that it should lead me to the comprehension and love of things better than itself, a real thaw, an authentic square in a country town, live women on a beach, all the more would I have commissioned from it the portraits of the realities which I had not been able to fathom, such as a lane of hawthorn blossoms, not so much that it might perpetuate their beauty for me as that it might reveal that beauty to me. Now, on the other hand, it was the originality, the seductive attraction of those paintings that aroused my desire, and what I wanted above anything else was to look at other pictures by Elster. It seemed to me also that the least of his pictures were something quite different from the masterpieces even of greater painters than himself. His work was like a realm apart, whose frontiers were not to be passed, matchless in substance. Eagerly collecting the infrequent periodicals in which articles on him and his work had appeared, I had learned that it was only recently that he had begun to paint landscapes and still life, and that he had started with mythological subjects. I had seen photographs of two of these in his studio, and had then been for long under the influence of Japanese art. Several of the works most characteristic of his various manners were scattered about the provinces. A certain house at Les Andelis, in which there was one of his finest landscapes, seemed to me as precious, gave me as keen a desire to go there and see it, as did a village in the Chartres district, among whose millstone walls was enshrined a glorious painted window, and towards the possessor of this treasure, towards the man who, inside his ugly house on the main street, closeted like an astrologer, sat questioning one of those mirrors of the world, which Elster's pictures were, and who had perhaps bought it for many thousands of francs, I felt myself borne by that instinctive sympathy which joins the very hearts, the inmost natures, of those who think alike upon a vital subject. Now, three important works by my favourite painter were described in one of these articles as belonging to Madame de Guermont, so that it was, after all, quite sincerely that on the evening on which saint Lou told me of his lady's projected visit to Bruges, I was able, during dinner, in front of his friends, to let fall, as though on the spur of the moment. Listen, if you don't mind, just one last word on the subject of the lady we were speaking about. You remember Elster, the painter I met at Baalbeck? Why, of course I do. You remember how much I admired his work? I do quite well, and the letter we sent him. Very well. One of the reasons, not one of the chief reasons, a subordinate reason, why I should like to meet the said lady. You do know who I mean, don't you? Of course I do. How involved you're getting. Is that she has in her house one very fine picture, at least, by Elster. I say I never knew that. Elster will probably be at Baalbeck at Easter. You know that he stays down there now all the year round, practically. I should very much like to have seen this picture before I leave Paris. I don't know whether you're on the sufficiently intimate terms with your aunt, but couldn't you manage, somehow, to give her so good an impression of me that she won't refuse, and then ask her if she let me come and see the picture without you, since you won't be there? That's all right, I'll answer for her. I'll make a special point of it. Oh, Robert, you are an angel. I do love you. It's very nice of you to love me, but it would be equally nice if you were to call me too, as you promised, and as you began to do. I hope it's not your departure that the two of you are plotting together, one of Robert's friends said to me. You know, if saint Lou does go on leave, it needn't make any difference. We shall still be here. It will be less amusing for you, perhaps, but we'll do all we can to make you forget his absence. As a matter of fact, just as we had decided that Robert's mistress would have to go to Bruges by herself, the news came that Captain de Borodino, obdurate hitherto in his refusal, had given authority for Sergeant saint Lou to proceed on long leave to Bruges. What had happened was this. The prince, 
extremely proud of his luxuriant head of hair, was an assiduous customer of the principal hairdresser in the town, who had started life as a boy under Napoleon III's barber. Captain de Borodino was on the best of terms with the hairdresser, being, in spite of his air of majesty, quite simple in his dealings with his inferiors. But the hairdresser, through whose books the prince's account had been running without payment for at least five years, swollen no less by bottles of Portugal and eau de souverain, irons, razors and straps than by the ordinary charges for shampooing, haircutting and the like, had a greater respect for saint Lou, who always paid on the nail and kept several carriages and saddle horses. Having learned of saint Lou's vexation at not being able to go with his mistress, he had spoken strongly about it to the prince at a moment when he was trussed up in a white surplice with his head held firmly over the back of the chair and his throat menaced by a razor. This narrative of a young man's gallant adventures won from the princely captain a smile of Bonapartish indulgence. It is hardly probable that he thought of his unpaid bill, but the barber's recommendation tended to put him in as good a humour as one from a duke would have put him in a bad. While his chin was still smothered in soap, the leave was promised, and the warrant was signed that evening. As for the hairdresser, who was in the habit of boasting all day long of his own exploits, and in order to do so claimed for himself, showing an astonishing faculty for lying, distinctions that were pure fabrications, having for once rendered this signal service to saint Lou, not only did he refrain from publishing it broadcast, but, as if vanity were obliged to lie, and when there was no scope for lying gave place to modesty, he never mentioned the matter to Robert again. All his friends assured me that, as long as I stayed in Ancierre, or if I should come there again at any time, even although Robert were away, their horses, their quarters, their time would be at my disposal, and I felt that it was with the greatest cordiality that these young men put their comfort and youth and strength at the service of my weakness. Why on earth, they went on, after insisting that I should stay, don't you come down here every year? You see how our quiet life appeals to you. Besides, you're so keen about everything that goes on in the regiment. You're quite the old soldier. For I continued my eager demands that they would classify the different officers whose names I knew according to the degree of admiration which they seemed to deserve. Just as in my school days I used to make the other boys classify the actors of the Théâtre Français. If, in the place of one of the generals whom I had always heard mentioned at the head of the list, such as Gallifet or Negrier, one of saint Lou's friends with a contemptuous but Negrier is one of the feeblest of our general officers, put the new, intact, appetizing name of Poe or Gaislain de Bourgogne, I felt the same joyful surprise as long ago when the outworn name of Tyron or Fèvre was sent flying by the sudden explosion of the unfamiliar name of Amaury. Better even than Negrier? But in what respect? Give me an example. I should have liked there to exist profound differences even among the junior officers of the regiment, and I hoped, in the reason for these differences, to seize the essential quality of what constituted military superiority. The one whom I should have been most interested to hear discussed, because he was the one whom I had most often seen, was the Prince de Borodino. But neither saint Lou nor his friends, if they did justice to the fine officer who kept his squadron up to the supreme pitch of efficiency, liked the man. Without speaking of him, naturally, in the same tone as of certain other officers, rankers and Freemasons, who did not associate much with the rest, and had in comparison an uncouth barrack-room manner, they seemed not to include Monsieur de Borodino among the officers of noble birth, from whom, it must be admitted, he differed considerably in his attitude, even towards saint Lou. The others, taking advantage of the fact that Robert was only an NCO, and that therefore his influential relatives might be grateful were he invited to the houses of superior officers on whom ordinarily they would have looked down, 
lost no opportunity of having him to dine when any bigwig was expected, who might be of use to a young cavalry sergeant. Captain de Borodino alone confined himself to his official relations, which, for that matter, were always excellent, with Robert. The fact that the prince, whose grandfather had been made a marshal and a prince-duke by the emperor, with whose family he had subsequently allied himself by marriage, while his father had married a cousin of Napoleon III and had been twice a minister after the coup d'etat, felt that in spite of all this he did not count for much with saint Lou and the Guermont connection, who in turn, since he did not look at things from the same point of view as they, counted for very little with him. He suspected that, for saint Lou he himself was, he, a kinsman of the Hohenzollern, not a true noble, but the grandson of a farmer. But at the same time he regarded saint Lou as the son of a man whose countship had been confirmed by the emperor, one of what were known in the Faubourg Saint-Germain as touched-up counts, and who had besought him first for a prefecture, then for some other post a long way down the list of subordinates to His Highness the Prince de Borodino, Minister of State, who was styled on his letters Monseigneur, and was a nephew of the Sovereign. Something more than a nephew, possibly. The first Princess de Borodino was reputed to have bestowed her favours on Napoleon I, whom she followed to the Isle of Elba, and the second hers on Napoleon III. And if, in the captain's placid countenance, one caught a trace of Napoleon I, if not in his natural features, at least in the studied majesty of the mask, the officer had, particularly in his melancholy and kindly gaze, in his drooping moustache, something that reminded one also of Napoleon III and this in so striking a fashion that, having asked leave after Sedan to join the emperor in captivity, and having been sent away by Bismarck, before whom he had been brought, the latter, happening to look up at the young man who was preparing to leave the room, was at once impressed by the likeness, and, reconsidering his decision, recalled him, and gave him the authorization which he, in common with everyone else, had just been refused. If the Prince de Borodino was not prepared to make overtures to saint Lou, nor to the other representatives of Faubourg Saint-Germain society that there were in the regiment, while he frequently invited two subalterns of plebeian origin who were pleasant companions, it was because, looking down upon them all from the height of his imperial grandeur, he drew between those two classes of inferiors the distinction that one set consisted of inferiors who knew themselves to be such and with whom he was delighted to spend his time, being beneath his outward majesty of a simple jovial humour, and the other of inferiors who thought themselves his superiors, a claim which he could not allow. And so, while all the other officers of the regiment made much of saint Lou, the Prince de Borodino, to whose care the young man had been recommended by Marshal X, confined himself to being obliging with regard to military duties, which saint Lou always performed in the most exemplary fashion, but never had him to his house, except on one special occasion, when he found himself practically compelled to invite him, and when, as this occurred during my stay at Doncières, he asked him to bring me to dinner also. I had no difficulty that evening, as I watched saint Lou sitting at his captain's table, in distinguishing in their respective manners and refinements the difference that existed between the two aristocracies, the old nobility and that of the empire. The offspring of a caste, the faults of which, even if he repudiated them with all the force of his intellect, had been absorbed into his blood, a caste which, having ceased to exert any real authority for at least a century, saw nothing more now in the protective affability which formed part of its regular course of education than an exercise, like horsemanship or fencing, cultivated without any serious purpose, as a sport, on meeting representatives of that middle class on which the old nobility so far looked down as to believe that they were flattered by its intimacy and would be honoured by the informality of its tone, 
St. Lou would take the hand of no matter who might be introduced to him, though he had failed perhaps to catch the stranger's name, in a friendly grip, and as he talked to him, crossing and uncrossing his legs all the time, flinging himself back in his chair in an attitude of absolute unconstraint, one foot in the palm of his hand, call him my dear fellow. Belonging, on the other hand, to a nobility whose titles still preserved their original meaning, provided that their holders still possessed the splendid emoluments given in reward for glorious services, and bringing to mind the record of high offices in which one is in command of numberless men and must know how to deal with men, the Prince de Borodino, not perhaps very distinctly or with any clear personal sense of superiority, but at any rate in his body, which revealed by its attitudes and behaviour generally, regarded his own rank as a prerogative that was still effective. Those same commoners whom saint Lou would have slapped on the shoulder and taken by the arm, he addressed with a majestic affability, in which a reserve, instinct with grandeur, tempered the smiling good fellowship that came naturally to him, in a tone marked at once by a genuine kindliness and a stiffness deliberately assumed. This was due, no doubt, to his being not so far removed from the great embassies and the court itself at which his father had held the highest posts, whereas the manners of saint Lou, the elbow on the table, the foot in the hand, would not have been well received there. But principally it was due to the fact that he looked down less upon the middle classes because they were the inexhaustible source from which the first emperor had chosen his marshals and his nobles, and in which the second had found a roué and a food. Son, doubtless, or grandson of an emperor, who had nothing more important to do than to command a squadron, the preoccupations of his putative father and grandfather could not, for want of an object on which to fasten themselves, survive in any real sense in the mind of M. de Borodino. But as the spirit of an artist continues to model, for many years after he is dead, the statue which he carved, so they had taken shape in him, were materialised, incarnate in him. It was they that his face reflected. It was with, in his voice, the vivacity of the first emperor that he worded a reprimand to a corporal, with the dreamy melancholy of the second that he puffed out the smoke of a cigarette. When he passed in plain clothes through the streets of Doncier, a certain sparkle in his eye, escaping from under the brim of the bowler hat, sent radiating round this captain of cavalry a regal incognito. People trembled when he strode into the sergeant major's office, followed by the adjutant and the quartermaster, as though by Berthier and Masséna. When he chose the cloth for his squadron's breeches, he fastened on the master tailor a gaze capable of baffling Talleyon and deceiving Alexander. And at times, in the middle of an inspection, he would stop, let his handsome blue eyes cloud with dreams, twist his moustache with the air of one building up a new Prussia and a new Italy. But a moment later, reverting from Napoleon III to Napoleon I, he would point out that the equipment was not properly polished and would insist on tasting the men's rations. And at home, in his private life, it was for the wives of middle-class officers, provided that their husbands were not Freemasons, that he would bring out not only a dinner service of royal blue Sèvres, fit for an ambassador, which had been given to his father by Napoleon, and appeared even more priceless in the commonplace house on a provincial street in which he was living, like those rare porcelains which tourists admire with a special delight in the rustic china cupboard of some old manor that has been converted into a comfortable and prosperous farmhouse. But other gifts of the emperor also, those noble and charming manners, which too would have won admiration in some diplomatic post abroad if for some men it did not mean a lifelong condemnation to the most unjust form of ostracism, merely to be well born. His easy gestures, his kindness, his grace, and, 
embedding beneath an enamel that was of royal blue, also glorious images, the mysterious, illuminated, living reliquary of his gaze. And in treating of the social relations with the middle classes which the prince had at Doncières, it may be as well to add these few words. The lieutenant colonel played the piano beautifully. The senior medical officer's wife sang like a conservatoire medalist. This latter couple, as well as the lieutenant colonel and his wife, used to dine every week with Monsieur de Borodino. They were flattered unquestionably, knowing that when the prince went to Paris on leave, he dined with Madame de Portalet and the Mouraz, and people like that. But, they said to themselves, he's just a captain after all. He's only too glad to get us to come. Still, he's a real friend, you know. But, when Monsieur de Borodino, who had long been pulling every possible wire to secure an appointment for himself nearer Paris, was posted to Beauvais, he packed up and went, and forgot as completely the two musical couples as he forgot the Doncière Theatre and the little restaurant to which he used often to send out for his lunch. And, to their great indignation, neither the lieutenant colonel nor the senior medical officer, who had so often sat at his table, ever had so much as a single word from him for the rest of their lives. One morning, saint Lou confessed to me that he had written to my grandmother to give her news of me, with the suggestion that, since there was telephonic connection between Paris and Doncières, she might make use of it to speak to me. In short, that very day she was to give me a call, and he advised me to be at the post office at about a quarter to four. The telephone was not yet at that date as commonly in use as it is today, and yet habit requires so short a time to divest of their mystery the sacred forces with which we are in contact that, not having had my call at once, the only thought in my mind was that it was very slow and badly managed, and I almost decided to lodge a complaint. Like all of us nowadays, I found not rapid enough for my liking, in its abrupt changes, the admirable sorcery for which a few moments are enough to bring before us, invisible but present, the person to whom we have been wishing to speak, and who, while still sitting at his table in the town in which he lives, in my grandmother's case, Paris, under another sky than ours, in weather that is not necessarily the same, in the midst of circumstances and worries of which we know nothing, but of which he is going to inform us, finds himself suddenly transported hundreds of miles, he and all the surroundings in which he remains immured, within the reach of our ear, at the precise moment which our fancy has ordained. And we are like the person in the fairy tale, to whom a sorceress, on his uttering the wish, makes appear with supernatural clearness his grandmother or his betrothed in the act of turning over a book, of shedding tears, of gathering flowers, quite close to the spectator, and yet ever so remote, in the place in which he actually is at the moment. We need only, so that the miracle may be accomplished, apply our lips to the magic orifice and invoke, occasionally for rather longer than seems to us necessary, I admit, the vigilant virgins, to whose voices we listen every day without ever coming to know their faces, and who are our guardian angels in the dizzy realm of darkness whose portals they so jealously keep, the all-powerful, by whose intervention the absent rise up at our side without our being permitted to set eyes on them, the Danaids of the unseen, who, without ceasing, empty, fill, transmit the urns of sound, the ironic furies, who, just as we were murmuring a confidence to a friend in the hope that no one was listening, cry brutally, I hear you, the ever-infuriated servants of the mystery, the umbrageous priestesses of the invisible, the young ladies of the telephone. And the moment our call has sounded, 
in the night filled with phantoms to which our ears alone are unsealed, a tiny sound, an abstract sound, the sound of distance overcome, and the voice of the dear one speaks to us. It is she, it is her voice that is speaking, that is there. But how remote it is! How often have I been unable to listen without anguish, as though confronted by the impossibility of seeing, except after long hours of journeying, her whose voice has been so close to my ear, I felt more clearly the sham and illusion of meetings, apparently most pleasant, and at what a distance we may be from the people we love at the moment when it seems that we have only to stretch out our hand to seize and hold them. A rich presence indeed, that voice so dear, in actual separation, but a premonition also of an eternal separation. Over and again, as I listened in this way, without seeing her who spoke to me from so far away, it has seemed to me that the voice was crying to me from depths out of which one does not rise again, and I have known the anxiety that was one day to wring my heart when a voice should thus return, alone and attached no longer to a body, which I was never more to see, to murmur in my ear words I would fain have kissed as they issued from lips, forever turned to dust. This afternoon, alas, at Doncières, the miracle did not occur. When I reached the post office, my grandmother's call had already been received. I stepped into the box. The line was engaged. Someone was talking, who probably did not realise that there was nobody to answer him, for when I raised the receiver to my ear, the lifeless block began squeaking like Punchinello. I silenced it, as one silences a puppet, by putting it back on its hook. But, like Punchinello, as soon as I took it again in my hand, it resumed its gabbling. At length, giving it up as hopeless, by hanging up the receiver once and for all, I stifled the convulsions of this vociferous stump, which kept up its chatter until the last moment, and went in search of the operator, who told me to wait a little. Then I spoke, and after a few seconds of silence, suddenly I heard that voice, which I supposed myself, mistakenly, to know so well. For always until then, every time that my grandmother had talked to me, I had been accustomed to follow what she was saying on the open score of her face, in which the eyes figured so largely. But her voice itself I was hearing this afternoon for the first time. And because that voice appeared to me to have altered in its proportions from the moment that it was a whole and reached me in this way alone and without the accompaniment of her face and features, I discovered for the first time how sweet that voice was. Perhaps, too, it had never been so sweet, for my grandmother, knowing me to be alone and unhappy, felt that she might let herself go in the outpouring of an affection which, on her principle of education, she usually restrained and kept hidden. It was sweet, but also how sad it was, first of all on account of its very sweetness, a sweetness drained almost, more than any but a few human voices can ever have been, of every element of resistance to others, of all selfishness. Fragile by reason of its delicacy, it seemed at every moment ready to break, to expire in a pure flow of tears. Then, too, having it alone beside me, seen without the mask of her face, I noticed for the first time the sorrows that had scarred it in the course of a lifetime. Was it, however, solely the voice, because it was alone, gave me this new impression which tore my heart? Not at all. It was rather that this isolation of the voice was like a symbol, a presentation, a direct consequence of another isolation, that of my grandmother, separated for the first time in my life 
from myself. The orders or prohibitions which she addressed to me at every moment in the ordinary course of my life, the tedium of obedience or the fire of rebellion which neutralized the affection that I felt for her, were at this moment eliminated, and indeed might be eliminated forever, since my grandmother no longer insisted on having me with her under her control, was in the act of expressing her hope that I would stay at Doncier altogether, and would at any rate extend my visit for as long as possible, seeing that both my health and my work seemed likely to benefit by the change. Also, what I held compressed in this little bell that was ringing in my ear, freed from the conflicting pressures which had, every day hitherto, given it a counterpoise, and from this moment, irresistible, carrying me altogether away, our mutual affection. My grandmother filled me with an anxious an insensate longing to return. This freedom of action which for the future she allowed me, and to which I had never dreamed that she would consent, appeared to me suddenly as sad as might be my freedom of action after her death, when I should still love her, and she would still forever have abandoned me. Granny, I cried to her, Granny, and would have fain kissed her, but I had beside me only that voice, a phantom, as impalpable as that which would come perhaps to revisit me when my grandmother was dead. Speak to me! But then it happened that, left more solitary still, I ceased to catch the sound of her voice. My grandmother could no longer hear me. She was no longer in communication with me. We had ceased to stand face to face to be audible to one another. I continued to call her, sounding the empty night in which I felt that her appeals also must be straying. I was shaken by the same anguish which, in the distant past, I had felt once before, one day when, a little child in a crowd, I had lost her, an anguish due less to my not finding her than to the thought that she must be searching for me must be saying to herself that I was searching for her, an anguish comparable to that which I was to feel on the day when we speak to those who can no longer reply, and whom we would so love to have here all the things that we have not told them, and our assurance that we are not unhappy. It seemed as though it were already a beloved ghost that I had allowed to lose herself in the ghostly world, and, standing alone before the instrument, I went on vainly repeating, Granny, Granny, as Orpheus, left alone, repeats the name of his dead wife. I decided to leave the post office, to go and find Robert at his restaurant, in order to tell him that, as I was half expecting a telegram which would oblige me to return to Paris, I wished at all costs to find out what times the trains left. And yet, before reaching this decision, I felt I must make one attempt more to invoke the daughters of the night, the messengers of the word, the deities without form or feature. But the capricious guardians had not deigned once again to unclose the miraculous portals, or, more probably, had not been able. In vain might they untiringly appeal, as was their custom, to the venerable inventor of printing, and the young prince, collector of impressionist paintings and driver of motor-cars, who was Captain de Borodino's nephew, Gutenberg and Wagram left their supplications unanswered, and I came away, feeling that the invisible would continue to turn a deaf ear. When I came among Robert and his friends, I withheld the confession that my heart was no longer with them, that my departure was now irrevocably fixed. Salou appeared to believe me, but I learned afterwards that he had from the first moment realised that my uncertainty was feigned, and that he would not see me again next day. And while letting their plates grow cold, his friends joined him in searching through the timetable 
for a train that would take me to Paris, and while we heard in the cold, starry night the whistling of the engines on the line, I certainly felt no longer the same peace of mind which in all these last evenings I had derived from the friendship of the former and the latter's distant passage. And yet they did not fail me this evening, performing the same office in a different way. My departure overpowered me less when I was no longer obliged to think of it by myself, when I felt that there was concentrated on what was to be done the more normal, more wholesome activity of my strenuous friends, Robert's brothers-in-arms, and of those other strong creatures, the trains, whose going and coming, night and morning, between Doncier and Paris, broke up in retrospect what had been too compact and insupportable in my long isolation from my grandmother into daily possibilities of return. I don't doubt the truth of what you're saying, or that you aren't thinking of leaving us just yet, said saint Lou, smiling, but pretend you are going, and come and say goodbye to me tomorrow morning. Early, otherwise there's a risk of my not seeing you. I'm going out to luncheon. I've got leave from the captain. I shall have to be back in barracks by two, as we are to be on the march all afternoon. I suppose the man to whose house I'm going, a couple of miles out, will manage to get me back in time. Scarcely had he uttered these words when a messenger came for me from my hotel. The telephone operator had sent to find me. I ran to the post office, for it was nearly closing time. The word trunks recurred incessantly in the answers given me by the officials. I was in a fever of anxiety, for it was my grandmother who had asked for me. The office was closing for the night. Finally, I got my connection. Is that you, Granny? A woman's voice with a strong English accent answered, Yes, but I don't know your voice. Neither did I recognise the voice that was speaking to me. Besides, my grandmother called me tu and not vous. And then all was explained. A young man for whom his grandmother had called on the telephone had a name almost identical with my own and was staying in an annex of my hotel. This call coming on the very day on which I had been telephoning to my grandmother, I had never for a moment doubted that it was she who was asking for me, whereas it was by pure coincidence that the post office and the hotel had combined to make a twofold error. The following morning I rose late and failed to catch saint Lou, who had already started for the country house where he was invited to luncheon. At about half past one, I had decided to go, in any case, to the barracks, so as to be there before he arrived when, as I was crossing one of the avenues on the way there, I noticed, coming behind me, in the same direction as myself, a Tilbury which, as it overtook me, obliged me to jump out of its way. An NCO was driving it, wearing an eyeglass. It was saint Lou. By his side was the friend whose guest he had been at luncheon, and whom I had met once before at the hotel where we dined. I did not dare shout to Robert, since he was not alone, but in the hope that he would stop and pick me up, I attracted his attention by a sweeping wave of my hat, which might be regarded as due to the presence of a stranger. I knew that Robert was short-sighted. Still, I should have supposed that, provided he saw me at all, he could not fail to recognise me. He did indeed see my salute, and returned it, but without stopping, driving on at full speed, without a smile, without moving a muscle of his face. He confined himself to keeping his hand raised for a minute to the peak of his cap, as though he were acknowledging the salute of a trooper whom he did not know personally. I ran to the barracks, but it was a long way. When I arrived, the regiment was parading on the square, on which I was not allowed to stand, and I was heartbroken at not having been able to say goodbye to saint Lou. I went up to his room, but he had gone. I was reduced to questioning a group of sick details, recruits who had been excused route marches, the young graduate and one of the old soldiers 
who were watching the regiment parade. "'You haven't seen Sergeant saint Lou, have you, by any chance?' I asked. "'He's gone on parade, sir,' said the old soldier. "'I never saw him,' said the graduate. "'You never saw him,' exclaimed the old soldier, losing all interest in me. "'You never saw our famous saint Lou, the figure he's cutting with his new breeches. "'When the capstan sees that, officer's cloth, my word.' "'Oh, you're a wonder, you are, officer's cloth,' replied the young graduate, who, reported sick in quarters, was excused marching, and tried, not without some misgivings, to be on easy terms with the veterans. "'This officer's cloth you speak of, is cloth like that, is it?' "'Sir!' "'Sir!' asked the old soldier angrily. He was indignant that the young graduate should throw doubt on the breeches being made of officer's cloth, but being a Breton, coming from a village that went by the name of Pengern Steraden, having learned French with as much difficulty as if it had been English or German, whenever he felt himself overcome by emotion, he would go on saying, Sir, to give himself time to find words, then, after this preparation, let loose his eloquence confining himself to the repetition of certain words he knew better than others, but without haste, taking every precaution to gloss over his unfamiliarity with the pronunciation. Ah, it is cloth like that, he broke out, with a fury, the intensity of which increased as the speed of his utterance diminished. Ah, it is cloth like that, when I tell you that it is officer's cloth, when I tell you a thing, if I tell you a thing, it's because I know I should think. Very well, then, replied the young graduate, overcome by the force of this argument. Keep your hair on, old boy. There, look, the capstan's coming along. No, but just look at saint Lou, the way he throws his leg out and his head. Would you call that a non-com? And his eyeglass. Oh, he's hot stuff, he is. I asked these troopers, who did not seem at all embarrassed by my presence, whether I too might look out of the window. They neither objected to my doing so, nor moved to make room for me. I saw Captain de Borodino go majestically by, putting his horse into a trot, and apparently under the illusion that he was taking part in the Battle of Austerlitz. A few loiterers had stopped by the gate to see the regiment file out, Erect on his charger, his face inclined to plumpness, his cheeks of an imperial fullness, his eye lucid, the prince must have been the victim of some hallucination, as I was myself, whenever, after the tramway car had passed, the silence that followed its rumble seemed to me to throb and echo with a faintly musical palpitation. I was wretched at not having said goodbye to saint Lou, but I went, nevertheless, for my one anxiety was to return to my grandmother. Always until then, in this little country town, when I thought of what my grandmother must be doing by herself, I had pictured her as she was when with me, suppressing my own personality, but without taking into account the effects of such a suppression. Now I had to free myself at the first possible moment, in her arms, from the phantom, hitherto unsuspected, and suddenly called into being by her voice, of a grandmother really separated from me, resigned, having, what I had never thought of her as having, a definite age, who had just received a letter from me in an empty house, as I had once before imagined Mamma in a house by herself, when I had left her to go to Baalbek. Alas, this phantom was just what I did see when, entering the drawing-room before my grandmother had been told of my return, I found her there reading. I was in the room, or rather I was not yet in the room, since she was not aware of my presence, and like a woman whom one surprises at a piece of work which she will lay aside if anyone comes in, she had abandoned herself to a train of thoughts which she had never allowed to be visible to me. Of myself, thanks to that privilege which does not last 
but which one enjoys during the brief moment of return, the faculty of being a spectator, so to speak, of one's own absence, there was present only the witness, the observer, with the hat and travelling coat, the stranger who does not belong to the house, the photographer who has called to take a photograph of places which one will never see again. The process that mechanically occurred in my eyes when I caught sight of my grandmother was indeed a photograph. We never see the people who are dear to us save in the animated system, the perpetual motion of our incessant love for them, which, before allowing the images that their faces present to reach us, catches them in its vortex, flings them back upon the idea that we have always had of them, makes them adhere to it, coincide with it. How, since into the forehead the cheeks of my grandmother, I had been accustomed to read all the most delicate, the most permanent qualities of her mind, how, since every casual glance is an act of necromancy, each face that we love a mirror of the past, how could I have failed to overlook what in her had become dulled and changed, seeing that, in the most trivial spectacles of our daily life, our eye, charged with thought, neglects, as would a classical tragedy, every image that does not assist the action of the play, and retains only those that may help to make its purpose intelligible. But if, in place of our eye, it should be a purely material object, a photographic plate that has watched the action, then what we shall see in the courtyard of the Institute, for example, will be, instead of the dignified emergence of an academician who is going to hail a cab, his staggering gait, his precautions to avoid tumbling upon his back, the parabola of his fall as though he were drunk or the ground is frozen over. So is it when some casual sport of chance prevents our intelligent and pious affection from coming forward in time to hide from our eyes what they ought never to behold, when it is forestalled by our eyes, and they, arising first in the field and having it themselves, set to work mechanically, like films, and show us, in place of the loved friend who has long ago ceased to exist, but whose death our affection has always hitherto kept concealed from us, the new person, whom a hundred times daily that affection has clothed with a dear and cheating likeness. And as a sick man who for long has not looked at his own reflection and has kept his memory of the face that he never sees refreshed from the ideal image of himself that he carries in his mind, recoils on catching sight in the glass in the midst of an arid waste of cheek, of the sloping red structure of a nose as huge as one of the pyramids of Egypt, I, for whom my grandmother was still myself, I, who had never seen her save in my own soul, always at the same time in the past, through the transparent sheets of contiguous overlapping memories, suddenly in our drawing-room, which formed part of a new world, that of time, that in which dwell the strangers of whom we say, he's begun to age a good deal. For the first time, and for a moment only, since she vanished at once, I saw, sitting on the sofa, beneath the lamp, red-faced, heavy and common, sick, lost in thought, following the lines of a book with eyes that seemed hardly sane, a dejected old woman whom I did not know. End of section 7section 8 of the guermont way le côté de guermont by marcel proust translated by charles kenneth scott moncrief this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michael o'kelly saint lou at doncier my request to be allowed to inspect the elsters in madame de guermont's collection had been met by saint lou with I will answer for her, and indeed, as ill luck would have it, 
It was he and he alone who did answer. We answer readily enough for other people when setting our mental stage with the little puppets that represent them. We manipulate these to suit our fancy. No doubt, even then, we take into account the difficulties due to another person's nature being different from our own, and we do not fail to have recourse to some plan of action likely to influence that nature, an appeal to his material interest, persuasion, the rousing of emotion, which will neutralise contrary tendencies on his part. But these differences from our own nature, it is still our own nature that is imagining them, these difficulties, It is we that are raising them. These compelling motives, it is we that are applying them. And so with the actions which before our mind's eye we have made the other person rehearse, and which make him act as we choose. When we wish to see him perform them in real life, the case is altered. We come up against unseen resistances which may prove insuperable. One of the strongest is doubtless that which may be developed in a woman who is not in love with him by the disgust inspired in her, a fetid, insurmountable loathing by the man who is in love with her. During the long weeks in which saint Lou did not come to Paris, his aunt, to whom I had no doubt of his having written, begging her to do so, never once asked me to call at her house to see the Elsters. I perceived signs of coldness on the part of another occupant of the building. This was Jupien. Did he consider that I ought to have gone in and said how do you do to him on my return from Doncierre before even going upstairs to our own flat? My mother said no, that there was nothing unusual about it. Françoise had told her that he was like that, subject to sudden fits of ill humour without any cause. These invariably passed off after a little time. Meanwhile, the winter was drawing to an end. One morning, after several weeks of showers and storms, I heard in my chimney, instead of the wind, formless, elastic, sombre, which convulsed me with a longing to go to the sea, the cooing of the pigeons that were nesting in the wall outside, shimmering, unexpected, like a first hyacinth, gently tearing open its fostering heart that there might shoot forth, purple and satin soft, its flower of sound, letting in, like an opened window into my bedroom, still shuttered and dark, the heat, the dazzling brightness, the fatigue of a first fine day. That morning I was surprised to find myself humming a music-hall tune, which had never entered my head since the year in which I had been going to Florence and Venice. So profoundly does the atmosphere, as good days and bad recur, act on our organism and draw from dim shelves where we had forgotten them, the melodies written there which our memory could not decipher. Presently a more conscious dreamer accompanied this musician to whom I was listening inside myself, without having recognised at first that he was playing. I quite realised that it was not for any reason peculiar to Baalbek that on my arrival there I had failed to find in its church the charm which it had had for me before I knew it, that at Florence or Parma or Venice my imagination could no more take the place of my eyes when I looked at the sights there. I realised this, Similarly, one New Year's afternoon, as night fell, standing before a column of playbills, I had discovered the illusion that lies in our thinking that certain solemn holidays differ essentially from the other days in the calendar. And yet I could not prevent my memory of the time during which I had looked forward to spending Easter in Florence from continuing to make that festival the atmosphere, so to speak, of the city of flowers, to give at once to Easter day something Florentine and to Florence something Paschal. Easter was still a long way off, but in the range of days that stretched out before me, the days of Holy Week stood out more clearly 
at the end of those that merely came between. Touched by a far-off ray, like certain houses in a village which one sees from a distance when the rest are in shadow, they had caught and kept all the sun. The weather had now become milder, and my parents themselves, by urging me to take more exercise, gave me an excuse for resuming my morning walks. I had meant to give them up, since they meant my meeting Madame de Guermont, but it was for this very reason that I kept thinking all the time of those walks, which led to my finding, every moment, a fresh reason for taking them, a reason that had no connection with Madame de Guermont, and no difficulty in convincing me that, had she ever existed, I should still have taken a walk without fail at that hour every morning. Alas, if to me meeting any person other than herself would not have mattered, I felt that to her meeting anyone in the world except myself would have been endurable. It happened that, in the course of her morning walks, she received the salutations of plenty of fools, whom she regarded as such. But the appearance of these in her path seemed to her, if not to hold out any promise of pleasure, to be, at any rate, the result of mere accident. And she stopped them at times, for there are moments in which one wants to escape from oneself, to accept the hospitality offered by the soul of another person, provided always that the other, however modest and plain it may be, is a different soul. Whereas in my heart she was exasperated to feel that what she would have found was herself. And so, even when I had, for taking the same way as she, another reason than my desire to see her, I trembled like a guilty man as she came past, and sometimes, so as to neutralise anything extravagant that there might seem to have been in my overtures, I would barely acknowledge her bow, or would fasten my eyes on her face without raising my hat, and succeed only in making her angrier than ever, and begin to regard me as insolent and ill-bred besides. She was now wearing lighter, or at any rate brighter, clothes, and would come strolling down the street in which already, as though it were spring, in front of the narrow shops that were squeezed in between the huge fronts of the old aristocratic mansions, over the booths of the butter-woman and the fruit-woman and the vegetable-woman, awnings were spread to protect them from the sun. I said to myself that the woman whom I could see far off, walking, opening her sunshade, crossing the street, was, in the opinion of those best qualified to judge, the greatest living exponent of the art of performing those movements and of making out of them something exquisitely lovely. Meanwhile she was advancing towards me, unconscious of this widespread reputation, her narrow, stubborn body, which had absorbed none of it, was bent stiffly forward under a scarf of violet silk. Her clear, sullen eyes looked absently in front of her and had perhaps caught sight of me. She was biting her lip. I saw her straighten her muff, give alms to a beggar, buy a bunch of violets from a flower seller, with the same curiosity that I should have felt in watching the strokes of a great painter's brush. And when, as she reached me, she gave me a bow that was accompanied sometimes by a faint smile, it was as though she had sketched in colour for me, adding a personal inscription to myself, a drawing that was a masterpiece of art. Each of her gowns seemed to me her natural, necessary surroundings, like the projection around her of a particular aspect of her soul. On one of those Lenten mornings, when she was on her way out to luncheon, I met her wearing a gown of bright red velvet, cut slightly open at the throat. The face of Madame de Guermont appeared to be dreaming beneath its pile of fair hair. I was less sad than usual, because the melancholy of her expression, the sort of claustration which the startling hue of her gown set between her and the rest of the world, 
made her seem somehow lonely and unhappy, and this comforted me. The gown struck me as being the materialization round about her of the scarlet rays of a heart which I did not recognize as hers, and might have been able, perhaps, to console. Sheltered in the mystical light of the garment with its gently flowing folds, she made me think of some saint in the early ages of Christianity, after which I felt ashamed of afflicting with the sight of myself this holy martyr. But, after all, the streets are public. The streets are public, I reminded myself, giving a different meaning to the words, and marvelling that indeed in the crowded thoroughfare, often soaked with rain, which made it beautiful and precious, as a street sometimes is in the old towns of Italy, the Duchesse de Guermont mingled with the public life of the world moments of her own secret life, showing herself thus to all and sundry, jostled by every passer-by, with the splendid gratuitousness of the greatest works of art. As I had been out in the morning, after staying awake all night, in the afternoon my parents would tell me to lie down for a little and try to sleep. There is no need, when one is trying to find sleep, to give much thought to the quest, but habit is very useful, and even freedom from thought. But in these afternoons both were lacking. Before going to sleep, I devoted so much time to thinking that I should not be able to sleep, that even after I was asleep, a little of my thought remained. It was no more than a glimmer in the almost total darkness, but it was bright enough to cast a reflection on my sleep, first of the idea that I could not sleep, and then a reflection of this reflection, that it was in my sleep that I had had the idea that I was not asleep. Then, by further refraction, my awakening. To a fresh doze, in which I was trying to tell some friends who had come into my room that, a moment earlier, when I was asleep, I had imagined that I was not asleep. These shades were barely distinguishable. It would have required a keen and quite useless delicacy of perception to seize them all. Similarly, in later years at Venice, long after the sun had set, when it seemed to be quite dark, I have seen, thanks to the echo itself imperceptible, of a last note of light, held indefinitely on the surface of the canals, as though some optical pedal were being pressed, the reflection of the palaces unfurled, as though for all time in a darker velvet on the crepuscular greyness of the water. One of my dreams was the synthesis of what my imagination had often sought to depict in my waking hours of a certain sea-girt place and its medieval past. In my sleep I saw a gothic fortress rising from a sea whose waves were stilled as in a painted window. An arm of the sea cut the town in two. The green water stretched to my feet. It bathed on the opposite shore the foundations of an oriental church, and beyond it houses which existed already in the 14th century, so that to go across to them would have been to ascend the stream of time. This stream, in which nature had learned from art, in which the sea had turned gothic, this dream in which I longed to attain, in which I believed that I was attaining to the impossible, it seemed to me that I had often dreamed it before. But as it is the property of what we imagine in our sleep to multiply itself in the past and to appear even when novel, familiar, I supposed that I was mistaken. I noticed, however, that I did frequently have this dream. The limitations, too, that are common to all sleep were reflected in mine, but in a symbolical manner. I could not in the darkness make out the faces of the friends who were in the room, for we sleep with our eyes shut. I, who could carry on endless arguments with myself while I dreamed, as soon as I tried to speak to these friends, felt the words stick in my throat, for we do not speak distinctly in our sleep. I wanted to go with them, 
and I could not move my limbs, for we do not walk when we are asleep either. And suddenly I was ashamed to be seen by them, for we sleep without our clothes. So my eyes blinded, my lips sealed, my limbs fettered, my body naked, the figure of sleep, which my sleep itself projected, had the appearance of those great allegorical figures, in one of which Giotto has portrayed envy with a serpent in her mouth, of which Swan had given me photographs. Salou came to Paris for a few hours only. He came with assurances that he had had no opportunity of mentioning me to his aunt. She's not being at all nice just now, Oriane isn't, he explained with innocent self-betrayal. She's not my old Oriane any longer. They've gone and changed her. I assure you it's not worth while bothering your head about her. You pay her far too great a compliment. Wouldn't you care to meet my cousin Poitiers, he went on, without stopping to reflect that this could not possibly give me any pleasure. Quite an intelligent young woman she is. You'd like her. She's married to my cousin, the Duc de Poitiers, who is a good fellow, but a bit slow for her. I've told her about you. She said I was to bring you to see her. She's much better looking than Oriane, and younger too. Really a nice person, don't you know? Really a good sort. These were expressions recently, and all the more ardently, taken up by Robert, which meant that the person in question had a delicate nature. I don't go so far as to say she's a Dreyfusar. You must remember the sort of people she lives among. Still, she did say to me, If he's innocent, how ghastly for him to be shut up on the devil's isle. You see what I mean, don't you? And then she's the sort of woman who does a tremendous lot for her old governesses. She's given orders that they're never to be sent in by the servants' stair when they come to the house. She's a very good sort, I assure you. The real reason why Oriane doesn't like her is that she feels she's the cleverer of the two. Although completely absorbed in the pity which she felt for one of the Guermont footmen, who had no chance of going to see his girl, even when the Duchess was out, for it would immediately have been reported to her from the lodge, Françoise was heartbroken at not having been in the house at the moment of saint Louis's visit. But this was because now she herself paid visits also. She never failed to go out on the days when I most wanted her. It was always to see her brother, her niece, and more particularly her own daughter, who had recently come to live in Paris. The intimate nature of these visits itself increased the irritation that I felt at being deprived of her services, for I had a foreboding that she would speak of them as being among those duties from which there is no dispensation, according to the laws laid down at saint andre des champs And so I never listened to her excuses without an ill humour, which was highly unjust to her, and was brought to a climax by the way Françoise had of saying not, I've been to see my brother, or I've been to see my niece, but I've been to see the brother. I just looked in as I passed to bid good day to the niece, or to my niece the butcheress. As for her daughter, Françoise would have been glad to see her return to Combray, but this recent Parisian, making use, like a woman of fashion, of abbreviations, though hers were of a vulgar kind, protested that the week she was going shortly to spend at Combray would seem quite long enough without so much as the sight of the intran. She was still less willing to go to Françoise's sister, who lived in a mountainous country, for mountains, said the daughter, giving to the adjective a new and terrible meaning, aren't really interesting. She could not make up her mind to go back to Maiseglise, where the people are so stupid, where in the market the gossips at their stalls would call cousins with her and say, why, it's never poor Bazirot's daughter. She would sooner die than go back and bury herself down there now that she had tasted the life of Paris. And Françoise, traditionalist as she was, smiled complacently nevertheless at the spirit of innovation that was incarnate in this new Parisian when she said, Very well, mother, if you don't get your day out, you have only to send me a plus. 
The weather had turned chilly again. "'Go out. What for? To catch your death?' said Françoise, who preferred to remain in the house during the week which her daughter and brother and the butcher niece had gone to spend at Combray. Being, moreover, the last surviving adherent of the sect in whom persisted obscurely the doctrine of my aunt Léonie, the natural philosopher, Françoise would add, speaking of this unseasonable weather, "'It is the remnant of the wrath of God,' but I responded to her complaints only in a languid smile, all the more indifferent to these predictions, in that, whatever befell, it would be fine for me. Already I could see the morning sun shine on the slope of Fiesole. I warmed myself in its rays. Their strength obliged me to half open, half shut my eyelids, smiling the while, and my eyelids, like alabaster lamps, were filled with a rosy glow. It was not only the bells that came from Italy. Italy had come with them. My faithful hands would not lack flowers to honour the anniversary of the pilgrimage which I ought to have made long ago, for since here in Paris the weather had turned cold again, as in another year at the time of our preparations for departure at the end of Lent, in the liquid, freezing air which bathed the chestnuts and plains on the boulevards, the tree in the courtyard of our house, there were already opening their pestles, as in a bowl of pure water, the narcissi, the jonquils, the anemones of the Ponte Vecchio. My father had informed us that he now knew from his friend A.J. where M. de Norpois was going when he met him about the place. It's to see Madame de Viparisi. They are great friends. I never knew anything about it. It seems she's a delightful person, a most superior woman. You ought to go and call on her, she told me. Another thing that surprised me very much. He spoke to me of Monsieur de Garmont as quite a distinguished man. I'd always taken him for a boor. It seems he knows an enormous amount and has perfect taste only he's very proud of his name and his connections. But for that matter, according to Norpois, he has a tremendous position, not only here, but all over Europe. It appears the Austrian emperor and the Tsar treat him just like one of themselves. Old Norpois told me that Madame de Viparisi had taken quite a fancy to you, and that you would meet all sorts of interesting people in her house. He paid a great tribute to you. You will see him if you go there, and he may have some good advice for you, even if you are going to be a writer. For you're not likely to do anything else, I can see that. It might turn out quite a good career. It's not what I would have chosen for you myself, but you'll be a man in no time now. We shan't always be here to look after you, and we mustn't prevent you from following your vocation. If only I'd been able to start writing. But whatever the conditions in which I approached the task, as too, alas, the undertakings not to touch alcohol, to go to bed early, to sleep, to keep fit, whether it were with enthusiasm, with method, with pleasure, in depriving myself of a walk or postponing my walk and keeping it in reserve as a reward of industry, taking advantage of an hour of good health, utilising the inactivity forced on me by a day of illness, what always emerged in the end from all my effort was a virgin page, undefiled by any writing, ineluctable as that forced card which in certain tricks one invariably is made to draw, however carefully one may first have shuffled the pack. I was not merely the instrument of habits of not working, of not going to bed, of not sleeping, which must find expression somehow, cost what it might. If I offered them no resistance, if I contented myself with the pretext they seized from the first opportunity that the day afforded them of acting as they chose, I escaped without serious injury. I slept for a few hours, after all, towards morning. I read a little. I did not overexert myself. But if I attempted to thwart them, if I pretended to go to bed early, to drink only water, to work, they grew restive. They adopted strong measures, they made me really ill. I was obliged to double my dose of alcohol, did not lie down in bed for two days and nights on end, 
could not even read, and avowed that another time I would be more reasonable, that is to say, less wise, like the victim of an assault who allows himself to be robbed for fear should he offer resistance of being murdered. My father, in the meantime, had met Monsieur de Garmont once or twice, and, now that Monsieur de Norpois had told him that the Duke was a remarkable man, had begun to pay more attention to what he said. As it happened, they met in the courtyard and discussed Madame de Viparisi. He tells me she's his aunt. Viparisi, he pronounces it. He tells me, too, she's an extraordinarily able woman. In fact, he said, she kept a school of wit, my father announced to us, impressed by the vagueness of this expression, which he had indeed come across now and then in volumes of memoirs, but without attaching to it any definite meaning. My mother, so great was her respect for him, when she saw that he did not dismiss as of no importance the fact that Madame de Viparisi kept a school of wit, decided that this must be of some consequence. Albeit from my grandmother, she had known all the time the exact amount of the Marquise's intellectual worth. It was immediately enhanced in her eyes. My grandmother, who was not very well just then, was not in favour at first of the suggested visit, and afterwards lost interest in the matter. Since we had moved into our new flat, Madame de Viparisi had several times asked my grandmother to call upon her. And invariably, my grandmother had replied that she was not going out just at present, in one of those letters which, by a new habit of hers which we did not understand, she no longer sealed herself, but employed Françoise to lick the envelopes for her. As myself, without any very clear picture in my mind of this school of wit, I should not have been greatly surprised to find the old lady from Baalbek installed behind a desk, as, for that matter, I eventually did. My father would have been glad to know, into the bargain, whether the ambassador's support would be worth many votes to him at the Institute, for which he had thoughts of standing as an independent candidate. To tell the truth, while he did not venture to doubt that he would have Monsieur de Norpois' support, he was by no means certain of it. He had thought it merely malicious gossip when they assured him at the ministry that Monsieur de Norpois, wishing to be himself the only representative there of the Institute, would put every possible obstacle in the way of my father's candidature, which, besides, would be particularly awkward for him at that moment, since he was supporting another candidate already. And yet, when Monsieur Le Roi Beaulieu had first advised him to stand and reckoned up his chances, my father had been struck by the fact that, among the colleagues upon whom he could count for support, the eminent economist had not mentioned Monsieur de Norpois. He dared not ask the ambassador point blank, but hoped that I should return from my call on Madame de Viparisi with his election as good as secured. This call was now imminent. That Monsieur de Norpois would carry on propaganda calculated to assure my father the votes of at least two-thirds of the academy seemed to him all the more probable since the ambassador's willingness to oblige was proverbial, those who liked him least admitting that no one else took such pleasure in being of service. And besides, at the ministry, his protective influence was extended over my father far more markedly than over any other official. My father had also another encounter about this time, but one at which his extreme surprise ended in equal indignation. In the street one day, he ran into Madame Sazarin, whose life in Paris, her comparative poverty, restricted to occasional visits to a friend. There was no one who bored my father quite so intensely as did Madame Sazarin, so much so that Mamma was obliged once a year to intercede with him in sweet and suppliant tones. My dear, I really must invite Madame Sazerat to the house just once. She won't stay long. And even... Listen, my dear, I'm going to ask you to make a great sacrifice. Do go and call upon Madame Sazerat. 
You know I hate bothering you, but it would be so nice of you. He would laugh, raise various objections, and go to pay the call. And so, for all that Madame Cesara did not appeal to him, on catching sight of her in the street, my father went towards her, hat in hand. But to his profound astonishment, Madame Cesara confined her greeting to the frigid bow enforced by politeness towards a person who is guilty of some disgraceful action or has been condemned to live for the future in another hemisphere. My father had come home speechless with rage. Next day, my mother met Madame Cesara in someone's house. She did not offer my mother her hand, but only smiled at her with a vague and melancholy air, as one smiles at a person with whom one used to play as a child, but with whom one has since severed all one's relations, because she has led an abandoned life, has married a convict, or, what is worse still, a correspondent. Now from all time, my parents had accorded to Madame Cesara, and inspired in her, the most profound respect. But, and of this my mother was ignorant, Madame de Cesara, alone of her kind at Combray, was a Dreyfusar. My father, a friend of Monsieur Méline, was convinced that Dreyfus was guilty. He had flatly refused to listen to some of his colleagues who had asked him to sign a petition demanding a fresh trial. He never spoke to me for a week after learning that I had chosen to take a different line. His opinions were well known. He came near to being looked upon as a nationalist. As for my grandmother, in whom alone of the family a generous doubt was likely to be kindled, whenever anyone spoke to her of the possible innocence of Dreyfus, she gave a shake of her head, the meaning of which we did not at the time understand, but which was like the gesture of a person who has been interrupted while thinking of more serious things. My mother, torn between her love for my father and her hope that I might turn out to have brains, preserved an impartiality which she expressed by silence. Finally, my grandfather, who adored the army, albeit his duties with the National Guard had been the bugbear of his riper years, could never, at Combray, see a regiment go by the garden railings without bearing his head as the colonel and the colours passed. All this was quite enough to make Madame Cesara, who knew every incident of the disinterested and honourable careers of my father and grandfather, regard them as pillars of injustice. We pardon the crimes of individuals, but not their participation in a collective crime. As soon as she knew my father to be an anti dreyfusar she set between him and herself continents and centuries. Which explains why, across such an interval of time and space, her bow had been imperceptible to my father, and why it had not occurred to her to hold out her hand or to say a few words which would never have carried across the worlds that lay between. saint Lou, who was coming anyhow to Paris, had promised to take me to Madame de Ville Parisis, where I hoped, though I had not said so to him, that we might meet Madame de Guermont. He invited me to luncheon in a restaurant with his mistress, whom we were afterwards to accompany to a rehearsal. We were to go out in the morning and call for her at her home on the outskirts of Paris. I had asked saint Lou that the restaurant to which we went for luncheon in the lives of young noblemen with money to spend, the restaurant plays as important a part as do bales of merchandise in Arabian stories, might, if possible, be that to which Aimé had told me that he would be going as head waiter until the Baalbek season started. It was a great attraction to me, who dreamed of so many expeditions and made so few, to see again someone who had formed part not merely of my memories of Baalbek, but of Baalbek itself, who went there year after year, who, when ill health or my studies compelled me to stay in Paris, would be watching just the same through the long July afternoons while he waited for the guests to come in to dinner, the sun creep down the sky and set in the sea through the glass panels 
of the great dining room, behind which, at the hour when the light died, the motionless wings of vessels, smoky blue in the distance, looked like exotic and nocturnal moths in a showcase. Himself magnetized by his contact with the strong lodestone of Baalbek, this head waiter became in turn a magnet attracting me. I hoped by talking to him to get at once into communication with Baalbek, to have realized here in Paris something of the delights of travel. I left the house early, with Francoise complaining bitterly because the footman, who was engaged to be married, had once again been prevented, the evening before, from going to see his girl. Francoise had found him in tears. He had been itching to go and strike the porter, but had restrained himself, for he valued his place. Before reaching saint Louis, where he was to be waiting for me at the door, I ran into Le Grandin, of whom I had lost sight since our Combray days, and who, though now grown quite grey, had preserved his air of youthful candour. Seeing me, he stopped. Ah, so it's you, he exclaimed, a man of fashion, and in a frock coat, too. That is a livery in which my independent spirit would be ill at ease. It's true that you're a man of the world, I suppose, and go out paying calls. To go and dream, as I do, before some half-ruined tomb, my flowing tie and jacket are not out of place. You know how I admire the charming quality of your soul. That is why I tell you how deeply I regret that you should go forth and deny it among the Gentiles. By being capable of remaining for a moment in the nauseating atmosphere which I am unable to breathe of a drawing room, you pronounce on your own future the condemnation, the damnation of the prophet. I can see it all. You frequent the light hearts, the houses of the great, that is the vice of our middle class today. Ah, those aristocrats. The terror was greatly to blame for not cutting the heads off every one of them. They are all sinister debauchees when they are not simply dreary idiots. Still, my poor boy, if that sort of thing amuses you. While you are on your way to your tea party, your old friend will be more fortunate than you, for, alone in an outlying suburb, he will be watching the pink moon rise in a violet sky. The truth is that I scarcely belong to this earth, upon which I feel such an exile. It takes all the force of the law of gravity to hold me here, to keep me from escaping into another sphere. I belong to a different planet. Goodbye. Do not take amiss the old-time frankness of the peasant of the Vivonne, who has also remained a peasant of the Danube. To prove to you that I am your sincere well-wisher, I am going to send you my last novel. But you will not care for it. It is not deliquescent enough, not fin de siècle enough for you. It is too frank, too honest. What you want is Bergotte, you have confessed it. High game for the jaded palates of pleasure-seeking epicures. I suppose I am looked upon, in your set, as an old campaigner. I do wrong to put my heart into what I write. That is no longer done. Besides, the life of the people is not distinguished enough to interest your little snobbicules. Go, get you gone. Try to recall at times the word of Christ. Do this, and ye shall live. Farewell, friend. It was not with any particular resentment against Le Grandin that I parted from him. Certain memories are like friends in common. They can bring about reconciliations. Set down amid fields starred with buttercups, upon which were piled the ruins of feudal greatness, the little wooden bridge still joined us, Le Grandin and me, as it joined the two banks of the Vivonne. After coming out of a Paris in which, although spring had begun, the trees on the boulevards had hardly put on their first leaves, it was a marvel to saint Lou and myself when the circle train had set us down at the suburban village 
in which his mistress was living, to see every cottage garden gay with huge festal altars of fruit trees in blossom. It was like one of those peculiar, poetical, ephemeral local festivals which people travel long distances to attend on certain fixed occasions. Only this one was held by nature. The bloom of the cherry tree is stuck so close to its branches, like a white sheath, that from a distance, among the other trees that showed as yet scarcely a flower or leaf, one might have taken it on this day of sunshine that was still so cold, for snow melted everywhere else, which still clung to the bushes. But the tall pear trees enveloped each house, each modest courtyard, in a whiteness more vast, more uniform, more dazzling, as if all the dwellings, all the enclosed spaces in the village were on their way to make, on one solemn date, their first communion. It had been a country village and had kept its old mayor's office, sunburned and brown, in front of which, in the place of maypoles and streamers, three tall pear trees were, as though for some civic and local festival, gallantly beflagged with white satin. These villages in the environs of Paris still have at their gates parks of the 17th and 18th centuries, which were the follies of the stewards and favourites of the great. A fruit grower had utilised one of these, which was sunk below the road, for his trees, or had simply perhaps preserved the plan of an immense orchard of former days. Laid out in quincunxes, these pear trees, less crowded and not so far on as those I had seen, formed great quadrilaterals, separated by low walls, of snowy blossom, on each side of which the light fell differently, so that all these airy, roofless chambers seemed to belong to a palace of the sun, such as one might unearth in Crete or somewhere, and made one think also of the different ponds of a reservoir, or of those parts of the sea which man, for some fishery or to plant oyster beds, has subdivided, when one saw, varying with the orientation of the boughs, the light fall and play upon their trained arms as upon water warm with spring and coax into unfolding here and there, gleaming among the open, azure panelled trellis of the branches, the foaming whiteness of a creamy, sunlit flower. Never had Robert spoken to me so tenderly of his friend as he did during this walk. She alone had taken root in his heart. His future career in the army, his position in society, his family, he was not, of course, indifferent altogether to these, but they were of no account compared with the veriest trifle that concerned his mistress. That alone had any importance in his eyes, infinitely more importance than the Guermont and all the kings of the earth put together. I do not know whether he had formulated the doctrine that she was of superior quality to anyone else, but I do know that he considered, took trouble only about what affected her. Through her and for her, he was capable of suffering, of being happy, perhaps of doing murder. There was really nothing that interested, that could excite him, except what his mistress wished, was going to do, what was going on, discernible at most in fleeting changes of expression, in the narrow expanse of her face and behind her privileged brow. So nice-minded in all else, he looked forward to the prospect of a brilliant marriage solely in order to be able to continue to maintain her, to keep her always. If one had asked oneself what was the value he set on her, I doubt whether one could have ever imagined a figure high enough. If he did not marry her, it was because a practical instinct warned him that as soon as she had nothing more to expect from him, she would leave him, or would at least live as she chose, and that he must retain his hold on her by keeping her in suspense from day to day. For he admitted the possibility that she did not love him. 
No doubt the general affection called love must have forced him, as it forces all men, to believe at times that she did. But in his heart of hearts he felt that this love which she felt for him did not exhaust the possibility of her remaining with him only on account of his money, and that on the day when she had nothing more to expect from him, she would make haste, the dupe of her friends and their literary theories, and loving him all the time, really, he thought, to leave him. If she is nice to me today, he confided to me, I'm going to give her something that she'll like. It's a necklace she saw at Boucheron's. It's rather too much for me just at present, 30,000 francs, but poor puss, she gets so little pleasure out of life. She will be jolly pleased with it, I know. She mentioned it to me and told me she knew somebody who would perhaps give it to her. I don't believe that is true, really, but I wasn't taking any risks, so I've arranged with Boucheron, who is our family jeweller, to keep it from me. I am glad to think that you're going to meet her. She's nothing so very wonderful to look at, you know. I could see that he thought just the opposite, and had said this only so as to make me, when I did see her, admire her all the more. What she has got is a marvellous judgment. She'll perhaps be afraid to talk much before you, but, by Jove, the things she'll say to me about you afterwards. You know, she says things one can go on thinking about for hours. There's really something about her that's quite Pythian. On our way to her house we passed by a row of little gardens, and I was obliged to stop, for they were all aflower with pear and cherry blossoms, as empty, no doubt, and lifeless only yesterday as a house that no tenant has taken. They were suddenly peopled and adorned by these newcomers, arrived during the night, whose lovely white garments we could see through the railings along the garden path. Listen, I can see you'd rather stop and look at that stuff and grow poetical about it, said Robert. So just wait for me here, will you? My friend's house is quite close. I will go and fetch her. While I waited, I strolled up and down the road, past these modest gardens. If I raised my head, I could see, now and then, girls sitting in the windows. But outside, in the open air, at the height of a half-landing, here and there, light and pliant in their fresh pink gowns, hanging among the leaves, young lilac clusters were letting themselves be swung by the breeze without heeding the passer-by who was turning his eyes towards their green mansions. I recognised in them the platoons in violet uniform posted at the entrance to Monsieur Swan's park, past the little white fence in the warm afternoons of spring like an enchanting, rustic tapestry. I took a path which led me into a meadow. A cold wind blew keenly along it, as at Cambrai, but from the midst of the rich, moist country soil, which might have been on the bank of the Vivonne, there had nevertheless arisen, punctual at the trysting place, like all its band of brothers, a great white pear tree, which waved smilingly in the sun's face, like a curtain of light materialised and made palpable, its flowers shaken by the breeze, but polished and frosted with silver by the sun's rays. Suddenly saint Lou appeared, accompanied by his mistress, and then, in this woman who was for him all the love, every possible delight in life, whose personality mysteriously enshrined in a body as in a tabernacle was the object that still occupied incessantly the toiling imagination of my friend, whom he felt that he would never really know, as to whom he was perpetually asking himself what could be her secret self, behind the veil of eyes and flesh, in this woman I recognised at once Rachel when from the Lord, her who, but a few years since, women change their position so rapidly in that world when they do change, used to say to the procuress, Tomorrow evening, then, if you want me for anyone, you will send round, won't you? And when they had come round for her, and she found herself alone in the room with the 
anyone. She had known so well what was required of her that, after locking the door, as a prudent woman's precaution or a ritual gesture, she would begin to take off all her things, as one does before the doctor who is going to sound one's chest, never stopping in the process unless the someone, not caring for nudity, told her that she might keep on her shift, as specialists do sometimes who, having an extremely fine ear and being afraid of their patients catching a chill, are satisfied with listening to his breathing and the beating of his heart through his shirt. On this woman, whose whole life, all her thoughts, all her past, all the men who at one time or another had had her, were to me so utterly unimportant that if she had begun to tell me about them, I should have listened to her only out of politeness and should barely have heard what she said. I felt that the anxiety, the torment, the love of saint Lou had been concentrated in such a way as to make, out of what was for me a mechanical toy, nothing more, the cause of endless suffering, the very object and reward of existence. Seeing these two elements separately, because I had known Rachel Friend from the Lord in a house of ill fame, I realised that many women, for the sake of whom men live, suffer, take their lives, may be in themselves or for other people what Rachel was for me. The idea that anyone could be tormented by curiosity with regard to her life stupefied me. I could have told Robert of any number of her unchastities, which seemed to me the most uninteresting things in the world, and how they would have pained him, and what had he not given to learn them without avail. I realised also then all that the human imagination can put behind a little scrap of face such as this girl's face was, if it is the imagination that was the first to know it. And conversely, into what wretched elements, crudely material and utterly without value, might be decomposed what had been the inspiration of countless dreams, if it should be, so to speak, controverted by the slightest actual acquaintance. I saw that what had appeared to me to be not worth twenty francs when it had been offered to me for twenty francs in the house of ill fame, where it was then for me simply a woman desirous of earning twenty francs, might be worth more than a million, more than one's family, more than all the most coveted positions in life, if one had begun by imagining her to embody a strange creature, interesting to know, difficult to seize and to hold. No doubt it was the same thin and narrow face that we saw, Robert and I, but we had arrived at it by two opposite ways, between which there was no communication, and we should never both see it from the same side. That face, with its stares, its smiles, the movements of its lips, I had known from outside as being simply that of a woman of the sort who for twenty francs would do anything that I asked. So her stares, her smiles, the movements of her lips had seemed to me significant merely of the general actions of a class without any distinctive quality. And beneath them I should not have had the curiosity to look for a person. But what to me had in a sense been offered at the start, that consenting face, had been for Robert an ultimate goal towards which he had made his way through endless hopes and doubts, suspicions, dreams. He gave more than a million francs in order to have for himself, in order that there might not be offered to others what had been offered to me, as to all and sundry, for a score. That he too should not have enjoyed it at the lower price may have been due to the chance of a moment, the instant in which she who seemed ready to yield herself makes off, having perhaps an assignation elsewhere, some reason which makes her more difficult of access that day. Should the man be a sentimentalist, then, even if she has not observed it, but infinitely more if she has, the direst game begins. Unable to swallow his disappointment, 
to make himself forget about the woman, he starts afresh in pursuit. She flies him, until a mere smile, for which he no longer ventured to hope, is bought at a thousand times what should have been the price of the last, the most intimate, favours. It happens even at times in such a case when one has been led by a mixture of simplicity in one's judgment and cowardice in the face of suffering to commit the crowning folly of making an inaccessible idol of a girl that these last favours, or even the first kiss one is fated never to obtain, one no longer even ventures to ask for them for fear of destroying one's chances of platonic love. And it is then a bitter anguish to leave the world without ever having known what were the embraces of the woman one has most passionately loved. As for Rachel's favours, however, saint Lou had by mere accident succeeded in winning them all. Certainly, if he had now learned that they had been offered to all the world for a Louis, he would have suffered, of course, acutely, but would still have given a million francs for the right to keep them, for nothing that he might have learned could have made him emerge, since that is beyond human control and can be brought to pass only in spite of it by the action of some great natural law from the path he was treading, from which that face could appear to him only through the web of the dreams he had already spun. The immobility of that thin face, like that of a sheet of paper subjected to the colossal pressure of two atmospheres, seemed to me to be being maintained by two infinities which abutted on her without meeting, for she held them apart. And indeed, when Robert and I were both looking at her, we did not both see her from the same side of the mystery. It was not Rachel when from the Lord, who seemed to me a small matter. It was the power of the human imagination, the illusion on which were based the pains of love. These I felt to be vast. Robert noticed that I appeared moved. I turned my eyes to the pear and cherry trees of the garden opposite, so that he might think it was their beauty that had touched me. And it did touch me in somewhat the same way. It also brought close to me things of the kind which we not only see with our eyes, but feel also with our hearts. These trees that I had seen in the garden, likening them in my mind to strange deities, had not my mistake been like the Madeleine's, when, in another garden, she saw a human form and thought it was the gardener. Treasurers of our memories of the age of gold keepers of the promise that reality is not what we suppose, that the splendour of poetry, the wonderful radiance of innocence may shine in it and may be the recompense that we strive to earn, these great white creatures, bowed in a marvellous fashion above the shade propitious for rest, for angling or for reading, were they not rather angels? I exchanged a few words with saint Lou's mistress. We cut across the village. Its houses were sordid. But by each of the most wretched, of those that looked as though they had been scorched and branded by a rain of brimstone, a mysterious traveller halting for a day in the accursed city, a resplendent angel, stood erect, extending broadly over it the dazzling protection of the wings of flowering innocence. It was a pear tree. saint Lou drew me a little way in front to explain. I should have liked it if you and I could have been alone together. In fact, I would much rather have had lunch just with you and stayed with you until it was time to go to my aunt's. But this poor girl of mine here, it is such a pleasure to her, and she's so decent to me, don't you know. I hadn't the heart to refuse her. you like her, however. She's literary, you know, a most sensitive nature. And besides... It's such a pleasure to be with her in a restaurant. She's so charming, so simple, always delighted with everything. I fancy, nevertheless, that on this same morning, and then probably for the first and last time, Robert did detach himself for a moment from the woman whom, out of successive layers of affection, he had gradually created, and beheld suddenly, at some distance from himself, another Rachel. Outwardly, 
the double of his, but entirely different, who was nothing more or less than a little light of love. We had left the blossoming orchard and were making for the train which was to take us to Paris, when, at the station, Rachel, who was walking by herself, was recognised and accosted by a pair of common little tarts like herself, who, first of all, thinking that she was alone, called out, Hello, Rachel, you come with us. Lucienne and Germain are in the train, and there's room for one more. Come on, we're all going to the rink. And we're just going to introduce to her two counter-jumpers, their lovers, who were escorting them, when, noticing that she seemed a little uneasy, they looked up and beyond her, caught sight of us, and with apologies, bade her a goodbye, to which she responded in a somewhat embarrassed but still friendly tone. They were two poor little tarts, with collars of sham otter skin, looking more or less as Rachel must have looked when Salou first met her. He did not know them, or their names even, and seeing that they appeared to be extremely intimate with his mistress, he could not help wondering whether she too might not once have had, had not still perhaps her place in a life of which he had never dreamed, utterly different from the life she led with him, a life in which one had a woman for a louis apiece, whereas he was giving more than a hundred thousand francs a year to Rachel. He caught only a fleeting glimpse of that life, but saw also, in the thick of it, a Rachel other than her whom he knew, a Rachel like the two little tarts in the train, a twenty-franc Rachel. In short, Rachel had for the moment duplicated herself in his eyes. He had seen, at some distance from his own Rachel, the little tart Rachel, the real Rachel, assuming that Rachel the tart was more real than the other. It may then have occurred to Robert that from the hell in which he was living with the prospect of a rich marriage, of the sale of his name, to enable him to go on giving Rachel a hundred thousand francs every year, he might easily perhaps have escaped and have enjoyed the favours of his mistress as the two counter-jumpers enjoyed those of their girls for next to nothing. But how was it to be done? She had done nothing to forfeit his regard. Less generously rewarded, she would be less kind to him, would stop saying and writing the things that so deeply moved him, things which he would quote with a touch of ostentation to his friends, taking care to point out how nice it was of her to say them, but omitting to mention that he was maintaining her in the most lavish fashion, or even that he ever gave her anything at all, that these inscriptions on photographs or greetings at the end of telegrams were but the conversion into the most exiguous, the most precious of currencies of a hundred thousand francs. He took care not to admit that these rare kindnesses on Rachel's part were handsomely paid for by himself. It would be wrong to say, and yet by a crude piece of reasoning, we do say it absurdly, of every lover who pays in cash for his pleasure, and of a great many husbands, that this was from self-esteem or vanity. End of section 8